a mysterious governess for the reluctant Earl. Written by Abby Ailes and published by Starfall Publications. Enjoy. 1. Lord Grimshaw, you must understand that this is very unorthodox. I can't imagine how that could be, Sebastian Blackburn, the Earl of Grimshaw, stated with a huff of irritation. I am certainly not the only one to come and seek a governess through you. Of course not, my lord, the solicitor replied, pushing the spectacles up his nose. That is the main purpose of our establishment, of course. I only mean that asking various governesses here to be interviewed by you personally is very unorthodox and quite possibly not possible on such short notice. Well, Grimshaw said, doing his best to keep a steady voice. How much time would you find sufficient if you cannot procure prospects today? Would tomorrow give you a sufficient amount of time? A week would be more reasonable, Lord Grimshaw. Well, I don't have a week, Grimshaw said, standing up in the room. The solicitor sat back in his chair in response to Sebastian's physical presence in the small office room. It is your fault I find myself here. I asked you to procure me a governess, and in less than a year she goes and elopes. I obviously can't count on you to pick a proper candidate, so here I am to do it myself. This trip to London has already been inconvenient enough. I want to be done with the whole thing in no more than three days' time. The solicitor moved the glasses on his nose once more. He didn't particularly enjoy being reprimanded in his own office, but nothing could be done for it. Many young ladies would take up these governess jobs only long enough to see themselves properly wed. Though a resignation in less than a year was unusually quick, it was a common occurrence for a governess to give up pupils for marriage. I am very sorry that Miss Watts left your service. How about you tell my two girls how sorry you are? In the last two years they have lost a mother, and now their governess. Perhaps if you will not furnish me with candidates to interview myself, I will just take you with me back to Brighton Abbey, so that you may look into their due eyes and explain why they have had no womanly figure to support and guide them these last four months. I assure you that won't be necessary, Lord Grimshaw, the solicitor said, shuffling papers on his desk. I am sure that I will be able to find several candidates ready for your approval by tomorrow morning. The solicitor was feeling rather terrified from the Earl's commanding presence, and was willing to do whatever it took to pacify the man. Lord Grimshaw nodded in approval with a grunt, before turning to retrieve his beaver fur hat and cane. Then I will arrive promptly tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, and I expect to have several options to choose from, he announced in a less harsh but still demanding voice. Of course, Lord Grimshaw, it is our passion to make sure all our clients are pleased in every way with any employment they need filling, the solicitor said, standing and reciting the business motto. Sebastian stormed from the office and building onto the busy streets of London. He looked either direction at the various people walking along the road before donning his hat. Need a cab, my lord, a small voice called up to him. He looked down to inspect the eyes of the dirty orphan waiting expectantly. Sebastian expected he hoped for a penny in return for his aid in procuring a carriage for hire. All right, sure, Sebastian said as he studied the boy. The small child's face brightened to finally get an affirmative answer. Sebastian had no doubt it was one of the few he had gotten all week. The child was scarcely a skeleton. Despite his malnutrition, he donned his own ragged cap and ran out to the muddied and filth-filled street to hail a carriage. It only took a moment for the yellow carriage pulled by a single horse to be called over by the boy. Sebastian had to admit he was quite proficient at his job. As the carriage pulled to the side of the raised sidewalk so as to keep the Earl from soiling his leather boots in the street, the boy opened the door and removed his hat, bowing in respect. For you, my lord, he said. Sebastian reached into his pocket and pulled out a sixpence to give the child. He supposed the boy had held out his hat for the money, not expecting someone of his class would be willing to put it directly into such a dirty hand. Instead of placing the coin in the hat, however, Sebastian knelt down to the child's level. Grabbing the boy's dirty thin hand with his own white-gloved one, he placed the coin in his palm. I would hate for it to fall out of the hole in your cap, Sebastian said, motioning to the worn headpiece. 
Thank you, my lord. The boy was so overcome with excitement at the money he could scarcely breathe. Sebastian ruffled the boy's matted brown hair and smiled at him before raising himself back up and entering the carriage. Where to, governor? The driver called from his high seat in front of the box. Grand Hotel Covent Garden, Sebastian responded without fanfare as he settled back into the carriage seat. He was vastly irritated to spend even one more day in London, but there seemed to be nothing to do for it. He had trusted a solicitor once, though he wasn't entirely sure if it was that exact man he had met today as he had accused to procure a governess for him. If there was one thing that Sebastian Blackburn, Earl of Grimshaw, had learned in life, it was that if he wanted something done properly, he was going to have to do it himself. The following morning, Sebastian walked into the employment office satisfied to see a row of ladies seated and patiently waiting. He could easily already mark several of them off his list of candidates, as they were far too handsome to look upon. He wasn't about to allow his future governess to catch the eye of a local gentleman again. His girls had suffered enough without the loss of yet another motherly figure in their life. He would settle on a lady that would not only excel as a tutor, but also one that looked so demure as to never risk leaving again. Sebastian was shown into the same solicitor's office. He spoke rather nervously as he shuffled through his papers and made room for the Earl at the desk. I have a list of all qualified ladies. All are in need of employment and able to travel as far distance as is necessary. I have assured all of them that this governess position is not a temporary one and dedication is required. Sebastian nodded his head in approval. He was aware that he could be a quite severe-looking man, so he attempted to soften his look. It wasn't easy when he was in such a sour disposition already. He never liked travelling to London. There were far too many people. Please do send the first one in, Sebastian said, taking his seat in the solicitor's chair behind the desk. The man only hesitated for a moment before nodding and leaving the room. A few seconds later, he returned with a lady in tow. She was one of the seated misses he had singled out at once, as far too beautiful for his position. Thank you. I am sure you are very skilled, Sebastian said before the woman even fully entered the room. But I am looking for something else in a governess. Good morning. He kept his thick arms on the table with his fingers interlaced. She looked up in shock between the Earl and the solicitor before the latter finally shooed her out of the room and returned with another. This will do fine. Please have a seat, miss. Sebastian said, taking control of the room as was his habit. Miss Mary Prescott, sir, she said as she took her seat. Sebastian spent the next several hours interviewing one miss after another. Some, like the first, were dismissed right away. Others were given the opportunity to answer a few questions, but quickly were found wanting. Sebastian was just beginning to lose hope when Miss Hannah Jacobson made her way into the room. He looked her over finding her features very satisfying to his needs. Her dress clearly stated that she was of a lower class. Not only was it extremely plain and not of the fashion he had seen as of late, but it was also altered along the edges. He could scarcely make her face out between the large white cap she had completely covering her head and the wide brim spectacles that obscured the rest of her face. Miss Hannah Jacobson, the solicitor said before leaving the room. She took her seat, and passing her information forward to the Earl, kept her eyes on the hands neatly folded in her lap. Sebastian pulled his eyes from her curious figure to the pamphlet before him. Her dress seemed to make more sense as he read over that her schooling was at Hendrick's Preparatory School for Young Misses. He was familiar with the institution. Though it produced satisfactory educators, it was one often used by those who couldn't afford much better. I am in need of a lady who can both teach my two young daughters the educational lessons appropriate to their age, as well as etiquette they will need in preparation for their adult lives. I trust your education at Hendrick's Preparatory was satisfactory. Yes, Lord Grimshaw. And if you were offered the position, how soon would you be able to arrive at Brighton Abbey? Of course I would pay for your transportation, he added with a wave of his hand. I could leave as soon as needed or as soon as it is convenient for you, she replied with her head still down. 
He didn't rather like how dull and sullen she seemed. He wondered how that would fare with his girls who were often rambunctious and feral. Though on the other hand, he thought perhaps her demeanour might have an influence on them. I see here that Hendricks first put you with the Baron Edgley. I see you spent almost a year there, but I see no reference. That is correct, she said, as her eyes met his for the first time since entering the room. Could you perchance tell me why your post terminated with the Baron, and perhaps why there is no reference? Sebastian said, a little more severely than he had meant to. He was just frustrated, not with the miss, but with the fact that this was yet another red flag against yet another unqualified governess. Perhaps you know the Baron, Hannah retorted, not yet ready to answer the question. No. Oh, well, my ward was their son, Joseph. He took ill quite suddenly, and after several months without recovering, they thought it best to dismiss me. Both Baron and Baroness Edgley were beside themselves with worry over Joseph, and I didn't feel it appropriate to ask for a reference in such a time. Why did they not supply one upon your dismissal? I suppose it was just the stress they were under. I think the Baron forgot. He had so much on his mind, you see. Sebastian thought this over and considered it to be a suitable reason for not giving a reference. Hannah Jacobson didn't seem like the type of girl who would fail in her job as an educator if her school marks were any indication. Well, the Earl said, standing up. Miss Jacobson did the same. I have seen as much as I think I need to. You are hired. I will arrange a coach to collect you and your belongings first thing tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, Hannah said surprised to not only get the job with such a dubious work history and suspicious explanation of it, but to also start right away. You said you were available, did you not? Yes, yes, of course. I would be happy to begin as soon as you wish. I was just surprised is all, she added with a shy smile. She looked down from the Earl, no doubt to hide a blush behind the large ruffles of her cap. He couldn't help but wonder later that day, if it was actually dimples he had also seen along with the rose on her cheeks. 2. Hannah had told herself numerous times it would be better to acquire a post outside of the city she had been born in. She needed to get far enough away that the reputation that Baron Edgley was spreading wouldn't reach. She grabbed her one small suitcase and locked the door behind her. More than anything, she was in great need of the income this opportunity would provide. She learned to live frugally from a very young age, but it still had not prepared her for her six-month period without a job. Of course, she could have always gone to her aunt and uncle and asked for help if she really needed to. It was something she would not consider, unless she was near death, however. They thought they were being kind when they sent her off to Hendrick's preparatory school. It had relieved her own parents of at least one of the seven children at that time. Now her mother's brood was boasting twelve children. Her aunt and uncle were satisfied in their charitable duty to send her, the eldest, off to receive a proper education and the promise of employment afterward. Hannah began her education at the age of eleven. From that moment on, every waking wish for her and every other girl at that school was just to be freed upon their eighteenth birthday. Unlike so many who died of malnutrition or sickness in the cramped quarters of the ill-heated school, Hannah had made it to her eighteenth year. She was promptly removed from school and placed in the Baron's home. How something so horrible as that school could have furnished her a post even more horrifying was more than Hannah would ever understand. They clearly cared little for the homes they were sending their wards to. Hannah could only hope that her new station would be an improvement on her last, and she could again send money back to her family, who needed it so desperately. She watched the countryside pass by out the window of the public carriage. She was happy to be in the box instead of sitting outside with the cases as two other men had done for the cheap affair. In the carriage, she was squished tight up against the window to avoid all contact with the gentleman next to her. She would have rather not been smothered into a vehicle with five other bodies, only one of which was another woman, for the duration of the ride. She could have no opinion on the matter, however, as it was her employer who had furnished the arraignment. Hannah thought on the Earl of Grimshaw as dusk was beginning to set on her day-long ride. 
she wondered what sort of a man he was. He had seemed quite fierce at their one and only meeting. He was such an imposing figure even the solicitor had seemed to shrink away from him. Lord Grimshaw reminded her quite a bit of the teachers from her past, quick to strike the hand and slow to show any amount of kindness. It seemed an insufferable idea to go to a house that seemed much like her childhood upbringing. She had no choice in the matter. She had extinguished all her reserves and had already been turned down for six different positions in London, either from lack of reference or worse, from word-of-mouth reference from the Baron himself. At that moment, while she was lost in thought, the gentleman who had fallen asleep next to her began to slouch in her direction. Hannah stiffened as his arm came in contact with hers. Hannah did her best to lean farther out of the window. Even the mere innocent touch of a sleeping man was enough to make her wish to scream in fear. Her nose was already freezing from the cool breeze blowing by in the darkening outside world. She didn't care if her nose fell off from the cold. She would hold herself outside the carriage as long as necessary, till the man righted himself again. Finally, just after midnight, the coach stopped at the gates of Brighton Abbey. Luckily before that, her gentleman companion had woken and already removed himself at an earlier stop. Even with the added space in the carriage, when it was her turn to dismount, she couldn't help but breathe a sigh of relief. She thanked the man who handed her chest down and began the walk through the gates to her new home. She couldn't see much of it in the darkness. Thankfully some lights were still in the windows guiding her way. Just as she came to the front of the house a woman came around the corner. Hannah sighed in relief to see that she would not have to sit outside and wait for the house to awaken to be let in. She smiled gratefully at the woman and followed her to the side of the house where the service entrance was. Inside she could see the lady much clearer. She was no doubt in her late fifties and covered her head with a large laced cap as Hannah did, though Hannah was sure for an entirely different reason. I am Mrs Brennan, the housekeeper, she said as she wiped her nose against the cold. Come inside quickly, child, and make yourself warm. I insisted that David keep the fire warm until your arrival. Thank you, Mrs Brennan. That was most kind of you. Hannah replied, grateful for the warmth. Come and sit, and I will have some tea and sandwiches brought down. Please don't go through such trouble on my account. If you would just show me to my quarters, I will not keep you up any longer. Nonsense, at my age one doesn't sleep much anyway, Mrs Brennan said, as she eased herself down into a chair in front of a warm hearth. Hannah couldn't have been more appreciative of the light meal and warm drink brought by one of the maids. She made a mental note to repay the kindness at a later date. Now, Mrs Brennan said after she finished her tea, Lord Grimshaw will see you tomorrow in the morning room after breakfast. Nine o'clock sharp, do you hear? She warned with a wagging finger. He doesn't like to be kept waiting. Yes, ma'am. The Earl would like to personally give you the details of your duty and the parameters of your stay at Brighton Abbey. After this, I will take you to see your new pupils and a short tour of the house. It would do you no good to see it now. How will I find my way to the morning room? Hannah asked. She had seen very little of the estate in the dark, but what she did see was quite massive. She was sure it was an easy enough thing to get lost in its expansive halls. Mary will bring you your breakfast in the morning. She will be able to help you on. Thank you, Mrs Brennan. This is a far better welcome than I could have ever wished for, Hannah said, grateful from the depths of her heart. The following morning, Hannah woke early in the privacy of her own room. It was nothing she had ever experienced before in the whole of her life. Whether it was sharing a bed with siblings, the massive dormitories of her school, or the servant quarters of the Baron's London home, she had always had at least one companion in her room. It all seemed very quiet to her as she got out of bed and dressed for the day. The first thing she did before even the maid could enter was replacing the hair cap and thick glasses that served no purpose but to hide her face. As she finished this, a soft knock came at her door. Hannah wrapped herself in her shawl before cracking it open. Seeing that it was indeed the maid with her breakfast, she opened the door all the way to let her in. I'm Mary she said cheerfully as she set down the tray. 
You will be Miss Jacobson. Just Hannah, please, Hannah said as the maid turned to inspect her. She let out a giggle. I've never seen someone so young wear a cap. And why do you have it on before you're even dressed? She asked, motioning to the nightgown that Hannah was still in. I was just a bit chilled this morning, Hannah said by way of excuse. Well, I'll have the warm water coming up for you next. Can you start the fire or do you need help? Hannah looked over to the small mantle with the cinders from the fire that had glowed upon her entry the night before. Next to the hearth was a basket filled with more wood and small scraps to start the fire with. Hannah could barely contain her own joy. Having a fire to warm herself by was a treasured event. I can manage it on my own. I only just woke. Is there a bucket I might sweep the ashes in? Don't be silly, Mary said, waving her off with another laugh. The chambermaid will come around and take care of all of that. Hannah wasn't used to having breakfast brought to her, or maids to clean up after her. Even in the baron's house such things couldn't be afforded, and Hannah was expected to take care of her own needs and eat her meals with the rest of the staff. I don't mean to make work for others, Hannah said. After all, it was something that had been beaten into her, quite literally growing up. Every person in this world had a God-ordained purpose. For the misses of Hendrick's prep, it was to serve others, not to be waited upon. It is no more work than we are used to. This is a big house. It takes a large staff to maintain it. You will find that we are more than amply supplied to see to your comfort. In that way, you will be able to focus all your energy on Lady Caroline and Lady Rebecca. At least that is what the Earl wishes. Well, if it is Lord Grimshaw's instructions, then I won't interfere, Hannah said rather reluctantly. Mary gave her one last welcoming smile before she went on her way out of the room and to the rest of her duties. By the time that Hannah had finished the fire, Mary was back to deliver the warm basin as promised. Thank you, was all Hannah could manage before Mary was on her way again. The house may have been fully staffed, but it was also a very busy place. Hannah peeked out of her room and saw the bustle of several other servants going about their daily duties. Returning to her private room, Hannah washed, feeling most refreshed after such a long trip, and dressed in her simple grey muslin dress. She wrapped her neckline with her cotton fichu that was long enough to tuck through her bodice and double as her apron over her skirts. She did her best to smooth out any wrinkles in both the cotton fichu and dress that had occurred in the time in her chest. Finally feeling herself fully put together, Hannah sat down to take her breakfast. She was happy to see a steaming pot of tea, toast and fresh marmalade. She was feeling quite spoiled as she ate her toast and took in the sights around her. Along with her bed, there was a cabinet to place her garments in, a small table and a mirror. Additionally, she had her breakfast table and chair, and an alcove with large windows. After finishing her breakfast, she walked over to the window to get a better idea of the grounds around her. Hannah's breath caught in her chest as she looked out the window at the rich green forest that lay beyond the manicured gardens of Brighton Abbey. She was sure she understood why it was called such a name now. The sun seemed to touch every top of every tree, extending across the vast array of vegetation that surrounded the house. Hannah had never seen so much green in all her life all in one place. It was a most enchanting sight to see. Reaching down, she unlatched one of the windows and let the fresh air in. She was sure even the air smelled better than it did back in London. She closed her eyes for just a moment as she soaked in all the smells and sounds that seemed to engulf her. Finally glancing down to the watch at her waist, she was startled out of her relaxing meditation. It was now a quarter to nine. Panic seized her in realising she had fifteen minutes to get her person to the morning room. Worst of all, she had forgotten to ask Mary how to get there. If her first impressions of the Earl, not to mention the housekeeper's warnings the night before, were any indication, Hannah had a feeling he would not take her tardy appearance lightly. 3. Please excuse me, Hannah said to a gentleman who was fortunate to be in the hall she was presently searching. Could you be so kind as to point me to the morning room? 
she recognised the footman as the one who had stoked the fire the night before. He gave her a rather large, toothy grin as he looked her over. So you are the new governess, then? Yes, and I am sorry to be rude, but I am a trifle late for a meeting with the Earl. If you could quickly point me to the proper room, I would be greatly in your debt. He surveyed her again. Hannah could not have been more grateful for her homely appearance as his eyes drifted over her. Finally, he decided she was wanting, much to her relief. Well, you're going the wrong direction to start, he said, not finding much interest in her looks. Then you will turn right at the main stair and you will find it two doors down in the east wing. Hannah looked in the direction he was speaking and did her best to remember his words. She nodded her thanks before hurrying back the way she had come. Luckily, she found the room just as the watch attached to her waist indicated the hour. She breathed a sigh of relief as she knocked promptly on the door. Come in, a deep commanding voice called from within. Hannah opened the door, set her chin at a proper height, and entered the room. She found the Earl sitting behind a small writing desk, situated in a corner of the room. It was an exquisitely beautiful room with golden wallpaper and floral couches all facing some great windows to the east. It was no wonder this was called the morning room, for the light from the rising sun brought warmth to every inch of it. Please have a seat, the Earl instructed from behind his writing desk, while he continued at his work. Hannah hesitated for a moment. There was nowhere to sit but on the couches facing the window in front of him. It didn't seem proper to put her back to him as his desk was behind the couches. Miss Jacobson, is there a reason why you will not sit? He asked rather impatiently as he put his quill down for a moment to study her. It is only... Hannah hesitated. I only wonder if it would be proper for me to sit when the only available seats have my back to you. If you would please have a seat, Miss Jacobson, I will join you presently. I am just finishing up some business. Hannah didn't think his sharp tone was quite necessary. Nonetheless, she seated herself and enjoyed the view out the window as best she could, with the sound of his quick writing scratching the parchment behind her. Finally, the Earl finished his note and sealed it for delivery. Once finished, he rose from his seat and came to sit across from her on an opposing couch. I apologise for the delay, he said as he attempted to soothe his own nerves. Have you settled yourself well in your new quarters? Yes, thank you, Lord Grimshaw. They are more than I expected. Good. Now let us get on to the business of expectations for the girl's education and your role in the household. Of course, Hannah said expectantly. My daughters are seven and five. I am sure that you will be most adequate in seeing that they continue in their scholarly education. Yes. I would ask that half the day be spent in scholarly learning and the other half in training as proper young ladies. You may organise the day as you wish so long as both of these standards are met. I would be happy to impart whatever knowledge you deem necessary. I am glad to hear that, Sebastian said, relieved to see the demure lady was all business as was he. Now there are some rules that I must insist you follow while you are here at Brighton Abbey. I assure you there is an important purpose for all of them, and I would ask you to adhere to them strictly. Rule number one, I would ask that you do not go into the local village unless I take you myself. Hannah's jaw dropped open. But sir, I am not sure I understand the meaning of such a rule. Surely if I go along with other members of the staff that would be sufficient to see me safely there and back. What other purpose could you have for insisting I go only in your presence? Please, I assure you it is for a good reason. I perhaps may assign another I feel would be appropriate for the task. But as of right now, that is not so. We will go to town each Sunday, and then again once a week on the afternoon of your choosing. Please advise me what day would be best at your earliest convenience so that I may make my own preparations to be available at that time. Hannah was utterly shocked at his demand as well as his delivery of it. There was no question in his mind that this was completely right to do. The second rule pertains to the first. I would ask that each Sunday you attend services with us in our family seat so as to watch the girls. 
Hannah was growing increasingly nervous with every rule he announced. Would he insist she be in his presence at all times? Despite her fear, she simply nodded in acknowledgement. Third, because I am alone in the house with the girls most of the time, I allow them to join me for evening meals. I would ask you to also be in attendance for dinner. Lastly, he continued without waiting for her to reply, while you are here in my employment, I must insist that you do not consort with any members of the opposite sex within the town or the staff unless approved by myself. Consort? Opposite sex? I am not sure what you are inferring, Lord Grimshaw, Hannah said, now having heard far too much. But I am a respectable lady. I am not inferring anything, Miss Jacobson. I am sure you are, and I would never suggest otherwise. I am merely informing you of these rules for the benefit of my children. How could that possibly benefit your girls? I am afraid you will just have to trust me on this one, the Earl of Grimshaw said with a stoic face that gave nothing away. Hannah wasn't sure if she felt more shocked, hurt or insulted after her meeting with the Earl of Grimshaw. How could he have sanely asked such things of her? She had hoped that this time around she would leave her employment with a promising referral. How could that ever be the case when she couldn't bring herself to agree to such rules? Of course she understood the necessity of grooming the girls both in their education and in preparation for their lives as proper young ladies. She also didn't mind the idea of attending to them at church and for supper, although it was unorthodox. She did, however, find herself vastly insulted to be told that she was only allowed out of the house in his presence. How dare the Earl infer that she would have inappropriate interactions with members of the male staff and therefore forbid any interaction whatsoever? It was just the same physically demanding presence of her last employer. Again and again, Hannah had told herself that the Baron was just an anomaly and that her next situation would be vastly better. She was beginning to question that sound advice she gave to herself. Standing outside the schoolroom door, she smoothed her apron and took a steadying breath. She knocked first before being called in. Good morning, Miss Jacobson, a kind-eyed young girl said, coming to stand in front of her. She motioned for the two small girls to stand. Hannah took the moment to look her pupils over. They both had the black hair that matched their father. In fact, everything about their demure, sombre faces reminded her of the Earl. She was immediately drawn to the youngest of the two who looked up at her with the largest brown eyes she had ever seen before. I am Abigail, their nurse. This is Lady Caroline, and the little one there is Lady Rebecca, the young girl pointed out to Hannah. Hannah was surprised that such a young girl was their nurse. She looked to be no more than sixteen. She wondered if that perhaps explained why the Earl had insisted that it was Hannah who tended to the girls outside of school instead of their nurse. It's very nice to meet you, Abigail, as well as both of you, Lady Caroline and Lady Rebecca, Hannah said, smiling down at her wards as soothingly as possible. If it is all right with you, I would like to assess what your last governess has already imparted to you before we begin with our own lessons. Would that be all right? Both girls first looked at their nurse. Even at her young age, it was clear she was the only consistent mother figure they had had thus far in their lives. Abigail gave them an encouraging nod, and both girls turned to their new governess ready for the task. Our last governess would have a sit at the table over there, Lady Caroline said by way of being helpful, as Abigail excused herself from the room. Thank you, Lady Caroline. Hannah said as she scanned the room and began to take in its layout. There was a bookshelf amply supplied with resources for Hannah to comb over and use. A warm fireplace to be used in winter months with a comfy chair for her to sit in and read to the children. There was one desk for her use and a small table for the girls' use. Hannah spent the remainder of the afternoon assessing her two pupils. Rebecca was very young in age, only being five, and was very new in her education. Hannah was sure her education would start at the very beginning. Caroline, on the other hand, was very knowledgeable of her numbers and letters, and was even able to demonstrate some exquisite handwriting. Both girls were very quiet, however, and much of what Hannah came to learn of them was a slow and painful process to draw out. 
She did notice that Caroline's eyes also continued to float away from her task at hand. She realised that her first assignment for the child would be to focus on tasks at hand and not get lost in thought. As the morning came to an end, and a servant arrived with a tray of light luncheon, Hannah was relieved for the break. Her last pupil, though he truly had taken ill towards the end, had been a wild and rambunctious boy. It was a stark difference to these soft-spoken girls. Miss Jacobson, Caroline said after Hannah suggested they take a break for tea and a light meal, our last governess would always read to us at the end of our lessons. Her eyes drifted again behind Hannah, and she realised that the child's distraction had been the chair with a book already set on its arm. I can tell that you are very intent on having something read to you, Hannah said. Perhaps it would be worth letting the tea stand a few moments to read just a few pages. The book is just there on the chair, Caroline continued encouragingly as she grabbed her sister's hand and seated them both on the carpet. Hannah had not seen such light lit in this child's eyes thus far. She made a note of Caroline's excitement for storytelling. Perhaps it would be a way to encourage the child to open up more to her. She followed the girls over, picked up the leather-bound novel and sat down in the chair. It was a very comfortable seat, and she couldn't help but also relish the fact of many afternoons seated here reading to the children. She had just examined the cover of the book when she felt a rustling of her skirts. Hannah felt the chills run up her spine that gave her the distinct indication that a living creature was walking around in her skirts. Moving the book out of the way, she inspected her folds and, much to her dismay, saw a small lump begin to move beneath the grey fabric. Grabbing the skirt and petticoat in one hand, she removed the fabric and exposed a big fat mouse with its long tail coiled around it. For a moment, Hannah froze to the spot, just watching the mouse nibble on a biscuit piece he had happily in his paws. How a mouse or the biscuit ended up on the chair she didn't care to know. As sensation returned to her body, she promptly rose from her chair and screamed. The mouse, having been interrupted from his midday meal, began to scurry frantically around the seat of the chair, not sure where to go next. Hannah screamed again. It wasn't the first mouse she had seen. Certainly there were plenty in her school growing up. But she had never expected to see one in her seat. She promptly swung the book at the mouse, hoping to put them both out of her misery. Don't! Stop! Caroline stood and screamed herself. Hannah watched in utter bewilderment as the child grabbed the mouse by its tail and scooped it into her hands where it sat quite peacefully. Why would you try to squish Mr Whiskers? Lady Rebecca said with tears brimming in her saucer eyes. 4. What is the meaning of all this? The Earl shouted before he fully opened the classroom door. Hannah was still so utterly bewildered by the whole event that she barely registered the pure panic in the Earl's dark eyes. Instead, both girls and the governess stared at him blinking. From behind him, Abigail was peeking around her employer to see the status of the children in her charge. Father! Caroline cried, running into his arms. Rebecca was not far behind her sister. Grimshaw enveloped both his children in his thick arms and did his best to calm their fears. He bent down to their level and let both children cry into either shoulder. She tried to kill him, Caroline sobbed out. Kill who? Grimshaw asked ever so softly, though his dagger gaze on Miss Jacobson was less than gentle. Mr Whiskers, Caroline replied, holding up her rodent for her father's inspection. She tried to hit him with a book. It's all right now, girls, he cooed to them both. Standing up, he faced Miss Jacobson with his full, overshadowing stature. Miss Jacobson, I can understand why you might scream at the sight of Mr Whiskers, but I assure you he is just a pet. If you would but leave him in his proper container, you won't even have to think about him. There is no need for you to cause the pet any harm. Both girls came to their nurse's side. Though Rebecca was five, she was still small enough that Abigail could pick her up into her arms. It was hard to know his family status, as he was seated in my chair under my skirts and not in his container as you said is his home, Hannah shot back, completely infuriated that he was chastising her for her actions. What would you have me do when finding a rodent in such a place? She added, 
crossing her arms. Hannah would not allow herself to be bullied by this man. She had had quite enough of that at her last employment. Grimshaw turned his gaze back towards his two daughters, and immediately both of their matching chocolate eyes hit the floor in guilt. He turned, now shadowing them in his displeasure. For a man who had once spoken so softly to the children, his voice was now deep and full of anger. Is that true? Caroline? Rebecca? Did you put Mr. Whiskers on Miss Jacobson's chair? I only gave him some of my biscuit from breakfast. He wanted to eat it in the chair, not his cage. I guess I forgot he was there, Caroline said, though it was easy to see she was making the story up on the spot. I don't think that is all the truth, he retorted, now looking at his youngest daughter. Rebecca cracked under the pressure of her father's disappointed gaze. We only meant it as a joke, father. Honest, she said in her soft, shaking voice. I am very disappointed with the both of you, he scolded, as silent tears trickled down from their downcast eyes. I went through all the trouble of bringing you a new fine governess all the way from London, and this is how you welcome her. I don't want a new one, Caroline said with her eyes on the ground. I want Miss Watts back. Well, she isn't coming back, Caroline. It is time you resigned yourself to that fact. You are far too mature to be playing such silly pranks. I would suggest for the remainder of the day you two work on writing an apology letter to Miss Jacobson. Hannah opened her mouth to protest. It was entirely unnecessary. Yes, it was a nasty trick, but making them write out a letter of apology was sure to make them only despise her more. Though Grimshaw's back was turned to the governess, he instinctively knew she was going to protest his punishment. He held up a hand to silence her. Abigail will be tending to you for the rest of the day, he continued when satisfied that Miss Jacobson was not going to speak out of turn. You will not be joining me in the West Wing or for supper this night. I expect you both in bed early so that you may contemplate how better you might welcome your new governess, he added deeply. Both girls, who were first shocked by his punishment, now looked to the rug below their feet and simply mumbled a, Yes, father. Now, if you will follow me, Miss Jacobson, we have more to discuss, while Abigail will see to the girls' task for the afternoon. Hannah opened and closed her mouth a few times. She would have much rather dealt with the situation on her own, not have his lordship barrel in and take control of the situation. Yet he stood at the door and motioned for her to exit with him, and there was nothing she could say about it. We're sorry, Miss Jacobson. Rebecca said just above a whisper as Hannah passed. She knelt down before the both of them. I know you are, and I forgive you both. I am sorry too that I tried to squish such an important member of your family. The Earl cleared his throat and Miss Jacobson stood and exited the room with him. She rather thought she still might be in trouble with him as well, though she had no idea how this could be. Much to her surprise, however, the moment the door was shut tightly behind her, the Earl bent over in uncontrollable laughter. Again she found herself completely bewildered by this man. Finally, he stood and wiped a stray tear from his eye. A mouse on your seat, he said more to himself than to his present company. I must say that I am not so surprised by Caroline, but I can't believe Rebecca went along with it. I am relieved you are finding humour in the situation, Hannah said rather coolly as she looked up at him with arms crossed. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Jacobson. I don't mean to offend. I am sure it was quite a fright for you, though I must say it took a good amount of bravery to try and kill it. It was a shock at first, I must admit, but it didn't help that you didn't give me a chance to compose myself. Instead, you completely took over the whole situation. How am I to get the girls respect if they see you taking charge at every misstep? Well, they are my children, Grimshaw retorted back. It is certainly my responsibility to discipline them, not yours. And why did you have to do it so harshly? You clearly didn't find the offence so heinous by the way you could scarcely escape the room without laughing. It would have been better to have let me deal with it on my own. He repeated Hannah's defensive gesture by crossing his own arms and looking down his long-pointed nose at her. I was only trying to help. Perhaps if you hadn't screamed so, 
I wouldn't have felt the need to come running and intercede. Hannah took a step back from their argument and tried to see things from his side. Of course he would have run in, fists at the ready when it came to his daughters and a supposed encroachment on their safety. She had seen how gentle he was with them, and clearly he loved them far more than she had ever seen in her last employment. His daughters were treasures, and he took his responsibility as their father very seriously. I apologise then. I shouldn't have been so cross with you. I suppose I am still a bit frazzled, Hannah said, removing the false spectacles and rubbing the bridge of her nose. The blasted things did pinch something fierce. You don't need to apologise, Grimshaw said, feeling his own resolve to be angry melt away. Come let us sit to tea and perhaps I can give you a better idea of why the girls might have behaved so. Hannah raised her eyes to meet his gaze, surprised by his invitation. She questioned his motives. Frankly, she questioned any man who wished to be in her presence alone, especially her employer. Sebastian couldn't help but feel his heart catch in his throat when he saw the lady before him without her bothersome spectacles. They were so thick and large that he had not even noticed the staggeringly gorgeous blue eyes beneath them. As she studied his intentions, he was taken aback by her thick, dark lashes that seemed to flutter like butterfly wings. He wondered to himself what she looked like with both the glasses and her oversized matron cap removed. Was her hair dark like her lashes and brows or lighter in colour? He tried to imagine what would suit her better. It was impossible to tell with her head so closely covered. I promise you will find it most enlightening, the Earl added by way of encouragement. I believe you will understand the girls better once I have told you about their history. All right, Hannah said rather reluctantly. At first she had feared his imposing features, especially when it culminated with anger in her direction. But now he seemed so gentle. It was as if he was well aware of his fearsome stature and matched his movement and speech to soften his rough exterior. Together they sat in a luxurious drawing room. Though the room was of good fashion, it seemed to her that it hadn't been used for quite some time. There was the fact that several maids hurriedly rushed around to open the floor-to-ceiling curtains. Behind each set were magnificent arched windows that let in the glow of the afternoon sun. After a few moments of looking around the room, Hannah could pick up its distinct femininity. This was no doubt once his wife's sitting room. Hannah's eyes fell on an embroidery hoop filled with a half-finished pink rose. Her fingers tingled to touch the sample, while her body was sure her mere presence was trespassing on the late lady of the house. Mrs. Brennan came in herself carrying the fine china tea set on a silver tray. She set the tray on a small table next to Hannah. Hannah looked around the room and realised that she was no doubt sitting in the lady of the house's spot. The whole room was situated around this one chair with its table next to it. It would make it easy for a lady to serve her guests and talk freely with all of them seated around the warmth of the hearth. As realisation dawned, she looked over at the Earl. He did his best to hide his discomfort at the fact, but he wasn't doing well. May I serve the tea? Hannah asked. Yes, of course, he said awkwardly, while he cleared his throat a few times. She poured the tea and added two sandwiches to a small plate. Standing, she brought it over to him. Then she got her own cup and a small plate, and stealthily moved to sit in a different spot. He smiled at her, thankful for her understanding. It was very clear to Hannah that just as the Earl loved his daughters, his heart was still full of mourning for his wife. 5. For a few moments the two sat in silence, and Hannah wondered why he had insisted she spent this time with him, as he didn't seem to have anything to say. That old lump grew in the back of her throat again. Was he merely looking for a private audience with her? He did seem different from the Baron in the few days she had been in his acquaintance, but perhaps all men were the same in that respect. I do apologise again for being overbearing today. I should have let you handle the situation, Grimshaw said after finishing his sandwiches and setting his tea aside untouched. You care deeply for your daughters, though. Hannah inserted the reasoning he was no doubt thinking about. 
I am sure it was just an automatic reaction to come to their aid. He softened into a little smile. It seemed a bit of a foreign expression on such a skilled scowler. It is not just that. You see, I hoped that I could take this afternoon to explain things better to you. Perhaps then tomorrow when you rejoin them in the classroom, you will not hold today's actions against them. I would never do such a thing. They are children, and children make mistakes. I am sure they thought it a rather funny joke. Hannah assured the Earl that she had no intention of reprimanding them past their father's requirements today. I am glad to hear that. But if you would allow me to explain their situation anyway, he said softly. He was such a large man, he seemed to fill the whole of the couch he sat on. It looked a bit comical to Hannah. She wondered if there was truly any place on earth this man didn't seem to fill to overflowing with his physical presence. You know that their mother died when they were both very young. She took ill quite suddenly and we lost her, Grimshaw said, turning his head away from Hannah and to the window. I'm sure the loss was felt more greatly by Caroline, Hannah encouraged his words when he didn't speak more. Yes, well, she remembers her. Rebecca was only three, so small. It breaks my heart that she will have no lasting memory of her own mother. He paused again. This was not an easy subject for him to speak on, and Hannah allowed him the time to collect his thoughts. Caroline is really at that age now when a mother's influence is necessary. Of course it is necessary for a lady at any age, but as they get older, they are needing more and more of that feminine example. I thought I had found such a thing in my last governess. Both girls adored her. Of course they have always had a youthful light to them but with the governess it was different. They were happy in ways I can't explain. Then she left us suddenly. Hannah wanted to ask why, but also feared his answer. She too had left her last station suddenly. If his rules and controlling mannerisms were any indication, Hannah feared the Earl was cut from the same cloth as the Baron. Unfortunately, he didn't give the governess's reason for leaving, and it only made Hannah question and wonder more. When she left us, the girls were beside themselves. I did my best to help them and keep them entertained, but there is just something different about time with a woman. They need that influence. I suppose what I am getting at, he said, brushing a hand through his cropped black hair, is that their little act today was more out of fear. Fear, Lord Grimshaw? Yes, I am sure they fear attaching themselves to a lady only to have her leave them again. That is why I made sure to interview the governesses myself, no matter how unorthodox. It is also why I picked you. You seemed like someone who would be willing to be their pillar. He looked deep into Hannah's eyes, and she feared he had reached her very soul. I know it is a lot to ask, but I need you to be that woman for my girls. Can you overlook their actions and see their hurt behind it? Will you truly forgive them? and be that feminine figure that they need in their lives? Hannah couldn't speak for a moment. She was overcome with emotions at his earnest pleading as well as the penetrating stare of his brown eyes. She took a sip of tea, for nothing more than to break the intense connection between them. It also gave her the strength to answer. I am honoured that you would put so much trust in me. I promise you, Lord Grimshaw, I will do everything in my power not to let you or the girls down. Lord Grimshaw seemed to visibly relax at her words. Hannah felt a strange comfort herself to know that she had relieved him of some burden he must have been silently carrying at least these few months since the last governess left. Now, if you would please excuse me, I have some work to do in the West Wing. Hannah stood up in unison with him. And what shall I do for the rest of the day since you have seemed to relieve me of my pupils? Whatever you want. Of course, please stay to the estate grounds, he added as an afterthought. But other than that, you are free to explore and settle yourself in. Naturally, you are still most welcome to join me for dinner even with the girls absent, he added, before bowing and leaving the room. Hannah didn't answer him. With his words, she felt the claustrophobic grip of his controlling rules again. She wasn't allowed to leave the estate. 
He may have merely requested her presence at dinner and not ordered it, but it still brought back terrible memories of her last post. She would not be joining him for dinner without the presence of the girl's innocent eyes on them. Instead, she would take the opportunity to explore the house more, then take a quiet meal in her room before preparing how to go about the next day's classes. The following morning, Hannah was ready to get to work. She wasn't used to having idle hands. She had spent the remainder of yesterday afternoon in her room and took her evening meal there as well. It made her quite restless to have nothing to do but look over the things she brought. She did take a short walk around the manor, but didn't feel very comfortable doing so. In her last house, she had been so busy seeing to the needs of her pupil and avoiding the baron that she had never left the few rooms that necessity dictated she be in. Hannah was happy to see that she got to the girls' schoolroom before them the following day. It would give her time to organise it to her liking. Already she had assessed the girls' weaknesses and strengths and had organised lessons for the next few months. Whether it was because of the movement of heavy books and furniture or the fact that the days were beginning to warm up in earnest, either way, Hannah was feeling quite warm in her linen gown and a cotton cap. She would have loved to take it off, for she truly detested the item, as well as the fake spectacles that pinched at her nose and gave her a constant headache. She could do nothing for it, however. Of course she felt no need to hide herself from the children or their nurse, but there was always the possibility of Lord Grimshaw bursting in again. Already his overbearing status and demanding rules made her wary. She would not give him even the slightest reason as the Baron had claimed she did for him. Good morning, girls, Hannah said as her wards were shuffled into the room by their nurse. They both stepped in, curtsied with eyes on the ground and mumbled their salutations. Hannah suspected they were prepared for a severe reprimand or perhaps sour disposition in the least after yesterday's events. I thought we might start the morning with a story if that's all right with you, Hannah said. Both girls simply nodded timidly, with Rebecca looking to her older sister for a cue. Don't worry, I've already checked and made sure that Mr Whiskers is happily secured in his cage, Hannah added, hoping her little joke would brighten the girl's mood. It didn't, however. Come now, Hannah said, crouching down before them. Why such sad faces? Hannah was doing her best to be soft-spoken and kind to the girls. It was much like encouraging a skittish cat to a bowl of milk. Will you be leaving us now, as Miss Watts did? Rebecca finally asked softly. Because of our nasty trick, that is. Oh no, my dear, Hannah responded, taking the little girl's hand. It will take much more than Mr Whiskers to scare me off. She didn't leave because of Mr Whiskers, Caroline said. She left because she found a beau. Mr Collins, who also goes to our parish, she explained. I see. I had no idea. And I suppose you cared for her very much before she left. Both girls nodded in unison. Rebecca's big brown eyes were filling with tears. Hannah was sure the girls were still hurting deeply at the loss of their governess. No doubt they had hoped to start things on a bad foot so that Hannah would be cruel to them. It would be a lot easier to let a mean governess go than one they had grown to love like their last one. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Hannah's heart ached for them. She would not be cruel to them, however. Instead, she would show them the abundance of motherly love that they were missing and also show them that no matter what she would be consistent in their life. Well, I can assure you I have no plans to leave any time soon. I rather hoped you two would be okay with that. I think we could all have great fun together. Rebecca rubbed an eye with her still cherubic hand to brush away a betraying tear and softened into a hopeful smile. Hannah was relieved that at least one of the girls was willing to open their hearts to her. In fact, I must confess I was inspired by Mr. Whiskers. I have brought with me a relatively new set of stories. They are written by a lovely lady named Beatrix Potter. Do you know them? Both girls shook their heads, Rebecca intrigued and Caroline still determined to be distant. Oh, splendid, Hannah said, rising to stand. 
She kept her hand in Rebecca's and ushered them over to sit by the hearth. She lifted up the pillow and inspected the seat dramatically before sitting down. It got a small giggle out of the youngest. Now her first story is about a very naughty bunny named Peter Rabbit, but I thought we might start with a story you would find more interesting called The Tailor of Gloucester. Hannah settled into the chair and flipped through her cloth-bound collection of stories until she landed on the third one. She showed the introductory picture to both girls. It was a small mouse seated on a spool of thread reading a paper. In this story, a tailor is desperately struggling to get his work done on time. Luckily, he has some very kind mice that live in the dresser and help him with his work. By the time Hannah finished her story, both girls were enraptured with the story and the little characters. Even Caroline, who had tried so hard to stay distant, couldn't help but feel the excitement of the enchanting tale. Perhaps if I leave my sampler in Mr Whisker's cage, he will finish it for me, Caroline mused when the story was over. He would just shred it and make a bed out of it like all the other fabric we give him, Rebecca responded. I am fine with that too. Then I wouldn't have to work on it any more. I think it is wonderful that you have already started a sampler, Caroline, Hannah responded. You must be very skilled to already have one started so young. You must show it to me after our penmanship. Caroline held her head a little higher at the compliment. She had only started the sampler right before Miss Watts's departure and had refused to continue the work after she left. But now hearing that she was quite advanced for her age, she had the sudden desire to pick it up again. Six. As it was Saturday, Hannah finally got her first relief from teaching the girls. It was not as wanted as she had expected. Within the Baron's home, Hannah counted down the days until she would get her day off from educating the pupil who was just as much a handful as his father. After teaching the girls for almost a week, Hannah could easily say she had enjoyed every moment of it and had no desire to depart from them. Much to Hannah's surprise, she also found herself enjoying her evening supper at the Earl's table. Both of them seemed to focus more on the girls than anything else. She couldn't help but admire the man for his dedication to his daughters and real interest in their lives. Though she was looking forward to a chance to catch up on some grading over the last week and having a small break from work, she was also apprehensive of the day. Hannah didn't want to stay cooped up in the house, but also felt concerns about travelling to the nearby town. Lord Grimshaw's overbearing rules seemed to pound in the back of her mind. She refused to ask his permission or even his accompaniment as she went to town to pick up a few items she was in need of. At the same time, she did slightly fear his wrath at knowingly breaking his demands. She couldn't afford to be dismissed from a job yet again and without a good reference. More than that, she couldn't bear to leave the girls after making so much headway with them this last week. She was sure that to do so would be a greater detriment to their already delicate demeanours. Instead, Hannah sought out the advice of Mrs Brennan. Perhaps the lady would accompany her to town, thereby stepping around the Earl's requirements. I wonder if I might have a moment of your time, Mrs Brennan, Hannah said, after softly knocking on the housekeeper's office door. Yes, of course, Mrs Brennan replied, coming to stand from behind her desk. I don't want to disturb you if you are otherwise engaged, Hannah said, motioning to the paperwork before the housekeeper. Nonsense, I was just thinking it might be a good time to take a break. She pulled a cord on the wall that also contained a series of bells of her own summons from the main house. Instantly, a young kitchen maid came in the room and curtsied. Will you bring some tea for Miss Jacobson and me? Mrs Brennan asked the girl politely. She nodded and quickly left the room. The middle-aged woman motioned for Hannah to join her in two chairs with a small table between them. Other than the sound of rustling skirts and the clinking of Mrs. Brennan's keys at her waist, the downstairs of the manor was a peaceful place. Are you settling in well? Mrs. Brennan asked after they both sat. Yes, the room is magnificent. The house is one of the most beautiful I have ever seen. Have you been around the gardens at all? They are all abloom this time of year. I have gone out a few times with the girls over the past few days. The skill of the gardeners is breathtaking. 
I will have to pass your compliments on to Hansen, our head landscaper. He will be happy to hear of your enjoyment. I do have a concern, however, that I hoped you might help me unravel. Of course, Mrs. Brennan said as the tea was set before them and served. I need to go to town to get some items. Unfortunately, the Earl has expressed that I shan't go without his accompanying me. The housekeeper nodded her head in understanding. I would hate to be such a burden on him. I wondered if perhaps you need to go to town sometime in the future and I could accompany you. If Lord Grimshaw fears for my safety outside the estate, surely your company or perhaps Mary's would be enough to satisfy him. I can assure you that his rules have nothing to do with danger at Concordshire. It is a most peaceful place, and there is certainly nothing like the ruffians of London to worry about, she added with distaste. Hannah gathered that Mrs. Brennan didn't care for the city. Then why have such a silly rule? Hannah asked with a lump in her throat. She had hoped that he would not be as controlling as the Baron, but could see no other reason why he would put such demands on her as to have control over her at all times. Did the Earl tell you the nature of the last governess's departure? I only know that she met a gentleman and was married. Yes, a kind man from the local parish. He was a student of the vicar, and has since left to take on his own parish. It was very hard on the girls. Lord Grimshaw told me as much, and I could easily tell from them. Yes, Mrs. Brennan agreed meditatively. I believe he is hesitant to let another governess go the same way. He would do anything to shield those girls from heartbreak. I can't blame him for that. Nor I, Hannah had to agree. But certainly, I cannot be held accountable for someone else's choice. I can promise you I have no desire to find a husband or marry, Hannah continued, tugging on her plain brown muslin dress. Give him time and I am sure he will soften. Until then, I would suggest adhering to his requirements. He is very protective of his children and would not take lightly to any act that he would consider a threat to their happiness. I am sorry, but I cannot bring myself to ask him to accompany me to town. I assure you that despite his large stature, he is a very gentle man. You would find his company most agreeable. I don't doubt that, but it wouldn't be appropriate and I can't do it, Hannah said vehemently. Well, I know that Mary goes to town on Saturdays as well. I am sure she would be more than happy to pick up whatever you might need, or mail any letters you might have. Hannah sat as she considered Mrs. Brennan's words. She had rather hoped the lady would have just agreed that going with another member of the staff was good enough. She couldn't risk the Earl's wrath and subsequent dismissal. Mrs. Brennan might have thought he was somehow gentle below that dark exterior. Certainly she had seen such with his daughters, but she didn't for a second consider that to extend to herself. If her only two choices were to be subject to a private audience with the Earl or being confined to the manor as a prison, she would have to take the latter. She wouldn't lose this job for the sake of the girls and her own livelihood, but that wouldn't for a second lead her to giving up her morals. She had fought off the Baron. She was sure she could withstand the Earl of Grimshaw as well. Hannah left Mrs. Brennan's office not with the end result she desired, but at least a resolution to her problems. She would seek Mary out. Hopefully she hadn't already left for town. Much to her satisfaction, she found Mary seated in the staff common area, and she was happy to pick up the needed items on behalf of Hannah. Hannah was making her way down the hall back to her quarters. She rather thought since she wasn't able to make the trip to town, she would select a book from her room and spend some time in the garden. Well, look who has found her way downstairs, a man's voice called from behind her. She whipped around to find Mr. Poole, the footman, leaning against a doorframe she had just passed. She rather thought to just keep walking on and ignore him altogether. How are you finding Brighton Abbey, Miss Jacobson? he asked, rubbing his hands on a cloth and taking a step towards her. Though she had at first had uneasy thoughts of the gentleman, she thought it innocent enough conversation, so she turned fully to answer him. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Poole. Everyone has been most welcoming to me. I'm sure they have, he said, eyeing the edge of her cap. 
She had a sudden urge to pull it down tighter around her hair and pull up her fichu all at the same time. He continued to slowly walk forward until he was far too close to her. She meant to take a step back, but he instantly put a hand on her shoulder. Excuse me, Mr. Poole, she said, trying to shake off his grip unsuccessfully. I really must be going. What's the hurry? he asked, as a thumb rubbed against the fabric of her dress. She tried again to step away from him, but instead he used the movement to push her against the hall wall. Tucking the cloth in his back pocket, he placed his other hand against the wall, completely blocking her in. I can't help but wonder what you are hiding under all that fabric, Miss Jacobson, he said, looking her over with hungry eyes. Her heart was pounding in her chest and she wanted to scream. His hand moved from her shoulder and she felt his fingers run along the edge of her white fichu. She felt him tug at it. With a gasp, she reached up to stop him, but instead he grabbed her wrist and held it tight. He continued to tug at the white fabric until one side was completely out. Please, stop Mr. Poole. I will scream, Hannah said, mustering all the courage that she had. He paid her no mind and successfully removed the garment, exposing the top of her full chest. Why, Miss Jacobson, you were hiding something magnificent under all that fabric. What will I see when I remove your cap next? Perhaps beautiful blonde hair, or rich dark brown? Or shall I be surprised by a redhead? You certainly have the milky white skin to go with fairer hair. He ran one finger along the edge of her gown. It seemed he either didn't believe she would scream or didn't care. Mr. Poole, you will remove your hand from me this instant, or I shall go straight to the Earl about your unseemly behaviour. Oh, I don't think you will, Mr. Poole said, smiling with satisfaction at her defiant glare. I am all too aware that the Earl has forbidden you from having any interaction with the opposite sex. You tell him and I will simply counter that you came on to me. Who do you think Lord Grimshaw will believe more? A long-time employee or the new governess? Hannah opened and closed her mouth a few times in panic. Mr. Poole was absolutely right. If the Lord confronted them both, who was to say that he would believe her? Mr. Poole smiled in satisfaction, knowing that he was right in his line of thought. Now take off that cap for me, so that I may finally learn the colour of that hair. I believe that will be a good place to start anyway. Tears welled in Hannah's eyes. She would not give him the satisfaction of obeying, but was also terrified that she would have no way out of this situation. Mr. Poole, have you finished with the silverware yet? A man's voice called from down the hall. Whether the man could see that Mr. Poole had her pinned up against the wall, she was unsure, but she didn't wait to find out. As soon as Mr. Poole turned in the direction of the voice, she swatted his hand and ran as fast as her skirts would allow, leaving her fichu behind. She paused just before turning to the stairs that led up to the main house and her own room. Mr. Poole had picked up the lost garment. He held it to his nose and took a deep breath before opening his eyes again directly on her. She felt a fearful shiver run down her spine at his glare. She may have escaped him, but it was clear he wasn't going to give up. With hot tears streaming down her face, she ran the length to her room and locked the door behind her. Throwing herself onto the bed, she melted into a hysterical cry. Again she was to be tormented by a man. All the images of the Baron came back to her. All the times he cornered her, made excuses to get her alone in his office, and even made advances on her in front of his son. In the end, word had travelled to his wife, and the Baron had insinuated that Hannah was the cause all along. He claimed she had tempted him with her beauty and promiscuous ways. It was no more Hannah's fault that she had looked the pretty miss than a plain one. Yet the Baroness had believed her husband and Hannah was dismissed with a stained reputation and no hope of another situation. She was sure that with her new plan to completely cover every inch of her body, there would have been no question to her virtue or any infringement on it. She had been so wrong. It seemed that no matter where she found herself, she would be helpless to stop rakes and their desire to take from her flesh. Chapter 7 Hannah, 
Baron Edgeley's voice echoed in the darkness. She wasn't sure exactly where she was, only that she had been wandering in the dark for some time now. At the sound of his voice, her own caught in her throat. Hannah ran the space of the darkness looking for some way out as his taunting seemed to grow closer and closer. Finally, she could make out a dim light in the distance and she ran for it. The closer she got, the more she realised it was the crack of a door and the light of freedom and safety just beyond. Hannah, my pet, there is no reason to play so coy with me. The voice was getting ever closer from behind as Hannah, heaving against her stays, did her best to run for the door. Finally, she gripped the handle and used it to pull herself into the room. She fell in exhausting only to realise that it wasn't the ground that had caught her. She looked up, her eyes following the hands, up the arms to the shoulders, and then the face. Why, Miss Jacobson? Mr Poole said with that sickly smile planted on his narrow face. No need to throw yourself at me. Hannah struggled to get up and away but the arms that had caught her now tightened their grip till she squealed out in pain. Holding her tight, he lifted her to her feet and pinned her hard against the wall. Help! she screamed with all her might. Shout all you want, he said, pushing his body against her own. There is no one to hear you here. He licked his lips as his eyes fell down the length of her body. With one swift movement of his hand, he grabbed the top of her dress and ripped it, exposing her undergarments and bare shoulder. He kissed her neck and shoulder and she screamed again. His head lifted this time, showing the face of Baron Edgeley. Leave me alone, she screamed as she beat against the man to no avail. He ravaged her again along her neck and collarbone. This time when he rose, he was yet again Mr Poole. Grabbing both shoulders with his painful grip, he lifted her off her feet and threw her across the room onto a lounge. Hannah fell with a hard thud against the cushions and screamed with all her might as he walked slowly towards her, a horrid smile ever present on his thin lips. Hannah bolted upright in her bed. The sound of her own screams had woken her and in the darkness she wasn't sure if she was truly awake or if the nightmare only continued. She struggled to catch her breath when heavy quick steps ended with her bedroom door bursting open. Hannah screamed again instinctively and jumped from the bed. What? What is it? A deep hoarse voice demanded. She scarcely saw the figure of the Earl by the candle he held, but the image didn't register. Instead she reached for the first object she could, a book on the table next to her bed, and chucked it at him. I won't let you near me, Hannah screamed. Lord Grimshaw instinctively blocked the book that was thrown at him, completely baffled by her actions. Was she mad? He reached forward and grabbing one elbow, he shook her good and hard. Miss Jacobson, what's the matter with you? She seemed to snap out of it with the shake. She looked around the room, startled and bewildered. One hand cupped her mouth and large tears spilled from her eyes. I'm so sorry, she muffled, finally waking up. Grimshaw set the candlestick on the table that had once held the book and ever so gently took a step closer to her. I heard screams. I thought something might be... Was it a dream? he asked, still trying to piece together all that had just happened. All she could do was nod her head while she still held her mouth. She was shaking uncontrollably and Grimshaw was sure that at any moment she would crumple into a heap on the ground. Instincts kicked in and he pulled her to his chest. She didn't fight the action. Instead, she fell against him and let her sobs out full force. Hush now, Miss Jacobson. It is all right, he cooed, with his chin resting against the top of her head. It was just a dream, nothing more. As Grimshaw held her, he allowed one massive hand to rub up and down her back to soothe her. His eyes were caught by the long gold braid that shimmered in the little candlelight that went the length of her back. He absent-mindedly wondered how she fit such a long golden lock under such a small cap. Do you want to tell me about it? Grimshaw said against her hair as she finally started to calm down. It was as if the words woke her for a second time. She took a step back and out of his arms. Though he let her go without a fight, 
he immediately felt an empty cold where she had been against him. I'm sorry, forgive me, Lord Grimshaw, she stammered. She wrapped her arms around herself, no doubt to hide the state of undress, though he was sure he had never seen a plainer and more modest dressing gown. There is nothing to forgive, Grimshaw said in a soft voice, much like when one of the girls was upset. Yes, I woke you up in the middle of the night. I can't imagine the disturbance I've caused. Please forgive me. It won't happen again, I promise. Miss Jacobson murmured, her blue eyes fuller of fear than tears now. Come, it is all right, Grimshaw said, taking another step forward. She took a fearful step back, however, and that stopped him in his tracks. Grimshaw was used to being feared because of his overpowering features, but for some reason it pained him tonight to see her terror. If you are sure you are all right, I will leave you then, he said, letting his hands fall to his sides. I will send someone up with a cup of tea to calm your nerves. It was a statement, not a question, and for once Hannah was okay with his demanding nature. She wasn't sure if she would be able to fall back asleep ever again after that dream, but the warm drink would be a welcome comfort. Would you like me to also leave the candle, he asked, his big brown eyes seemingly full of compassion. She should have said no. She had candles already in the room, but this one was already lit and that brought her comfort too. Yes, please, Hannah said softly. Lord Grimshaw nodded in understanding. He turned to leave but turned back around. If you ever need to talk about... He hesitated. Anything. I am here to listen. Hannah took in the weight of his words. It was very kind of him, but at the moment she couldn't bear to say the words to anyone, certainly not to him. Lord Grimshaw would take her words to Poole, and then the accusation would turn on to her. All she could do was nod before watching him leave the room with a soft click of the door behind her. Grimshaw was feeling rather ridiculous with himself as he fixed his knot after his valet had done it. Nothing seemed to be sitting right this Sunday morning. Try as he might to tell himself that it had nothing to do with Miss Jacobson joining them in their pew today at church, or the fact that since his sudden encounter with Miss Jacobson last night in her room, he hadn't been able to shake the memory of her from his mind. Something in him had changed or perhaps opened again when he held her in his arms while she cried. He shook off the notion, however. No doubt it was just manly desires. After all, without all those frocks to cover her up, Miss Jacobson was actually quite pleasant to look at. He didn't care a whit for her beauty, however. The day his wife died, he swore there would be no other for him. Of course, Lady Grimshaw had only encouraged him to find a mother for their children on her deathbed. He would hear none of it. She had smiled at him in that knowing way and weakly passed a letter off to him. Just in case you change your mind, she had said in her weak voice before giving way to coughs again. Grimshaw had looked at the letter in his hand, and were it not for his wife's presence, he would have immediately thrown it into the fire. It was titled, To Lord Grimshaw's Future Wife. He had shoved the note into the top drawer of the dresser in his wife's room and had not thought of it again until this moment. His mind mentally saw the sealed letter again and wondered over the words inscribed on top. He reassured himself again. There would never be a future wife for him. He had had his happiness, and though it was fleeting, he had two beautiful girls to show for it. That was enough for him. Miss Hannah Jacobson stood before her own mirror in her room much the worse for wear. She did her best to stuff her hair in the cap before setting a hat on top of that. It was her Sunday hat with a bright yellow ribbon bow tied around its wicker brim. She didn't feel bright at all like the hat on her head or the matching corn blue dress with its yellow flower pattern. In fact, if she could crawl back into her bed and never come out, that would have suited her just fine. Of course, the girls would be waiting for her. She was to pick them up at the nursery and escort them down to meet their father in the carriage. Together they would ride into town and attend the weekly services. Hannah would have said that she was rather settling into her life at Brighton Abbey up until yesterday. Now she had been accosted, had the weight of Mr. Poole possibly lurking around every corner, 
and worse had made a fool of herself during the night. How much of what she shouted had been screams and how much had been words. What she feared more than ever was that she may have said something pertaining to Baron Edgeley. If that were the case, Lord Grimshaw would certainly look into her past employment wondering why she would call his name at night. It would only be a matter of time, then, before the Baroness would spread her lies even to this far-flung country house. Hannah was sure by week's end she would be unjustly ruined again and have exhausted all opportunities for employment. What was she to do then? She certainly couldn't return to Hendrick's preparatory school. They had, of course, offered her a place there since she was one of the most accomplished students. She could bear living on the streets better than returning to that place. Yes, life would be better for her as a teacher than a pupil. No longer would she have cold, drafty dormitories, forced washing in water that must have the ice broken first or improper clothing against the winter cold. She could never treat those girls the way she was treated, nor bear to watch another do so and keep her mouth silent. She had been beaten, shamed, and starved enough in one childhood to ever stand by and watch it happen to another. No, she would never be a good fit for Hendrix, and she doubted that the Baroness hadn't already written to them as well. No welcome was to be found there. As nervous as she was to see Lord Grimshaw this morning after such a personal and embarrassing encounter last night, it was a necessity. Only then could she gauge his own mind and perhaps decipher how much she had said through her screams. She didn't feel up to the task after such a fitful night of sleep, but there was nothing to be done for it. After all, if Hendrix was good for one thing, it was to teach young ladies to withstand almost any amount of starvation or sleeplessness and still perform up to snuff. She placed her pin in her hat, covered both her hands in laced gloves, and left her room to collect her two wards. Chapter 8 Grimshaw had convinced himself by the time he left his room and made his way downstairs that all feelings and nervousness was nothing more than imagined. Still, he couldn't help but stare as he watched Miss Jacobson descend the stairs with his two daughters in hand. Of course, both girls had been dressed in their finest by dutiful Abigail. Carolyn was wearing a grey silk dress with a burgundy rose pattern running down in stripes with matching burgundy velvet bows in her dark brown hair. Rebecca looked ever the baby in her pink silk dress, with its matching pink petticoats sticking out of the bottom. It had been a gift from his last trip into London, and he was happy to see her in it. Rebecca loved everything girly still, and Grimshaw wanted to savour that in his youngest daughter as long as possible. But not even the beauty of his little girls could keep his eyes off of Miss Jacobson. As she slowly made her way down with a child in each hand, she rather looked like a golden angel from the large window reflecting light behind her. The large yellow ribbon in her hat reminded him so much of the hair he had rested his head against only the night before. He was surprised to see, too, that for the first time Miss Jacobson was not wearing the large spectacles that had hid most of her face since he first met her. He couldn't help but notice her perfectly clear blue eyes that matched her dress perfectly, as well as the soft indent of dimples on either cheek. Perhaps if she smiled, they became more pronounced. He suddenly felt an unnatural desire to say something funny, only to experiment with the truth of his hypothesis. Have you forgotten your spectacles? Grimshaw asked as soon as the ladies finished their descent and came to stand before him. He wanted to say how refreshing he found seeing her perfect porcelain skin without their hindrance, but knew that would be far too forward. Yes. Miss Jacobson said, releasing Caroline's hand and pinching the bridge of her tiny nose. I only need them for reading. Will you not need to read the hymn book? We have time to wait if you need to go and retrieve them, Grimshaw added rather reluctantly. He was hoping to see more of Miss Jacobson without the constant shield her glasses caused by seeing truly into her eyes. No, I will be fine. It is only for excessive amounts of reading, like schoolwork she continued in her fabrication of a story. In all honesty, Hannah had reluctantly gone without the eyewear, only because the crying the night before had given her such a headache. She couldn't bear the pinching sensation the spectacles gave behind the ears and at the bridge of her nose in such a state. 
She had rather hoped it wouldn't make that much difference, but the Earl had commented on it. He was also looking down at her in a way that was quite frightening at the moment. She hated to sound vain, even in her own head, but she was sure that her beauty was nothing more than a curse set upon her. Luckily, no more words were said on the matter, and Hannah followed behind the Earl, who happily took Caroline's free hand as they left Brighton Abbey. Hannah had to shield herself against the bright light as they exited the manor house. It seemed to be so beautiful and alive outside that she wondered for a second if it could be Easter morning. The carriage ride into the town was one to remember for her. On her way to Brighton Abbey, it had been much too dark to see the fields of green or trees fat with spring leaves. Now there seemed to be every shade of green surrounding her. Along the road's edge sprang little wildflowers. Hannah wondered if she might take the girls to pick some in the afternoon. As the town came into view, Hannah couldn't help but feel a little excitement. She was finally seeing it for the first time. It resembled more of a quaint village than a town, with only one main street that led to a large square. In the middle of the square was a communal well, and behind that stood the stone church. It was by far the finest building in the village. It was made even more beautiful by the plump purple wisteria that climbed up its side. Hannah couldn't help but breathe in the fresh new life that seemed to rain down on her with the rays of sunshine as she exited the Earl's fine carriage. Already there was a steady stream of villagers in their Sunday best, greeting the vicar at the door and making their way into the church. Upon their exit, the carriage driver continued on, no doubt to a stable to settle the two white horses that galloped with great majesty. The Earl led the way as Hannah followed behind with one girl in each hand. Rebecca was clinging to her in a loving way. Caroline, on the other hand, hadn't quite warmed up to Hannah yet, though she did stay dutifully by her governess's side. Rebecca was young enough to love almost anyone unconditionally. Caroline, on the other hand, still remembered well the bitter sting of one abandonment after another, and Hannah was sure that it would be a much more delicate process for her to open her heart again. Hannah should have not cared a whit for such a thing. Certainly her teaching at Hendricks was to do her job most professionally and without emotional attachment. Such things were only a hindrance and inappropriate in the eyes of her childhood instructors. Hannah found, quite oppositely, that it was the emotional connections that truly helped her wards to grow into well-rounded human beings. Hannah studied the rest of the congregation as they entered the chapel. Aside from her small party, it seemed that most were just humble farmers. She did recognise a few members of staff from Brighton Abbey, however. Her heart ran cold at the realisation. Why it hadn't crossed her mind before, she didn't know. Certainly, if the Earl attended services in Concordshire, then so did the rest of the household. If there was a parish supported by the Earl on his property, then he would certainly attend there. Along with the townsfolk and nearby farmers, there would also be a healthy dose of Brighton Abbey staff members in today's congregation. That, unfortunately, would include Mr David Poole. Good morning, Lord Grimshaw, a feeble voice crooned with a bow. Looking upon the vicar, Hannah had to guess he was close to the end of his life. No doubt it was the reason for the younger man at the parish at the time of their last governess's service. Though she was told now both Miss Watts and her new preacher husband were removed from this place elsewhere. Good morning, Dr. O'Driscoll, Grimshaw responded in his deep, commanding voice. Please let me introduce our new governess, he added with a sweeping hand back for Hannah to come forward. Miss Hannah Jacobson. Hannah curtsied respectfully. He seemed to eye her with a raised brow. Perhaps Dr. O'Driscoll was just as wary of her due to past governesses brought to his service. And where do you hail from, Miss Jacobson? he asked in his quaky voice while folding his hands in front of his plain black preacher's garb. I was born and raised in London. I would assume so, since Lord Grimshaw only seeks the best governesses, and naturally they will come from the fine city. But where in London, my dear? Already she could see that she was about to be sized up on account of her heritage. She had none to speak of, and though this man was of the cloth she suspected by his downcast eyes, he planned to judge her by it. 
Most of my childhood was spent in Hendrick's preparatory school for young misses. My aunt and uncle were kind enough to sponsor me thus, Hannah said in hopes of dodging the question. Ah, I know the school well. It is one of the few fine establishments left, he said now by way of informing the Earl. So often now these schools have gone soft on their wards and forgotten the necessity of a proper upbringing in humility and the good word. Hannah did her best to hide the overcast shadow on her face at his words. They had certainly endeavoured to teach these two things by way of regular beatings, humiliation and starvation. It was clear that the reverend was of the same mind, spare kindness and quicken the rod. I can promise you they were most thorough in both aspects, Hannah said with a sour taste in her mouth. Dr O'Driscoll gave a nod of approval and a gruff grunt. At that moment... Hannah realised that the Earl was studying her most pointedly. He seemed to be searching for a way into her own mind. She looked away quickly, unable to hold such a penetrating stare. They made their way into the cool chapel along the flagstone walk, past the pews already filled with Brighton Abbey's household and farmers. Hannah could see that at the front of the chapel were seats much more sparsely filled. The dress of the people in these pews was more refined as well. She supposed these were the few townsfolk that had a slightly better standard of living than those who sat farther behind. Here the ladies' dresses were of a finer quality and prettier colours compared to the demure counterparts behind. Their noses were also distinctly higher than those behind them. The Earl ushered them to the front pew and then stepped aside to allow the three ladies in his company to take their seats first. Hannah had a strange sense of protection as the Earl took his spot at the end of the pew. She hadn't seen Mr Poole among the congregation as of yet, but it still brought her comfort to be enclosed with no chance of someone coming to her without first having to go through Lord Grimshaw. The sermon itself was rather dull as she expected after meeting Dr O'Driscoll. He seemed to have a great passion for reproving sinners, and he seemed to find all women fitted in this category. With such views on the female sex, Hannah couldn't help but wonder how he must have felt when his pupil had announced a desire to marry Miss Watts. It was an excruciatingly long sermon for Hannah that rather reminded her of the time she spent in Hendricks. She couldn't help but be proud of the two girls at her side, who both sat with hands delicately folded in their white lace gloves, their gazes held steady on the face of the preacher. It was only after the sermon when the Earl's party rose to leave that Hannah was particularly aware of all the eyes on them. The Earl, for his part, paid no heed and instead thanked the vicar for his words and then continued down the way, sharing words here and there with several men. How long do you think this one will last? Hannah heard a lady whisper behind her hand to another. Well, at least she isn't as fine to look at as the last. Perhaps that will be the Earl's saving grace. Poor dear, he was so heartbroken after his wife than to have the last governess abandon him. It is a wonder his daughters aren't wildlings, the first agreed. I heard that he refuses to take them to town for the benefit of the tutors. He insists that they stay in the county seat. One could say he is just lucky his daughters are relatively well behaved. Both ladies looked in Hannah's direction, and she held their gaze. She would not hide the fact that she had heard them, nor shy away from it. One of the ladies had the decency to blush at being caught, but that didn't stop them from turning and continuing their hushed talk as they made their way out of the sanctuary. Chapter 9 Are you the new governess? A soft lady's voice shook Hannah from her eavesdropping. Hannah turned to see a kindly older woman in a clean but worn grey linen dress. Yes, I'm Hannah Jacobson. Hannah introduced herself to the lady, feeling warmed by the first kind smile since entering the church. And come all the way from London, I hear. Hannah couldn't help but look down at the lady. She was only a head taller than Caroline. It also didn't help that she had a severe bend to her spine. Despite her uncomfortable position, she seemed a very cheerful sort. Her hair was white and her chin matched in white whiskers, with her small eyes set so far back in her plump round face that it almost looked like currants pushed into a loaf of bread. 
They were dark little eyes, surrounded by waves of wrinkled skin that told a lifetime story. When she smiled, Hannah couldn't help but notice that a few of her teeth were missing as well. Yes, ma'am, Hannah responded. Oh, she waved Hannah off with a blush. Don't you be going calling me such. I ain't no such thing. Then what shall I call you? Hannah asked, elated to make a friend in this conjuration of naysayers and gossip mongers. Why most just call me Widow McCarthy, though I never cared for it? What's the use of being reminded that you're all alone with every word come out of some un's mouth? Hannah had to smile at her logic. Surely you're not all alone, though, Hannah asked, looking around the room for someone that perhaps took care of the aged lady. Oh, there is my son, Matty, though he is far too busy to spend time with an old-timer like me, Zelf. Hannah looked around the room in earnest. Surely this sweet lady was not left to return home alone. Forgive me, a man's voice said from behind her, and Hannah whipped around. I believe my mother is bothering you. Hannah studied the frame of the gentleman. He looked to be in his mid-twenties and rather handsome at that. No, not at all. We were just having a lovely conversation. Hannah turned back to Mrs. McCarthy. She has been a most gracious welcome party for my first Sunday service. Are you her son, then? Hannah inquired. Mrs. McCarthy did mention one. I believe Matty. He cleared his throat. Matthew McCarthy at your service, miss. Miss Hannah Jacobson. Mr. McCarthy, a gruff voice boomed from next to Hannah. She hadn't realised it, but Lord Grimshaw had finished his words and was now apparently entering their conversation. I see you wasted no time in making the acquaintance of my governess. Actually, I was just here to collect my mother. Mother, he said, motioning for the elderly lady to follow after him. Hannah sensed something unspoken and not understood by her between the two gentlemen. They seemed to hold each other's gaze for several seconds. Well, it was very nice meeting you, Mrs. McCarthy, Hannah said, doing her best to hide her confusion on the tension between the two men. Now you come and visit me any time. I would be happy for the company, Mrs. McCarthy said, patting Hannah's hand as she shuffled towards her son. I am all alone in my little cottage and would be happy about it. Just go to the local shop and ask Matty here, and he will show you the way. Thank you, Mrs. McCarthy. That is most kind of you. Miss Jacobson, we really must be going, Lord Grimshaw said in a demanding voice. Yes, of course, Hannah said, only hesitating for a moment as she watched the McCarthys walk away. It wasn't Matthew that she was so interested in, but the sweet little lady. Hannah was sure that she would find a moment in the next week to go and visit with the lady. I believe you are forgetting my conditions, Lord Grimshaw said rather gruffly, after they were all again seated in the carriage waiting out front for them. I'm not sure what you mean, Hannah retorted, not sure if she was more surprised by his words or the accusation behind them. Then I suppose that will be something we can discuss tonight after dinner, he said penetrating her with his dark brown eyes. She was utterly surprised by his words, but more so by the stern nature of his face. She could swear on the ride in he was all aglow with warmth and his eyes shone a sweet honey glee. Now his face was darkened with its usual solemnity and his eyes were as dark as a deep pool. I assure you there will be nothing needing discussion. I was merely speaking with a kind old lady and her young eligible son, Grimshaw added. Hannah opened her mouth to retort, but realised there were two pairs of big doe eyes intently watching the two of them. She was sure this was not an appropriate topic for a carriage ride in front of Grimshaw's two little girls. She was not willing to let him bully her into admitting she was attempting to flirt with Mr McCarthy when she certainly wasn't, nor did she want to disrespect the man by arguing with him in front of his children. Then I suppose there is a misunderstanding between us, and a proper conversation might be well advised. Grimshaw was more than sour that he came upon Miss Jacobson all smiles for Matthew McCarthy at her first church service, no less. He wasn't sure what irritated him more, 
that she seemed to waste no time in finding a suitable bow in town, or that she had shown her first unencumbered smile to another. Now, when he suggested they discuss the matter and resolve it promptly, she had the audacity to pretend to have no idea to his meaning. Now she was claiming that a sit-down was her idea all along. Grimshaw wasn't used to having the tables turned on him, but he had a feeling with Miss Jacobson in his employment he would now always have to be on his toes to counter her cunning abilities. Dinner in the company of the Earl and his daughters was a strained occurrence that Sunday evening. It was as if the weight of the unspoken words for both Grimshaw and Hannah were pressing down on them. Though Rebecca was far too young to notice the change in mood and happily chatted on, Caroline, on the other hand, was very aware of it. Constantly, the girl darted her eyes nervously between her father and governess. Hannah did her best to give the child a reassuring smile whenever possible. Caroline may have understood that something was amiss, but she couldn't know what exactly. Hannah highly doubted that the Earl had made his daughters privy to the knowledge of the ridiculous rules he had yoked upon her. To make matters all the worse, it appeared that Mr. Poole would be waiting on them at dinner that night. Apparently one of the normal servers had fallen ill, and Mr. Poole had happily stepped in to take his place. Hannah didn't have to guess why. He made it a point to stand against the wall directly behind her. Though there were several feet between them, she could still feel his icy breath on her neck. He would make sure to torment her in any way he could, it would seem. Twice he came to fill up Hannah's cup with more sherry, though it wasn't even half empty. She did her best to ignore his eyes drawing to her chest as he poured the decanter. Now that the meal was over, Hannah would have rather liked to go to her room, perhaps take a hot bath if at all possible to wash off Mr. Poole's glowering stares. But this would not be possible for her. She was to meet the Earl in his office promptly for a pointless reprimand. More than the audacity of the matter was the fact that the Earl was going to accuse her of being loose with a man she had only just met in town, when he clearly couldn't even see the lewd looks she got all through the meal from his own footman. Standing outside the Earl's door, Hannah took a steadying breath for courage, and lifted her chin ever so slightly. She had once been the meek type as she had been trained in her younger years. That had rewarded her with the Baron Edgley debacle. She promised herself that mistake would never be made again. She was sure that the moment she stepped into that office, she would be confronted by Lord Grimshaw's overbearing stature and booming words. He would try to bully her, but she would not allow it. She knocked good and hard to make her intentions known, and as soon as she was permitted entrance, she threw back the door and strutted in head held high. Lord Grimshaw, before you speak, Hannah said, coming to stand right in front of the desk he was seated at, I must inform you that you have been grossly mistaken in your accusations. Grimshaw blinked once before relaxing back into his high back chair, interlacing his fingers and smiling slightly. Well then, he said smugly, please do inform me. I had only met a kindly widow woman, who seemed very lonely, I might add, and in great need of Christian kindness and conversation when her son came to collect her. I had not spoken more than introductions to the man before you bellowed into the conversation. She let a long breath out, not realising she had been holding it throughout her practised speech. I see he said after letting her say her piece with all the calm decorum of a man of his rank. And the fact that this kindly widow woman happened to be the mother of the most eligible bachelor of Concordshire is of little consequence. As I said, I would know no such thing as we scarcely exchanged names. Quidia serendipitous coincidence, however, that he would be the man to whom I saw you speaking. Hannah opened her mouth to counter, but he held his hand up to silence her. The point is, I was blindsided by the first governess. I am not so now. I am well aware that ladies of your nature only seek to use my employment and hospitality as a means to procure a, shall we say, different arrangement. For the sake of my children, I will not allow such cunning motives while you are employed under my roof. 
Hannah's hands flew to her hips. How dare you assume you know anything about me? I have done nothing unbecoming of a lady and will not allow you to accuse me of such. I can, however, assure you that I have only taken this post for the sole purpose of educating your daughters with no ulterior motives. Good. That is very good to hear, Grimshaw said with a stern smile on his face. He was proud that he had outwitted her this time. She, unbeknownst to herself, had said the exact words he had led her to. That being the case, then there should be no objections to my regulations and no reason for you ever to find yourself in conversation with Matthew McCarthy again. Hannah shifted her feet a few times. She couldn't possibly disagree with his declaration after stating that her only focus was the girls. But at the same time, she didn't particularly enjoy agreeing to terms that involved telling her who she could and could not speak with. There was nothing to be had for it, however. So, letting her arms fall down at her side, she simply nodded her understanding. Wonderful, Grimshaw said, coming to a stand. Then I believe I can bid you good night. Hannah hesitated. She was so sure that she was going to have this discussion in her control, but it seemed to all slip from her fingers. With nothing more to do for it, she gave a curtsy and her own evening salutation before leaving the room. Grimshaw waited for Miss Jacobson to exit the office before he sat back in his chair. Had she also known the game of wits they had just played? He had to smile to himself, for this round he had won. He also couldn't help but feel admiration for the spunk and tenacity of the girl, certainly not what he would have expected from Hendrick's preparatory school. When he had first learned of her education, he expected her to be the droll, timid thing that was always beaten into every girl that left that place. She had looked the part that first meeting, but Grimshaw was beginning to find that beneath her cap there was a hoyden that perhaps she was not even aware of. Chapter 10 the following weeks, Hannah was happy to say that she fell into a very regular schedule. That schedule included mornings educating the girls on scholarly things. Then they had lunch with Abigail, their nurse. After lunch, Hannah engaged them in various deportment and etiquette lessons, or for strolls around the gardens. The weather was turning so fine with the ripening of spring that their outdoor time was becoming quite regular. Little Lady Rebecca had blossomed before Hannah. Every moment that Hannah shared in that little girl's life seemed to be a magically joyous one. Lady Caroline, on the other hand, was still hesitant to let Hannah in, and she struggled to find the chink in the armour. May we go visit Father in the West Wing this afternoon? Lady Rebecca asked with a heavy sigh as she set down her quill for a moment. Oh yes, Lady Caroline said, perking up instantly. Do say you will allow us to go. Hannah had not heard the West Wing spoken of since the first few days of her arrival. What exactly is so exciting about this area? Hannah asked the girls. There are loads of crumbling stones to climb, and we can hide among the saplings while father works, Rebecca chimed in. Works? He is having it rebuilt, Lady Caroline informed her. I see. And you would usually go and visit him there after your morning lessons? I fear it does sound dangerous. It is not dangerous at all with father there, Lady Caroline said with excitement bursting through her dark eyes. It's been so long since we have been. Do say you will let us go. I wish to see what father has done. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Though Hannah did hesitate in taking the girls to an area of the house that seemed in disrepair, it also looked to be very important to Lady Caroline. Well, you both have made it sound all too tantalising for me not to want to take you and see it myself. If you both do a very good job on your samplers while we read, then I see no reason why we shan't go. As Hannah sat in the chair by the fire reading Greek mythology to the girls, she had to admit she had never seen Lady Caroline so dedicated to her embroidery work. Perhaps taking these trips to the West Wing was just the adventure that Lady Caroline was seeking, and being the one to offer it might finally open the child's heart to Hannah. They strolled down the halls and corridors from the rooms that Hannah was familiar with in the East Wing, 
through the main section of the house and up a set of grand stairs that Hannah had never traversed before. At the top, it was clear that this portion of the house was not livable in simply by the breeze that she could feel. The stairway led to a long hall with windows every few feet. Through the window panes, Hannah glanced into the remains of the wing. There were doors along the hall, no doubt all leading to what used to be rooms, but now they were all to be locked tight as stepping through one would lead to a long fall to the floor below. All that was left of the wing was the stone walls that outlined it. The whole of the inside was nothing but a bare floor with little saplings growing up. Much of the roof seemed to be missing too by the look of light shining down in various rays. As they came to the end of the hall, Hannah could hear the sound of men at work growing louder and louder. Finally, they reached the last door, which was actually open. Coming out from its frame was a long wooden walkway that stood on stilts to hover over the ground. The girls stepped onto this walkway without the slightest hesitation. Hannah, on the other hand, had much more reserve. Girls, I don't know if that is quite safe to do. I wouldn't want you getting into anyone's way either she added, looking at several men walking up and down as they worked on this portion of the outer wall with heavy stones and mortar. We do it all the time, Caroline said before she lifted her skirts and ran along the walkway. Oi, who let these wildlings loose? A deep voice called, a man coming to stand and catching one girl in each arm. Both children giggled happily as they were wrapped in their father's strong grasp. Hannah had just stepped out onto the plank when she heard the call. He came up fully to stand still with one dirty arm wrapped around each girl. He was just as shocked to see Hannah as she was to be looking at his bare chest. He was glistening with sweat and dusted with the dirt coming off the stones. Hannah had never imagined when the girls had said that their father would be in the West Wing that he would be actually using his own hands to rebuild it. Seeing the lady, he quickly turned and grabbed his shirt for propriety's sake. He wasn't the only man to be doing the back-breaking labour without a top covering, but he was the only one that Hannah couldn't seem to catch her breath over. We didn't mean to disturb you, Lord Grimshaw, Hannah said when she finally regained her composure from the image of his perfectly sculpted frame. The ladies asked to come visit, but I can see now that you are very busy. It's all right, he said with a soft smile. He looked down at his girls. Go and see the floor. I believe a robin has built a nest in one of the larger saplings, he said with joy in his eyes. Both girls squealed in delight before running around their father and further down the walkway to a ladder. One by one they climbed down the ladder in their fine dresses. Oh, please be careful, Hannah said with worry, taking another few steps forward. Grimshaw grabbed a rag to rub some of the grime off of his hands and the sweat from his brow. They're fine, he said with a wave. Before you came, they spent every afternoon running around this part of the estate. Your progress looks amazing, Hannah said, seeing an opening to steer the conversation away from the sheen on Lord Grimshaw's forearms. He looked around and admired the large space himself. It took quite a bit just to remove all the debris. Now that we have that done, we will build up the exteriors and then the roof. After that, I can begin the interior. It sounds like quite an undertaking. He is doing it for Mommy, Rebecca called up proudly from the bottom floor. Lord Grimshaw smiled nervously. Yes, I always promised my wife, I mean my late wife, that I would do it. I just never got around to it. His tone was so full of sorrow. What happened to it? Hannah asked, hoping to keep him from mournful thoughts. A fire, he said. You can see there, he pointed to the edge of the crumbled stone, where some of it is still blackened. Was that how... Hannah trailed off, wondering if she should finish that sentence. No, Grimshaw replied, understanding her meaning. It actually burned down before I was born. My father just never got around to rebuilding. I always said I would, but then she got ill and... It was a sickness then, Hannah asked, knowing she shouldn't pry but unable to stop herself. Yes, he answered with his gaze in a far-off place. He woke back to the present. She was always weak after. 
Grimshaw's eyes trailed down to Rebecca. Then the putrid throat came through these parts. I'm so sorry for your loss, Hannah said with all her being. It was easy to see how much the Earl missed his wife and still ached over her absence. Well, he said, turning his gaze to the room again to fight the emotion brewing. I promised her a West Wing and I mean to deliver, no matter how long it might take me. I am sure that she is most grateful to you for it too. Hannah's mind was distracted the following day as she replayed the image of Lord Grimshaw standing before her bare-chested. If she was honest with herself, it had stirred something deep inside that she wasn't sure she had ever felt before. Though the girls had asked to return again, she had to decline the trip, not only because she wasn't sure if she could handle seeing the Earl in such a state again without swooning, but also because she had another outing planned for the day. She had promised Lord Grimshaw that she would not engage in conversation with Matthew McCarthy, but had made sure that there was still a loophole in this verbal agreement. No requests had been made by Lord Grimshaw that she not correspond or even meet with Mrs McCarthy, and Hannah had made it a point not to bring up the idea with the Earl. Instead, she sent a letter with the first servant going into town on Monday after her first church service. Since then, she had had regular correspondence with Mrs McCarthy. She was indeed a lonely woman. Though she spoke fondly of her son, it would seem that he didn't come to see her very often. Most of the time she was left to her own care in the house her husband built fifty years ago. She did apparently have a very healthy brood of cats to keep her company, and much of her letters were filled with tales of their shenanigans. Hannah had finally decided that she would accept Mrs McCarthy's offer to come to tea. The widow was also kind enough to invite both the young ladies along as well. Hannah saw this as a perfect opportunity to not only visit with the lady in person, but also give the girls a chance to practice their tea etiquette. She wasn't sure if the Earl would agree with her logic, which was precisely why she said nothing to him on the matter. In fact, she said nothing to the girls until after their noonday meal on the day in question. Rebecca was always happy to talk and had a very hard time keeping any information to herself no matter how trivial. Hannah didn't want to risk Lady Rebecca slipping the information to her father and the whole thing being forbidden. We will be taking the cart to town this afternoon, Hannah informed her students. Both girls perked with excitement. You have both been formally invited to tea at the house of Mrs Joanna McCarthy. Oh, will we get to wear our Sunday gloves and hat and have tea like proper ladies? Rebecca asked in excitement. Of course, Hannah encouraged. But why are we taking a cart and not the carriage? Father has never taken us to town in the cart. Well. I thought since it is a nice day, it would be a fine time to let the breeze blow against your lovely cheeks, Hannah said, brushing against Rebecca's and making her giggle. The real reason was that Hannah was able to drive a small cart on her own. If she was to need the use of the carriage, she would surely have to ask it of Lord Grimshaw. The girls thought nothing of her reasoning and happily sat in the cart while Hannah drove them into town. There was only one stop that Hannah was truly nervous to make. She would have to stop at the local shop first to inquire the directions to Mrs McCarthy's cottage. She had given her word that she would not speak with Mr McCarthy again, and she would not break it, as long as it was proper. Luckily, when they arrived, Hannah found the business to be a large one, with several young men working behind the counter. Hannah took the girls in, and with her earnings thus far bought them each a peppermint stick to save for later, and asked the young man at the counter the way. Again they were in the cart and on their way, and Hannah was happy as could be that she had kept her promise intact. In fact, she could safely say she hadn't even set eyes on Mr McCarthy. Not that she wanted to either. Though Mrs McCarthy spoke of her son with love and admiration in her letters, Hannah didn't feel the same. What kind of a son would leave his mother all alone and not visit for extended periods of time? Finally, they got to the house and Mrs McCarthy was out in her small garden waiting to greet them. Both girls hopped out of the cart excitedly and came to stand before the lady, their brown curls bouncing with every step. Mrs McCarthy, 
It was so kind of you to invite us, Hannah said when she reached the rest of the party. Please let me introduce Lady Caroline Grimshaw and Lady Rebecca. Why, I believe you are two of the loveliest little ladies I have ever set me eyes on, Mrs. McCarthy said, blinking down at them with her little black pearl eyes. Thank you, ma'am, both girls said with a curtsy in unison. Oh, if your governess will allow it, you must call me Granny. I fear my Matty will not have children till I am long gone from this world. I do so ache to hear a child call me so. Both girls looked to their governess, who saw no harm in it, and nodded in the affirmative. Come in, come in, Granny said with a broad smile and wave of her aged arm. I can just hear the kettle a-going now. Chapter 11 Despite her age, Hannah quickly learned that Mrs. McCarthy's faculties had not dimmed in the slightest. In fact, it seemed quite the contrary. The kettle did in fact sound just after their entrance into the small clean cottage. It was not more than a sitting room with a hearth and a kitchen behind. A narrow set of stairs led to a loft above that Hannah guessed served as her bedroom. Covering every visible wall was the most beautiful paintings and drawings. In the corner of the sitting room sat an easel and the tools of the trade. Are you a painter, Mrs. McCarthy? Hannah asked after they were seated around a small round table with a tea tray. I do dabble a bit, she said humbly as she poured the hot water into the ceramic teapot. From the look of this room, I would say you do far more than dabble. These look exquisite. Thank you kindly, she said before slowly lowering herself in the last remaining chair. May I pour it for you, Granny? Caroline asked, hoping for the chance to show her skill. Oh, that would just be fine. Mrs. McCarthy said with a wide smile that hid her little eyes all the more behind her round cheeks. Caroline set to the task. The room was silent for a moment as all eyes watched. Hannah in anticipation of her pupil's hard-won education, Rebecca in astute study should her own opportunity arise, and Mrs. McCarthy in pure enjoyment of the company. You did the job well, Mrs. McCarthy said, as Caroline finished pouring the last cup and gave a sigh of satisfaction that she spilled not a drop. They spent the afternoon happily chatting away over their tea. Mrs. McCarthy was kind enough to always find an opportunity to include the girls in the conversation. Hannah couldn't help but beam with pride at the girls' civil answers and proper behaviour. As the afternoon waned on, however, a sadness started to cover Hannah. It was a most enjoyable afternoon, but it was but one. She was sure by the amount of artwork on the walls that Mrs. McCarthy spent almost all her time in solitude. One afternoon just wasn't enough. I wonder, Mrs. McCarthy, your hand is so skilled with the brush. Have you ever shared your knowledge with others? In a teaching capacity, I mean. I can't say there are many around here looking for classes in watercolours and the like, she responded with a smile. Well... I have been charged with seeing the Grimshaw girls brought up as well-rounded young ladies. To be sure that includes their hand at artwork. I am not nearly as skilled as you are. I wonder if you would be willing to provide lessons for them. Both girls sat taller in their chairs, and their eyes lit up at the prospect. I would be happy to compensate you for your time, Hannah added for good measure. Oh, I wouldn't dream of such a thing, she waved off. I'm not sure how much I can teach, but I won't deny the chance to see you fine ladies come again. The time was set for weekly visits in the afternoon, and though Mrs. McCarthy was against it, she reluctantly took some of Hannah's coins from her purse. It is at least enough to cover the cost of supplies. I wouldn't dream of you taking that burden upon yourself. It was getting close to late afternoon, sadly, and with reluctancy, the trio bid their new friend goodbye before entering their cart. You know what might be fun, Hannah said to the girls after they reached the edge of the village. Let us keep our visits to Granny a secret from your father. A secret? Why? Inquisitive Rebecca asked. Well, Hannah thought out slowly. That way, as you practice and improve, he won't be the wiser. But then once you truly have mastered the skill and have a masterpiece to show, think how surprised he will be to see it. 
We could make it like a present for father, Rebecca agreed. Exactly. What do you think? Would that be a lovely idea for your father? She was waiting for Caroline to agree. Rebecca may have been the chatterbox, but Caroline was certainly the one in charge. Often Rebecca deferred to her older sister's judgment. If Hannah had a hope of winning over the girls, it would be through Lady Caroline. I think father would like that. Perhaps he will finish the West Wing and put our paintings in it, she added. Oh, that would be marvellous, Hannah agreed with a sigh of relief. She did have a pang of nagging guilt deep down that she had roped the girls into some sort of trickery against their father. She tried to tell herself that it was only to save the Earl from his own wrath. He was sure to disapprove of her trips to see Mrs McCarthy on account of her eligible son. He would never understand that Matthew McCarthy would no sooner encounter them at his mother's house than catching a star in his hand. It may have been deceitful and dishonest, but it was for a good purpose. They would provide company to a lady who desperately was in need of it. It would also hopefully line her pockets that much more. Hannah didn't even hesitate when she gave of her own coin to do so. Yes, that would mean less to send back to her family in London. It was still worth it if it meant seeing Mrs McCarthy's house slightly less empty of necessities. The following month was one of the most enjoyable that Hannah had had for a very long time. Even with the money that she gave to Mrs. McCarthy, she still had a good amount to send back to her parents and siblings still at home. She knew that her mother appreciated any little bit of help that Hannah could give. She also felt an obligation to do so. Though the opportunity afforded by Hannah's aunt and uncle was not what she would have chosen for herself, had she the choice. But it was a far greater opportunity than any of her other siblings would get. Perhaps if one of her brothers was lucky, they might find a way into an apprenticeship. More than likely, all four of her brothers would end up working at the docks, loading and unloading ship cargo like her father. Her six sisters, including the babe her mother had just given birth to, would have it vastly harder than even the boys. They had furnished no education past what their mother could read out of a Bible. They would have very little prospects in life but to marry a poor seaport man and live the hard life of Hannah's parents all over again. Hannah Jacobson had been spared that life only because she happened to be the firstborn. Though some might have seen the prospect of sending wages home a burden, she was more than glad to do so. She had little use for them anyway at Brighton Abbey. Of course, there were the small items that she would purchase from the village shop, all via Mary, but other than that, she wanted for nothing. She was furnished with a warm bed, more than adequate food to eat and the simple pleasure of a warm fire should she ever desire it. All things that had not been a norm for her up until this point. The girls were really beginning to blossom as they became more accustomed to Hannah's presence. Even Lady Caroline seemed to accept her more. A large part of this new acceptance was due to their weekly trips to town. Lady Caroline had bonded with Granny, as she was now affectionately called by all of them, in a way that neither Hannah nor Lady Rebecca had. They both had an unspoken thread that tied the one to the other. Granny, of course, loved the company of all the girls, but in Lady Caroline she saw a reflection of her younger self. Often after their lesson, Granny would invite them to stay longer for a visit. Rebecca would take the time to pet one of Granny's cats or play tea with a doll she brought along. Caroline, on the other hand, was very serious about her artwork. Even after the lesson would be complete, she wouldn't be satisfied to stay her hand. For another hour or so, Granny would sit by Lady Caroline as she worked and give words of approval or suggestions of improvement. At the moment, both girls had first worked on their sketching abilities and now had moved on to watercolours. Hannah had never really considered a poor art teacher, but she was immensely grateful that the girls had such a superior teacher that could only come with years of experience. It was on such an afternoon that an unexpected guest arrived. What is all this? A male voice boomed as he entered the small cottage without so much as a knock. All four ladies turned in surprise, but it was only Granny that spoke. Oh, Matty. Have you come to see me then? You remember Miss Jacobson, don't you? I told you how she has been taking these fine ladies to tutor under me, 
she said, hobbling up from her seat next to Lady Caroline and coming to usher him into the room. Matthew McCarthy hesitated a moment. He knew of the art lesson arrangement but had not really paid much attention to what his mother said. He had never dreamed that he would walk into the middle of one. Well, I don't want to disturb, he said, wavering at the door though his eyes fell on Hannah, and he wavered more. Though she still wore her cotton cap, she had stopped wearing the spectacles that covered most of her face. When Mr. McCarthy's eyes met hers, she couldn't help but look away shyly. The effect of her rosy cheeks with sweet dimples and her dark blue eyes, enhanced by the light coming through the window seat she sat in, was most intoxicating. I won't hear of it, Matty, Granny said. You come and have a seat. Lady Rebecca here can pour you a nice cup of tea. Of course, that is if her dolly will take the company. Miss Jacobson would be much obliged for it, Granny continued, looking at Hannah. Yes, Hannah stammered out on cue. Do come and join us. The lesson is over so you won't be disturbing a thing. She had spoken her words only half-heartedly. She couldn't say otherwise, it would be far too rude. However, taking tea with a man that she had promised the Earl she would not see was pressing on her conscience. Mr. McCarthy was all smiles when he heard Hannah's encouragement and came fully into the room and set down the burlap bag in his hands. Are those potatoes for me? Granny asked. Yes, he said, though his attention was wholly elsewhere. I'll just take them in the kitchen then. Granny said, starting to lift the large sack of vegetables. To Hannah's surprise, Mr. McCarthy didn't offer to help. Nonsense, Granny, she said, quickly coming to her feet. That is far too heavy for you. Let me take it, Hannah added, picking up the sack without so much as a glance at Mr. McCarthy. She didn't care if it was her or him that left the room, but one of them needed to. Every second she sat in his presence, she feared the Earl finding out and what reprimand would come of it. Chapter 12 Hannah had feared one of the girls letting slip that they were at Granny's house that day, or worse, that there had also been an added guest. After the first supper with no incident, she became more relieved. The girls had kept true to silencing their tongue on the matter until they finished their watercolour portrait. It meant time was running out for Hannah to assure the Earl that she was quite capable of going to town and being trustworthy to boot. She also feared that with such proximity to Mr McCarthy's appearance that when the time did come, Lady Rebecca would mention such a fact. The Earl would never trust her if that was to happen. She felt, other than the weight of her secret kept from him, that things with the Earl were on good terms. She kept to herself in her free time, and he was often preoccupied with his work in the West Wing. The only time they saw each other was at dinner and Sunday services. Luckily, it was easy to keep both girls talking through the meal, so that not much passed between her and the Earl. She didn't fear him like she did that first morning in the solicitor's office, nor did she quite feel comfortable enough to speak to him if it could be helped. Overall, she felt that she had found a good working relationship with Lord Grimshaw, she was relieved at this fact and hoped it meant that this could be steady employment for her, unlike the last. Of course, the wild card in that hope was Mr. Poole. Though he had made his presence known from time to time, for the most part she saw little of him. Often it would only be in passing or serving at meals and that didn't allow him many opportunities to harass her. She was sure if she kept away from him, he would soon bore of her. After all, men seemed to enjoy the chase far more than her. If there was no chase for him, she was sure he would give up the hunt altogether. It was on a warm summer afternoon that Hannah found herself out in the garden, endeavouring to teach the girls the game of battledore and shuttlecock. Each girl would take a turn playing with Hannah as they held their small battledore rackets and did their best to hit the cork and feather shuttlecock back and forth without letting it fall. After several rotations between the heat of the sun and the running to hit a misaimed shuttlecock, Hannah was rosy in the cheeks. She was sure that no one else was around when she relieved herself of her bonnet and cap. She could feel her locks falling from their tight pinned bun, but she didn't care much because of the fun she was having. Oh, my dears, 
Hannah said after a good round with Lady Caroline in which each lady was able to hit the shuttlecock four times. I believe I need a rest. Why don't you two practice together? The girls were happy to oblige and quickly went to hit the shuttlecock, back and forth, while Hannah went to rest under the shade of a large tree. Removing her fichu, she dabbed at the perspiration that had collected around her hairline. She attempted to repin offending golden locks, but it was of no use, so she just let all the pins out altogether. A soft, gentle breeze was blowing from time to time, and it felt good to let it flow through her hair and cool the dampness on her neck. Sitting in the grass under the tree, she closed her eyes and listened to the joyous sound of the girls playing. It was not one she had heard in her own childhood, and she rather relished it. She reached for a book that she had left with a basket of afternoon snacks and a blanket. Leaning against the trunk of the tree, Hannah settled into reading some, while the girls continued to enjoy the warmth of the sun and the game. Lord Grimshaw had been hard at work at the West Wing, working on the last of the exterior walls before moving to the roof. It was backbreaking work, and slow at that as each stone had to be fitted and placed. He hated to admit it was what he loved about it so much. Sorely he had wished that he had completed the promised task before his wife's death, but one always thinks there is enough time until it is all gone. He was only momentarily distracted by the sound of the girls in the garden. From his perch on the scaffolding, he could see their figures exiting the house into the back garden where Miss Jacobson proceeded to teach them a game. He smiled to himself as he listened to the sound of the three of them laughing between the whooshes of the rackets. Sebastian Grimshaw finished his afternoon pleasantly entertained by the sounds of their fun, as well as moments of secret study of their fun. Their happiness was infectious, and he caught it all the way up on his high perch of the house. Miss Jacobson, Caroline won't let me have a turn starting, Grimshaw heard his youngest daughter whine. They had been outside for several hours now, and he suspected she was getting tired and cranky. Come, let us all take a break for a while, he heard Miss Jacobson's reply. I have some current rolls from the kitchen, and I will read to you some. Grimshaw turned from his wall, and the sight before him caught his breath. There, coming from under the shade of the tree, was a Greek goddess. She walked slowly to the edge of the foliage, and laid out a blanket where the girls happily sat and selected items from a basket she had wisely brought. Miss Jacobson took her own spot, letting her gown settle around her. Her golden hair was like flowing honey as it ran down her back, and with delicacy she opened her book and began to read. Her voice was too soft to make out all the words, but the picture before him was one he wasn't sure he was ready to see. There on the blanket sat Caroline as she picked and tied some wildflowers, while Rebecca lay on her back looking to passing clouds. Miss Jacobson read in her animated way, sometimes even moving her free arm as she spoke the lines. It was a perfect picture of a family. It filled him with such joy and pained his heart all at the same time. There you are, Abigail's voice called, catching all three girls' attention. It is almost supper time. You must come in and change, she added. Oh, you're right, Hannah said, seeing the time on her watch. Forgive me for keeping them so long. We got distracted making little forget-me-not crowns. Both girls held up their handiwork to their nurse before placing them on their own heads. I think mine is the best, Caroline said. That's not true. Mine is just as good, isn't it, Abigail? Abigail looked to Hannah for help in this argument. Hannah simply shrugged that she would have no say in the matter. Abigail assured Rebecca that they both had lovely crowns before shooing them into the house with a wave goodbye to their governess. Hannah went to work shaking the crumbs off of the blanket, as well as any leftover discarded flowers, and folding it up to take inside. She would have to freshen up too and make ready for dinner. She was humming softly to herself, thinking on how perfect a day it had been as she came around a bend in the house. A gruff hand grabbed her by the arm and whipped her sharply around the corner and up against the cold stone wall. The shock alone took her breath away and made her drop her belongings. You wicked vixen, Mr Poole's voice said in a low growl. 
Mr. Poole, Hannah's words came out more in a breath. What is the meaning of this? Remove your hands from me at once. He was gripping both of her arms now and pinning her against the wall with no chance of escape. You are quite the temptress, he growled again, ignoring her struggles. I have no idea what you are talking about, Mr. Poole, Hannah shot back with as much anger as she could muster through the fear. He let go of one arm and with his hand grabbed a lock of golden hair, twisting it between his fingers. He held it up to his nose and breathed in deeply. I guessed you were a blonde, he said, leaning in close to her. But such fine silken hair like this. He brushed her lock of hair all along his chin and lips. I see now why you hid it. It could drive a man wild. Hannah closed her eyes and turned her head as his hot breath came down on her throat. She could feel the heat of his body nearly touching her and smelled a distinct sour smell to his breath. I swear to you I will scream, she said, when he laid a brazen kiss on her neck. He didn't answer, simply produced a small knife. She opened her mouth in shock, but he must have thought she was going to scream because he clamped a hand down on it. Through her wide blue eyes, she watched the glint of the sun reflect off the metal as he held it up to her face. I wouldn't scream if I were you, he said finally, letting her mouth go. She obediently didn't speak. Hannah didn't even move. How could she with fear paralysing her to the spot? He lifted up her lock again, and this time cut the very last two inches of it off. He held his treasure up to his nose and smelled it again. To remember you by when it's all over, he said with a wicked grin. Tears were flowing down Hannah's cheeks now. Please, she pleaded, please just leave me alone. He put a hand to her throat and squeezed. If you wanted to be left alone, you should not have been so bewitching. I have done nothing, she whispered against his tightening hand. I have encouraged you in no way. Please let me go. He seemed to think this over for a minute, hand still tight on her throat. Then he smiled wickedly, and she knew that he was going to do whatever he wanted. She struggled to scream against his grip when the sound of an approaching whistle froze him in his tracks. He stepped back just as a gardener came around the corner. He started for a minute to see the two in such a dark and hidden alcove. Everything all right, miss? he asked, seeing the tears on Hannah's cheeks. We are fine. Do you need something, Fredericks? Mr. Poole said impatiently. Shouldn't you be inside getting ready for dinner, David? The older gentleman retorted back. David looked from the gardener back to Hannah. With a dissatisfied scoff, he left without another word. The gardener walked over and helped Hannah pick up her belonging. It took all her strength not to crumple in a ball on the ground. Are you all right, truly? the man asked. All Hannah could do was nod her head yes. She was certain if words came out, she would altogether break down. He can be a rake when he drinks too much, but overall he is a good worker. Just try and stay away from him, the man said. She simply nodded in disbelief again before collecting herself and hurrying into the house and straight to her room. Grimshaw stood on the scaffolding, clenching and unclenching his fists. Had he not seen it with his own eyes, he might not have believed it. But as soon as Abigail picked up his girls and took them inside, he watched Miss Jacobson slip into a small alcove. He wondered why she had done such a silly thing until he saw his footman exit the same spot. He couldn't believe that to his face she had put on such a show of abiding by his requests yet in his own house. She was flaunting his authority. Grimshaw hated himself for the things he had thought of her as he watched her and the girls on the blanket for the last half hour. She had looked so loving and kind to them, and he had actually thought perhaps. But no. She was a deceiver just like the other one. It was clear that like Miss Watts, no matter what Miss Jacobson said, she had one goal while she was here, and that had nothing to do with teaching his children. Chapter 13 Hannah did her best to regain her composure as she changed in the silence of her own room. It was not an easy task. Though her hands were still shaking, she changed her gown to one suitable for the evening meal and repinned her hair. 
Hannah did her best to ignore the lock that was now two inches shorter than the rest. In her mind, if she pretended the whole event didn't happen, then perhaps she wouldn't crumble to pieces. With a tight tug, she replaced her linen cap, sure that she would never take it off again, no matter the weather. She had forgotten herself this afternoon. In the sunshine and enjoyment of the girl's company, she had entirely lost herself in the joy. It won't happen again, Jacobson, she said with determination to the reflection in the mirror. It was hard to hide the red rims of her eyes, or the bruise already starting on her neck from where Mr. Poole had held her so tight. Even as she spoke to herself in the mirror, she could hear the hoarseness of her voice from his mistreatment. Perhaps a warm cup of tea would soothe her vocal cords, but until one could be procured, she would have to keep her speech even more to a minimum. Luckily, as she went to procure the girls from their nurse, both were still in high spirits and chatty over their game this afternoon. Hannah struggled to share in their happiness, as she had not that long ago. It felt like years since she had sat under the tree reading, or batted the shuttlecock back and forth with the girls. Finding her way out of the fog of fear and destitution seemed impossible. At dinner, Hannah was happy to see that the Earl was just as quiet of speech. Instead, the dining room was filled with little girls' voices, each telling the day in turn. Hannah didn't have much appetite. As the night wore on, the pain at her neck seemed to grow. With every swallow of her food or beverage, her throat burned with the pain. Miss Jacobson! Lady Caroline's voice woke her from her struggles to eat. I'm sorry, dear, what was that? Hannah struggled to say smoothly. I thought you might want to tell father about the forget-me-not competition. Hannah looked up at the Earl. It was the first time she had really looked at him tonight. He seemed much more gruff than usual. He tore at his meat with his knife and scowled severely despite his daughter's happy chatter. Oh, why don't you do it, dear, Hannah said, fighting against the burn in her throat. I don't think I could quite do it justice. Yes, Grimshaw said, speaking for the first time. I expect Miss Jacobson is most exhausted from her excursions today. I dare say she looks like she is plumb worn out. Though his words were kind enough, Hannah was sure there was more to the meaning than he was letting on. He glared at her in a most fierce way that she couldn't understand. Had she not already been tormented enough at the hands of a man? Now she was to stew over what could have possibly made the Earl so cross. To break the glare he was giving her, Hannah took another drink from her cup. Immediately she sensed Poole at her side filling it up. She tensed against his unnecessary action. Grimshaw seemed to tense too. I believe we have all had quite enough, David, Grimshaw said curtly. I would ask you to leave now. Mr. Poole looked at his employer with utter shock. He had never been removed from the dining room before. For the briefest of moments, Hannah looked up at him and he downed to her. Where her eyes held fear, his were determined. It was a small relief for Hannah, however, to have the man removed even if it was just for the end of one meal. It was hard enough to keep her composure knowing that her attacker was always standing over her, watching her. Sebastian Grimshaw tightened his grip on his cutlery as he watched the look exchanged between the two interlopers. They didn't even have the courtesy to hide their affair. I expect since tomorrow is Saturday, you will be needing to go to the village, Grimshaw said abruptly to Miss Jacobson. I will have the carriage ready for our journey promptly at eight o'clock. I have many other things to engage my time tomorrow and cannot waste it all in Concordshire. Hannah's head was spinning by his words. I'm sorry, Lord Grimshaw. I don't understand what you're saying. I wasn't aware that I was taking the girls to town tomorrow. You are not, he said curtly. Do you not recall that I have asked you to only go to Concordshire in my company? Seeing how you have been here for several months now, and have not done so, I can only assume that means you have not gone at all, he said, accusing her of disobeying his orders. That is correct, Hannah retorted, jutting out her chin. Then I expect there are a great many things you are in need of, or perhaps letters to be mailed. No, Hannah said simply. Then forgive me, Miss Jacobson, but how can that be possible? He was daring her to admit that she was not holding to her employer's standards. 
Mary has been gracious enough to mail my letters for me and procure anything I might need. He studied her for a minute, measuring the truth of her words. And there is nothing that you wish to go into town in person for? Grimshaw asked as a final test. Miss Jacobson had been consorting with his footman unknown to him. Perhaps she was also interloping with Matthew McCarthy. The betrayal coursed through his blood as he stared her down. Not that I can think of at this moment, Hannah retorted, seeing his double meaning and choosing not to rise to the occasion of arguing over it in front of the children. Well, I hope your arrangement with Mary will last some time as I will not be able to take you to Concordshire for some time. Both girls looked at him inquisitively, wondering where he was going with this train of thought. I'm sorry to tell you both, he said, now pointing his attention to his daughters, that I got word that I must go to London right away. I will be leaving tomorrow and may not return for some time. Grimshaw told himself that he really did have pressing business in London that had called him away as he jolted about in the carriage. That didn't seem to calm the guilt over leaving his two teary-eyed daughters early that morning. In reality, he knew why he had run to London and ordered his townhouse made ready. He was hurt. Hurt that he had opened a piece of his heart and let someone in only to be disappointed by her. He couldn't bear to look on Miss Jacobson any more than David Poole. Both disgusted him with their secret affair. He wanted to tell himself it was because she so clearly undermined him and disrespected his authority. In reality, it was because he had cared for her. He had let her into his life and into his girl's heart, and all she was doing was setting them all up for great disappointment again. Grimshaw was pleased to see that when he arrived in London that evening, every needful thing was prepared and ready for him. Rarely did he use the London house and had half expected to spend his first night in a rented room until preparations to open the house were finished. Much to his surprise, it was all done in a timely manner and for the most part, the house was opened. Though his main purpose for leaving Brighton Abbey was to remove Miss Jacobson from his sight and hopefully his mind, he did in fact actually have work to do. Often he put such tasks off or hired another to go in his stead, not wanting to leave the girls for a prolonged time. But he knew they would be fine in the care of their governess and nurse. Though she may have duped him, he took solace in the fact that at least she was a good companion for his daughters. He would just have to resign himself to the fact that she was no different than Miss Watts. Perhaps all governesses were the same. Could he truly blame her for that? He thought it was probably irrational to feel ire towards her for only trying to find a permanent place in life, for certainly one could not spend one's whole life as a governess. He supposed it was the goal of every lady in the profession to use their employer's connections to find themselves a more stable situation. Realising this fact didn't help the bitter sting he still felt in his heart. He hated himself for running away like a coward. He should have faced her, accused her, and then removed her from her position. As much as Grimshaw knew that was what his mind told him to do, he couldn't bring the action to fruition. Grimshaw wouldn't take another caregiver from his daughters, and worst of all, he didn't have the courage to send her away. As he lay in his townhouse bed that night, unable to sleep, he did his best to only think of Miss Jacobson with ire and malice. Instead, the only image that seemed to form in his mind was the night in her room. She had been so frightened and had leaned on him in her time of need. At that moment he would have given her the world if she had asked it. He remembered the feel of her golden braid on his fingers and the smell of lavender as he rested his chin on the top of her head. She had seemed to fit so perfectly in his arms that night as he held her close and let her cry. His mind went to his late wife. She must be in heaven right now looking down on him, so ashamed of his actions. Yes, in life she had told him to remarry to find happiness again. She couldn't have meant it, though. Even if she did, how could he? There had been a small flicker of hope with Miss Jacobson, he admitted to himself. Look where that got him now. He was running away from his own house. It was a ridiculous notion that he could ever find with another what he had with his dear wife. She could never be replaced in his heart.
The sooner he resigned himself to that fact, the better it would be for all his household. Chapter 14 The following day, Sebastian wasn't surprised to already have received several calling cards. Though he was out most of the day attending to House of Lords business, he returned home that night to several invitations and cards left by visitors. He rarely ever came to town since his wife's passing and had forgotten how fast news travelled at the height of the season. Most of the cards were from old acquaintances and connections. Several he could see were acquaintances of his father, who he guessed had daughters of eligible age. These cards he threw away promptly. No doubt most would see his coming to town a sign that he was ready to take on a new wife. Nothing could be farther from the truth in his mind at that moment. One card, however, did stick out to him. Though most of the invitational engagements he received he would begrudgingly attend, this was the only name that brought him joy. It was Mr. Jaden Marsh, son of Baron Westminster and younger brother to his late wife. Though Jaden was twenty and six, making him six years his junior, the two had hit it off well. Sebastian's marriage to Anne Marsh, eldest daughter of the Baron, had been one of connections between families at first. The Baron and his own father had been great friends in their school years. Though it had started that way, Sebastian had come to greatly love and care for kind, delicate Anne. Though the family connections had meant the two of them had seen each other on occasion growing up, he still hadn't really gotten to know her until after their marriage. The same was true for her younger brother. Sebastian had paid the young lad little attention in his own youth. He was much too preoccupied with the ideals of a young pup in his first seasons with the Ton. Even after his marriage to Anne, which he always knew was the plan, he had seen little of his brother-in-law who was away at school. However, once Jaden was finished with his schooling, he came to visit his sister and brother-in-law often. More than that, he was a very doting uncle to first Caroline and then Rebecca as they came in turn. The age difference didn't matter much to Sebastian, as he found a great friend in Jaden. So it was with this notion that Grimshaw sent a letter to his brother-in-law in the evening post to invite him to join him for breakfast at the local gentleman's club. Though Sebastian still missed his daughters dearly, he was sure that a little time away from Brighton Abbey and back in society would do him good. The following morning he was pleased to see that Jaden had received his note and was waiting for him at the club for breakfast. It's been a long time, Jaden said, standing at Sebastian's entrance and taking his hand heartily. Sebastian hadn't thought it was such a long time since he saw Jaden Marsh last, but now that he set eyes on the man, he was sure it was. Jaden had already matured and changed so much since last he saw him. Already much of his boyish lines had formed into that of a man. Even still, Sebastian could see so much of Anne in her younger brother. They both shared the same black as night hair, ghostly white complexion, and hazel eyes that seemed ever-changing with the season. However, unlike his sister and the last time Grimshaw saw him, Jaden now had the masculine square chin dusted already with the shadow of stubble. He also had seemed to grow into his full height. Whereas before Sebastian had a good head of height on him, they were now eye to eye. It took Sebastian a few moments to reconcile the boy he knew from the past with the man who now stood before him. They sat down to their breakfast and spent a good portion of it, simply catching each other up on their lives, since last they met. Jaden was eager to hear of his niece's well-being, and Grimshaw was happy to oblige him with all their tales. It was easy for the Earl to be a boasting father as he loved his daughters so much. What an unfortunate thing about that first governess, Jaden said after he was caught up on all of Grimshaw's happenings over the past year. But it sounds like you found a better fit in this new one. Yes, that's what I thought too, Sebastian retorted. Unfortunately, she seems to be going the same way. I suppose they are all like that. What do you mean? I thought you said you picked a plain, homely one yourself, Jaden retorted, as he stuck another sausage with his fork and plopped it in his mouth. Sebastian caught his brother-in-law up on all the events that led him to London. How dreadful for the girls, Jaden said when he was done. Will you be letting her go then? 
I couldn't, he said instantly. For the girl's sake, of course, he revised quickly. I suppose I am just settled to the fact that a governess will always be a revolving door. I will let her stay on as long as possible, to give the girls as much stability as I can. It's a most frustrating enterprise. I should say so, Jaden agreed. I do think there is a better way to keep a womanly figure in my niece's lives, he added. Pray tell if you have a better way. Engage yourself in finding a new wife. Sebastian sat back in his chair and scoffed at his brother-in-law's words. How could you of all people say such a thing? Perhaps it is better that it comes from me than someone else. Don't get me wrong. I loved my sister dearly. I miss her every day, as I know you do too, he added quickly. But we both know that those little girls of hers need a woman to look up to. If a governess isn't fit for the job, we both know a wife is. I am not ready for that, nor am I sure I ever will be, Sebastian said with tightened lips. He didn't like admitting weakness even to Jaden. You are an honourable man to my sister to love her so. But she wouldn't want to see you suffer like this. Or to see the girls suffer like this for that matter. So what do you suggest I just remove her from my memory, as the girls do the same, and go and hunt for a replacement? Nothing of the sort, Jaden said softly, knowing this to be a delicate subject. I don't think it would hurt for you to spend some time in society at least while you are here in London. You have business to attend to, yes, but it wouldn't hurt to also see what else the ton has to offer. I will not parade myself about to be skewered by a matron looking to fix her daughter. I never had a taste for it in my youth and certainly do not have a taste for it now. You certainly don't have to, Jaden said with a smile on his lips. Then what do you propose I do? Sebastian said with a huff. Just go to some engagements. Start out small if you must. A good friend of the family, Lord Waldron, is having an intimate dinner party. I am sure I could secure you an invitation. It would be a good start. I know of the Earl of Waldron and believe he has already sent me the invitation. I hadn't planned to attend because I expected the request had something to do with his daughter. I expect it did also, Jaden agreed, happy to see that his friend had already secured an invitation of his own. I think she would be a good match for you. I am glad to see Lord Waldron on the same page. Well, I am not sure I am, Sebastian said with another huff. It's been two years, my friend. You have mourned long enough. If not for yourself, then consider the prospect for the girls. Spotting a chink in Sebastian's armour, Jaden continued. You know as well as I, the girls need more than just a womanly figure to raise them in a proper education. They will need a sponsor of their own when they reach the appropriate age to see that good matches are made. Even if you were to secure a good governess to stay with them their whole childhood, she could never do that for them. They need a motherly figure. Sebastian was hesitating in his resolve. Jaden was right on that point. A nurse or governess might be able to shape and mould them as children, but eventually they would need a woman to guide them into society. That job could not be given to one outside of the ton. Had he a sister or some woman relative he could pass the job off to that would be easy enough. That was not the case, however, and without a wife to see his daughters off, they would have a lesser advantage to their peers. He couldn't bear the fact that he would bring more hardship on them than they already had. No, he would have to secure himself a wife at some point for their sake. He didn't like the idea and would have rather put it off as long as he could. But his brother-in-law had made good points. The sooner he found a wife to mother his children, the better off they would be. He would begin the process this very season, though he wouldn't enjoy it. It would matter little to him who the woman was, or how pleasing she looked. His sole purpose would be to find a woman who would love his daughters as her own. Perhaps this Miss Tara Marlowe, daughter of the Earl of Waldron, would do the trick. After all, if his brother-in-law had thought of her first, that did give her some merit. It would also make the task that much easier. He had no taste for this wife finding, but it had to be done. Therefore he would get it over with as quickly as possible. 
I suppose it wouldn't hurt to accept a few invitations while I am here, Sebastian said reluctantly. As long as it doesn't slow down what work I need to see to. I have no desire to stay in town and away from the girls any longer than necessary. There you go, old chap, Jaden said with spunk. I'm sure you will find Miss Tara most appealing to you. If not, I already have a mental list of other prospects. Shouldn't you be more concerned about finding your own prospects? Sebastian retorted, not wanting to be anyone's pet project. Oh, I have plenty for myself, he waved off. Jaden was certainly handsome and charming enough to secure a wife. I think I will still enjoy myself a while longer. Father is still young and in good health, so really I have no need for it. Oh, to be young and free, Sebastian said with a teasing tone. Both men relaxed a bit at the turn of the conversation. They spent the rest of the morning speaking on trivial matters, though Jaden still found moments to add Miss Tara into the topic of conversation. It was a most enjoyable and distracting morning for Sebastian. As he returned home to prepare for his afternoon outings, he was happy to review the morning and realise that he had only thought of Miss Jacobson minimally. Perhaps this trip to London was just the ticket he needed to remove her from his mind. That way, when he returned to Brighton Abbey, he would see her in no more of a light than that of all the other household. Chapter 15 Hannah had to admit she was startled by Grimshaw's abrupt departure. The girls, too, struggled to continue with their regular schedule with their father gone. What ate at Hannah the most, however, was how he acted before leaving. She had a distinct impression that is, was because of her that he chose to flee his own home. She couldn't guess why, however. She had felt that over the last few months they had really started to get along well. They didn't interact that much, but the interactions they did have were vastly better than the ones they had shared at the beginning of her employment. She told herself often, when her mind would wander to him in his absence, that she should be glad for his removal from Brighton Abbey. Certainly it gave her more freedom. She had less fear when visiting Granny, and because of this increased their trips to twice a week. On occasion, more so than before, Mr McCarthy could also be found at Granny's cottage. Hannah hoped it was because he was taking more interest in seeing to his mother's needs, but she wasn't entirely sure if that was the truth of the matter. Either way, she no longer had to worry when Mr McCarthy was present that news would travel to the Earl. In that respect, she had a breath of fresh air as she went about her day. It seemed to be overshadowed, however, by something much more sinister. Without the Earl's presence, David Poole became much more of a constant threat. It started the first night that Lord Grimshaw was absent from the house. She woke in the middle of the night, not sure why. Normally it would take her a moment to adjust to the darkness of the room, but this night there seemed to be a glow. Sitting up in bed, she realised that the glow was from a candle shining from underneath her doorframe. She did her best to stay still, waiting for the light to move on. She had no idea who would be up at this hour or why they would be near her room. She had the last occupied room on this side of the estate, and there seemed no reason to be down this far unless it was to visit her. The light did not move, however. Very quietly she got out of her bed to inspect what the curiosity was. To her surprise she saw the shadow of two feet standing still, breaking the beam of light that shone below her door. In her tired haze, she couldn't make much sense of why a person was standing directly in front of her door and not moving on. Nor did the person knock to inform her of a reason for being there. She stood very still, barefoot and in her nightgown, as she listened to the silence all around her. She thought perhaps she was making it all up, a trick of the mind, and that it was no more than the morning light shining in through her door. There was no light to be seen out her window, though. She was just about to open the door to see the cause for the strange, flickering candlelight when she heard the deep sound of breathing. It froze her in her tracks. She spent enough nights seated at the dining room table listening to that ever-present breathing behind her to know who it was. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again.
Now, back to our story. It was David Poole standing at her door. What he was doing she had no idea, for he just seemed to stand there. Edging her way closer as silently as she could, she reached for the lock just under the doorknob. She knew he would hear her turn it and she feared the noise almost as much as the silence. With each step she took forward she was sure several minutes passed. Hannah was torn with fear. Any minute he could open the unlocked door and attack her if she didn't act quickly. But a wrong step could also cause his reaction before she could properly secure the door. Finally standing just in front of it she placed a hand on the cold metal of the lock. With nothing but a few inches of thick wood between them, she was sure she could almost feel his filthy heat upon her. Taking one steady breath, she twisted the lock as quickly as possible and jumped several steps back. The sound, though she was sure was quite subtle, was akin to a crashing wave in her mind. She stood breathless from fear and panic. The candle shifted for a moment with the action. She could swear she could hear chuckling before a sound of scuffling shoes on the wood floor and the light dissipated. She stood in the cold darkness a few minutes longer until she was sure that the only light that remained was that of the stars and moon through her window. Quickly she hopped back into bed and tugged at the covers for protection. Hannah couldn't believe that Mr Poole had stood outside her door. How long had he been there? Clearly he had waited until his presence had woken her. If he had wanted to do more, he could have entered at any time. He was stalking her like prey, just as the Baron had done. She knew all too well where these escalations would lead. What made things worse was that Pooley was far bolder now than he ever was before. Nor did he have the few constrictions of a gentleman of the ton. She feared what he would do next. Hannah sat up in her bed, covers tucked snug around her, unable to sleep. It was ridiculous to fear his return as she had locked the door, but she feared it nonetheless. As the morning light started to break in her room, she realised that she had been gripping the sheets and holding her breath all night long, so gripped with fear. She relaxed the hold she had, doing her best to stretch out her now stiff fingers as the sound of the house waking soothed her. There would be no chance for his return now. In the safety of the light, Poole could never make the trek down to her room without being stopped. He had no purpose for being here. She slid out of her bed, exhausted, frightened and cold, to start a fire. In the heat of these warm months, she had not needed the comfort from the hearth in her own room. This morning, however, she was chilled from the inside out, and though she didn't know if even the blaze of a roaring fire could thaw her fear, she was desperate to try anything. Were you chilly this morning? Mary asked, noticing the fire as she brought in Hannah's breakfast tray. Hannah had just finished dressing for the day and turned with a start at her entrance. Though she had unlocked the door to not cause alarm when the maid came and even bade her enter when Mary knocked, she still felt unnerved by another body in her room. Why, Hannah? You look like you've seen a ghost. You're as white as a sheet. Are you feeling well? Mary asked, setting down the tray and coming over to the governess. She took Hannah's hands in her own. Your hands are ice cold too. What is the matter? Hannah wanted to tell Mary what happened the night before. How she had stayed up in the darkness, frozen with fear of the man who might return and harm her again. She could do no such thing. Surely if she was to accuse Mr Poole, he would retort with his own accusations. Now not only would it be her word against his, but he also had proof on his side. The lock of hair that he had stolen from her head. He would no doubt use it to his advantage, claiming she gave it to him of her own free will. Would anyone believe that a long-standing household member put a knife to her throat and took it by force? She had to remember that she was the outsider in this house from both the staff and the Earl. There was no way that either would take her word over his in such a situation. No. She would have to endure the taunting of Mr Poole. She would just have to continue to be vigilant in that fact. Hannah would lock her door from now on and always endeavour to be in another's company outside the safety of her bedchamber. I just didn't sleep well is all, Hannah said with the faintest smile. It was all she could seem to muster. Are you sure? Perhaps you're taking ill, 
Should I ask Mrs. Brennan to send for a doctor? No, no, Hannah tried to wave her off as coolly as possible. It would be a silly waste. I assure you I am well. Just lacking in sleep is all. I will be right as rain by tomorrow. Mary wasn't sure if she believed her, but she didn't press the matter any further, thankfully. Are you still wanting the cart made ready for you and the little ladies? I could go and tell Johnson in the stables that you won't be needing it today. That's very kind, but I wouldn't want to disappoint the girls. They so look forward to the rides in the cart each week. Hannah felt that familiar pang of guilt for lying. It wasn't a total lie, though. They did take a ride in the cart each week, and the girls did enjoy it. She just left out the fact that their ride had a very specific destination. She hated keeping this even from Mary, whom she had grown to see as a friend, but she couldn't risk the secret getting out until she was ready. With the sudden change in the Earl's attitude before his sudden departure, she was sure that she wouldn't be ready to tell anyone for a much longer time than she first had anticipated. Though if you are needing an excuse to go to the stables, Hannah said, hoping to change the subject from her poor complexion, I am sure it wouldn't hurt to remind Mr Johnson that we will be needing the cart. Mary flushed red in her cheeks at Hannah's words. She had divulged to the governess that for some time now they had been developing a relationship. It hadn't come to courting yet, but Hannah was sure that that wasn't far behind. It was a difficult process, however, with Mary always busy in the house and Johnson having his duties out in the stables. Rarely did they even get to eat their meals at the same time in the servants' hall. Hannah was sure that over time things would play out well. She couldn't have been happier for both Mary and Mr Johnson. Mary was a smart girl who was sure to go as far as her station would allow her. Johnson was an able-bodied man as well. He was skilled with the horses and had big dreams. Though the process would be longer than either one of them wished, Hannah was sure they would find their way to the other and have the happy life that all hoped for in the end. I suppose it wouldn't hurt to just go and remind him of the task, Mary said, flushing a deeper crimson. Yes, it would be most inconvenient if he forgot, Hannah added, knowing full well that he wouldn't. You would be doing me a great favour to see that he is reminded. Mary nodded in agreement. Knowing the words, neither one of them was speaking. It was nothing more than a ruse to give her a chance to spend some time with her beau. She squeezed Hannah's hands one last time and thanked her kindly before leaving the room. Hannah waited until the girl was far down the hall before locking the door again. Even in the daylight, she couldn't be completely sure that she was safe from David Poole in her own room. With the door secure, she let out a sigh of relief and sat to her breakfast. She tried her best to eat, knowing full well that with lack of sleep she would need all the strength she could muster to drive the horse to and from Concordshire. She just didn't have the stomach for it, and after barely nibbling on her toast she gave up on the task altogether and went to fetch her wards a little earlier than expected. Chapter 16 Rather against his own desires, Sebastian accepted the invitation to dine at Lord and Lady Waldorn's house at the encouragement of his brother-in-law. His saving grace was that at least Jaden Marsh would be there to keep good conversation with, if nothing else. Dressed in his finest black dinner jacket, and with his necktie knotted far more intricately than he wore on most occasions, Sebastian found himself standing before Lord Waldorn's house. He had been told that this was a small party of intimate friends and relations, but he wondered if that truly was the case when he stepped out of the carriage. There seemed to him to be quite a lot of guests already inside, more than would be considered small or intimate. So it was that for the first hour of the evening, he was introduced around the room by his brother-in-law, who seemed to be in very good acquaintance with most of the parties present. Naturally, Jaden made sure that their first stop of introduction after greeting the host and hostess was that of their daughter, Miss Tara Marlowe. Sebastian had to admit that the lady was very enchanting to look at. She was of a lean figure with a fine shape to her lavender silk gown. Her hair was as black as night, and her eyes seemed to match so that it was hard to distinguish between pupils and iris. He guessed that Miss Marlowe had been Jaden's first choice in finding a partner for the Earl, because she resembled Anne so much. 
Even in the narrow set of her eyes and elongation of her nose, she reminded Sebastian of his late wife. He wondered if that was actually a good quality to have or not. He was sure he could never love someone as he loved Anne. At the same time, he wasn't sure he could live with a constant reminder of her loss. Is it true, Lord Grimshaw, that you don't come to town often? Miss Marlowe asked. No, I don't, Grimshaw responded, then remembered that he probably ought to speak more to keep up polite conversation. That is to say, I prefer to stay in my county seat where my two daughters are. Yes, Mr Marsh told me of his nieces. They sound like such gems, she cooed over a smile of pearly white teeth. They certainly are gems to me, Sebastian agreed. At least it seemed that the lady had an affection for children. That was a mark in her favour during this test of compatibility that was waged between them. Why not bring them to town with you, though? she continued. Then certainly you could come every season. They have their studies to attend to with their governess. Oh, so you don't plan to put them in a proper girls' school then? Miss Marlowe said a little surprised. No, I never actually considered doing such. Well, you should, she continued. I went to a girls' school myself. You will find that the education is vastly superior to what can be given by a governess. There are far fewer distractions for the children and, in my opinion, the teachers are far more qualified. It is an interesting thought to consider. My oldest is just eight, however, and her sister five. I am not sure I would be ready to be away from them for such extended periods of time. I went when I was just eight. I assure you it is most suitable for all girls preparing to make their way into society. Sebastian didn't really like how she was pressing the matter. He thought perhaps her passion came from the fact that she seemed to enjoy her days in a girls' school so much, and hoped it was nothing more. He rather hoped to move the conversation away from his children's education, no matter the reason for her passion. Any talk of them instantly brought to mind the governess he had left back in Brighton Abbey. He thought it was best to turn the conversation to Miss Marlowe. He felt that it was a general rule of thumb that conversations ran much more smoothly and with little addition on his part if he got the other party speaking about themselves. It seems you have a great enjoyment of your time here in London for the season. Oh yes, she said excitedly. I insist that father brings me with him every year since I was fifteen. Naturally, I enjoy the social aspect that cannot be compensated for in our country house. But more than that, I love all the things that only London has to offer. And what would you consider to be your favourite offering, Miss Marlowe? The plays and operas by far. I do enjoy them so much, I make it a point to go at least once a week while I am here. Grimshaw had been to his fair share of operas. It was a great love of both his and Anne's. When she said these words, Jaden perked up to his friend as if to say, see what a lovely match she is. It only made Grimshaw more distant from her, however. He wasn't sure he could stand ever going to the opera now that his wife was gone. Could he bring himself to sit in the same box seat that he had so many times with his loving wife in the company of Miss Marlowe? He was beginning to feel this whole idea that his brother-in-law talked him into was a terribly awful one. It was taking only one conversation with a lady intent on marriage to realise that perhaps he just wasn't ready to set his wife aside and think of another. It seemed too hard to put Miss Marlowe in the same headspace as the mother of his children. Strangely at that thought, however, his mind drifted back to Miss Jacobson on the blanket reading to the girls outside. He shook the thought quickly out of his head. It had just been a picturesque moment and nothing more. It shed no light on his ability to accept another for his daughter's new mother figure. It was too late for him to back out of Jaden's endeavours to see him happily remarried this night, though he was sure he wouldn't go along again. What would you say is your favourite opera? Sebastian asked Miss Marlowe, unable to politely leave the conversation now. She then went into a long telling of what operas she liked best. It was a very long list that he thought likely encompassed everyone she had ever seen. He wondered if she was doing this to show him her great love for theatre. Jaden Marsh wasn't the subtlest matchmaker. Perhaps he had prepped Miss Marlowe to say things that would interest the Earl. He found the thought very vapid and distasteful. 
he hoped it was just his cynicism and nothing more. As she went on, the Earl struggled to keep his mind on the words she spoke. She made a point to express that she loved all operas, including the ones in French and Italian, which she was both fluent in. He smiled as he listened to her drone on. It wasn't her conversation that brought humour to his lips, but the fact that he rather felt like he was interviewing all over again, as he had not so long ago in the solicitor's office. Naturally, the setting was different, and the position was not of a paid employee, but as she went on spilling out all the accomplishments she could possibly fit into such conversation, he rather felt like he was reading over a resume and list of references. Finally, the time for the meal came, and he was relieved of the duty of listening to Miss Marlowe's array of skills, accomplishments and knowledge. Unfortunately, as he came to sit for dinner, he found that he was again placed near another single young miss. This lady, however, a Lady Isabella, was far younger. He would have guessed that Miss Marlowe was in her early twenties. This girl couldn't have even seen her twentieth year yet. That didn't stop her matronly mother at her other side from encouraging a connection between the two of them all throughout the meal. Grimshaw didn't really consider himself a man of great age, being thirty and two, but couldn't bring himself to consider a partner who was closer to the age of his children than himself. For some reason, Sebastian's mind went back to Miss Jacobson at the thought. He knew from her resume when he hired her that she was only twenty herself. This had never been a hindrance to him. Perhaps it was the way she dressed so demurely, he mused to himself. No, he was sure that it wasn't that. It was because she had been so mature for her age. She didn't take her responsibility to his children lightly, and that quality alone made her seem much wiser than any counterpart of the tan. Instantly, Grimshaw was angry with himself again. Could he not go ten minutes without his mind trailing back to Miss Jacobson? He reminded himself of all the reasons why he was in London at this moment. Luckily, once the meal was over, he was able to join the rest of the gentlemen, while the ladies retired to the drawing room for after-meal conversation and refreshments. Jaden was eager to hear what thoughts Grimshaw had on the night thus far. Well? he asked in anticipation. Grimshaw circled the amber liquid in his glass absent-mindedly, before drinking it down in one gulp. She seems like a nice enough lady, he replied without any emotion for like or dislike. That's it? That's all you have to say? I thought you would have found her enchanting and compatible in so many ways because... Jaden hesitated to end the sentence so Grimshaw did for him. Because she is so much like Anne. Jaden nodded in agreement. Though he wanted to help his brother-in-law find happiness again, it still was a sore spot to speak of his deceased sister. Grimshaw reached over for the decanter and poured himself another dram of spirits before swallowing that down too. I don't know if I could handle being with someone who reminded me so much of Anne, he said in all honesty. She was a good match for you and you were for her, Jaden said with delicacy. It would be wise to find someone with similarities if you hope to have the same happiness again, Jaden finished. And what if I don't want to? What if I would rather just stay as I am than to dilute her memory that way? It would be no dilution to give her children a mother who would love them just as she would. Certainly, a lady with similar qualities would be the best choice for that. Grimshaw reached over and gave Jaden a comforting pat. He was thankful for his advice and help but in all honesty, wondered if it was still just too soon for him. It is a matter I will think on, Grimshaw said. I hope you do. Also, Jaden said slightly hesitantly, it may not hurt terribly to just for now, mind you, keep up the relationship between you two. Tomorrow is a public ball. I know that Miss Marlowe will be there. It would be a chance to see her in a different setting. Perhaps you will find things more pleasing to you then. Grimshaw hesitated at Jaden's words. And I may have already said you plan to attend, Jaden added quickly and under his breath before hiding his face behind his own glass. Grimshaw's brows furrowed in disappointment. Well, now he would have no choice but to go. If he did otherwise, it might send a message that would offend the lady. You scoundrel, Grimshaw said, but only half-heartedly. 
He couldn't be mad at Jaden for doing what he thought was right for a friend, no matter how wrong he was to that fact. Scoundrel I may be, but perhaps you will thank me for it one day, Jaden said in return. Yes, perhaps. Or perhaps I'll take you for a few rounds inside the boxing ring as compensation for my pain and suffering, Grimshaw added with a smirk. Chapter 17 My dear, I am sure there is something greatly troubling you, Granny said. Hannah was lost in thought, looking out Joanna McCarthy's cottage window at the leaves beginning to turn and fall. She felt very much like those leaves at that moment. She was slowly wilting, losing all strength to hold on much longer. It had been two months since the Earl of Grimshaw left for London. A sullen cloud had fallen on Brighton Abbey with his absence. Even the girls didn't have the same merry laugh. Every night since his departure, Hannah was woken with the presence outside her door. After the first night, she kept it constantly locked and rarely ventured outside her room if she wasn't teaching the girls. It made her feel a ghost of her former self. No longer did she enjoy reading in the garden or even just quiet walks around the house, for both were far too dangerous. Shut up in her room for all her free time, she rather felt like a caged animal. Her only solace was in their visits to Joanna McCarthy. In her small cottage, Hannah could finally breathe that sigh of relief and let the tension that was a constant prickle on her spine relax. Though at first Mr Matthew McCarthy's visits had become more regular, as Hannah wilted, so had he vanished. It only proved to her that his motives were not to care for his aged mother. When she showed little interest and frankly limited sociability with so many sleepless nights, he had lost interest in her and turned his attentions elsewhere. She was not hurt by his inattention, as she had no amicable feelings toward him in the first place. There was also the matter of the Earl. He certainly wouldn't believe that she was not encouraging him. No doubt he would count it her fault, just as she was sure he would see Mr Poole's aggressive behaviour her doing as well. I'm sorry, Granny, Hannah said, tearing her eyes from the window after watching another leaf give up and fall to the ground. I haven't slept well much in the last few months. Why ever not, child? Granny asked with concern. It's hard to say. Hard to put the reason into words or hard to make the words come out of your mouth? She asked. Hannah looked down shamefully at her hands. She certainly could say the words. It was no problem finding ones to explain her troubles. It was the fear that accompanied them that she couldn't allow escaping. Keeping her night terror to herself was the only wall holding back the dam of fear. It was her last thing she could hold on to. My little ladies, Granny said, turning to the girls, I believe the tabby cat out in the goat shed had her kittens. Would you two be dears for me and go and check on the little angels? Both girls lit up at the opportunity to see little kittens and hurried out the door. Though the reasoning was true enough, Joanna was wise enough to know that the only way Hannah could speak on her troubles would be in confidence. They sat in the room for a few beats of silence so that the confidentiality could breathe a bit between them. Does it have anything to do with those marks on your neck a few months back? Granny asked finally. Hannah looked to the old woman in surprise. No one else had noticed the bruises that had formed on Hannah's neck after Mr. Poole's attack in the garden. She had kept her cap low and her fichu high to make sure of that. Unfortunately, she had forgotten how Joanna McCarthy's faculties had only seemed to sharpen in her old age. Was it the Earl then? she inquired again when Hannah didn't answer. Oh no, I know he seems quite large and overbearing, but I promise he is an honourable man perhaps a bit overbearing and controlling, but he does even these things from his heart. I would wager you didn't do it to yourself, though. How about you tell Granny the truth and together we can find a way through it? Hannah could already feel the tears welling in her eyes. It didn't matter if she wanted to keep it all in, hold it all back. The dam was breaking and there was no stopping it. Hannah crumpled into a fit of tears and Granny came quickly to her side, wrapping a comforting arm around her. It has just been so awful, Hannah choked between sobs after she had spilled the whole story out to Joanna, 
from the very first encounter with the Baron to the nightly visits from Mr. Poole. What horrible fiends they both are, Granny said with a bitter tone to her words. You must go to the Earl at once, she added. I could never. It would be my word against Mr. Poole. With the past that I have, and Mr. Poole with my stolen lock of hair, there would be no way Lord Grimshaw would believe me. He would believe you because your words are the truth. He would only need to look into your beautiful blue eyes to see that. I am not so sure as you are. He is already conditioned to think that I have motives to seek a different circumstance through this position. It would be easier for him to follow Mr. Poole's conclusions than my own. All because of that, Miss Watts, Granny said, shaking her head. She was a nice girl and she fell in love. I saw it unfold every Sunday service. When you fall in love, it isn't something you choose and it can't be helped, Granny added with wisdom. Lord Grimshaw of all people should know that. It was easy to see how much he loved and cared for his lady, despite the fact that they were chosen for each other by their parents. Hannah was surprised to hear this news. She had learned so little about the late Lady Grimshaw. Hannah had known well that the Earl cared and still mourned for her by his actions, but would have never guessed that their marriage had started with any less affection, let alone an arranged marriage. If you can't talk to the Earl about it, though, Granny continued, that doesn't mean you need to go on living like this any longer. I could never leave, Hannah retorted quickly. As horrible as that man is, I couldn't leave the girls. They would be so distraught. I don't want you to leave either, dear, Granny said, patting a wrinkled hand on Hannah's lap. But something must be done. If you cannot seek protection from the Earl, then you must find a way to protect yourself. What do you mean? Hannah sniffed. Men like that, Granny said with a wrinkle to her already shriveled face. They do what they want because they think they have the power. You stand up to him, you fight back, and you take that power away. Fight back? How could I? He is far stronger than I. It is not the strength ye be needing. It is just the surprise. You catch him off guard and fight before he even has the chance to get you. I promise you one time of that and he won't be lurking outside your door any longer. Hannah thought these words over as she headed home that evening with the girls. They were both so excited by the litter of kittens that neither young lady noticed that Hannah was lost in her own thoughts while they chatted away. What was most exciting to the girls was that Granny had promised each one a kitten to take home when they were old enough to leave their mother. It was just one more worry that Hannah had to file away in the back of her mind. Already the girls anticipated the day their father would come home. It wasn't just to see him again, but also because each girl had a framed watercolour portrait waiting to show him. Hannah was proud of their work, but also terrified of the Earl's wrath when he realised what they had been doing all these months. She hoped against all odds that he would return home in a much better attitude towards her than the one he had left with. She desperately hoped he would not take away their outings to Joanna's cottage. She was sure that it did the girls just as much good to spend time with the aged lady as it did Granny. Rebecca, you cannot carry a cat around with you everywhere you go, Caroline was scolding her younger sister's aspirations. If you take it in the schoolroom, it would surely eat Mr Whiskers. Not my cat. She will love Mr Whiskers, Rebecca retorted. No cat will ever like a mouse, Caroline argued, with the superiority of one older in age and knowledge. Miss Jacobson, is that true? Will my cat hate Mr Whiskers no matter what? Rebecca asked. I'm not entirely sure, Hannah said with a huff. She was feeling so entirely drained from the lack of sleep and the release of emotions she had had this afternoon. I expect it is much like asking a cheater to change his spots. If you are born one way, I don't see how you could ever behave contrary to that, Hannah continued. Caroline stuck her head out a little prouder that the authority had agreed with her on the matter, while Rebecca resolved to pouting. My kitten will be different, Rebecca sulked under her breath. She will love everything and everyone and sleep on my bed and follow me around everywhere I go. If that is what you are hoping for, Hannah said with a little smirk at the child's musing, I expect we better look for a litter of puppies instead of kittens.
18. Hannah spent the night wondering if she would have the courage to follow through on Granny's suggestion. It was yet another night of him standing outside the door. Though this time she was woken by the sound of him trying the knob. She couldn't believe that he was now escalating to getting in her room. Hannah knew that Granny had been right. He was loving the power he held over her more than anything else. Just when she thought she could cope with his behaviour, he would always up his level to scare her all the more. The following day was Saturday, and she was free to do what she liked while the girls spent the day with Abigail. For the last several months this meant being confined to her room for the duration of the day with the door securely locked. She was determined not to let her fear hinder her life anymore, however. So instead of staying to her room, she decided to go to the library and borrow a book to read outside in the garden. The days were starting to grow progressively chillier, and she rather hoped to get some time outside in fresh air before the winter confined her to the indoors for the rest of the year. She had taken her time looking over the shelves of books. Though her heart was racing and she jumped twice at the sound of footsteps and a door shutting, she refused to let her fear chase her away. She had as much right to walk around Brighton Abbey as Mr Poole did, and she wouldn't let him stop her any more. Finally, Hannah selected a book she had yet to read and which she thought looked rather interesting. After signing her name to the borrowing book left out for the servant's use, she made her way out of the library rather triumphant that she had kept her head held high and fears at bay. She had only taken maybe three steps outside the library door when she heard the district sound of heavy quick steps on the wood floor behind her. Hannah's fears froze her to the spot as she listened. It was decidedly the sound of male footsteps and at a determined pace. There was only one logical reason in Hannah's mind as to why a household member would be doing such a thing. He was clearly trying to catch up and perhaps overtake someone. She knew this was her moment. This was when she was to stand her ground. She looked around her quickly, hoping for some kind of help. To her left was a small alcove reading window. She remembered Granny's advice about having the element of surprise on her side. She slipped behind the thick curtains of the alcove. Leaning up against one of its walls, she could just barely make out a sliver of the walkway between the curtain and stone wall. She would wait until the brute was on her, and then she wouldn't hesitate to fight to keep her virtue. She gripped the book so tightly her knuckles showed white and her breath caught in her throat. In the silence of the hallway, she could hear her heart beating in her ear just as fast as the footsteps came towards her. Finally, she saw the pair of boots before her. With every ounce of courage and strength she possessed, she tensed every muscle in her body. Just as the shoes came to her hiding spot, she threw back the curtains and chucked the book with all her might at the rake. I will not let you frighten me any longer, she shouted as she threw the object with all her might. Her aim was a little off, and instead of hitting the assailant on the head, it struck his shoulder. He spun around in surprise at the attack, arms reaching up to instinctively cover himself. What the hell do you think you are doing? The Earl of Grimshaw's deep voice boomed as he turned on his attacker. Instantly, Hannah froze to the spot. I'm so sorry, Lord Grimshaw. I didn't think it was... I had no idea you were... Grimshaw calmed, but only slightly when he saw that his assailant was nothing more than a woman behind curtains. Why on earth would you hide behind my curtains and throw a book at me? He demanded. You see... Hannah started and faltered. She was shaking all over. It might have been the surge of fear combined with the adrenaline of the moment. Perhaps it was the new shocking revelation that she not only attacked the wrong man, but her employer to boot. Nonetheless, she could feel the world spinning around her. She reached back and let her hands grope the cold stone wall to steady her. The last memory she had before the world went black was the feel of the icy rock slipping from her fingers. To say Sebastian Blackburn was startled when Miss Jacobson hurled a book at him from behind an alcove was a vast understatement. Even still, that couldn't compare to watching the woman falter and fall before him. It was as if the whole world slowed down as she paled to a white sheet. He watched her stammer, 
lean back to reach the wall and slowly lose all feeling in her legs. He didn't have to think, only act. Reaching, he wrapped her in his arms, sacrificing his own body in the motion. He hit the floor hard, but luckily he cradled her from the blow. Miss Jacobson, Miss Jacobson, he said, endeavouring to shake the limp body he held in his arms. Hannah, Hannah, wake up! She moaned for just a moment, though her eyes remained closed. Nonetheless, Grimshaw breathed a sigh of relief. She had merely fainted. He stood cradling her in his capable arms in one motion. She let her head rest on his chest as he held her close to him. You'll be all right, he cooed, though he wasn't sure she could hear. In fact, he rather thought he was telling himself more than her. He was too familiar with the sight of a woman weakened to the core. Taking long, heavy steps, he marched into the library, the closest room, and laid her body down on a sofa. She still lay motionless and limp. She was cool to the touch, at least though she looked pale still and a bit thinner if he was being honest with himself. Gently he removed her cap and undid the pins in her hair. With her still not awake, he hesitated at the next part. He knew from experience with his wife. In the beginning, she would still choose to be fully dressed in a corset and all. When a coughing spell came on, it was too much for her to breathe and she would often faint. Often he would loosen her stays to help her breathe easier when she came to. He couldn't bring himself to do so now, though. Instead, he brushed aside a strand that had fallen and waited patiently for Miss Jacobson to open her eyes. It was several minutes before that happened. He was pacing the room when he caught the sight of her eyes fluttering open. Immediately, he came to her side and put a gentle arm on her shoulder to prevent her from getting up. Stay still a bit longer, he urged her. She relaxed back onto the couch and satisfied that she wouldn't move, Grimshaw walked over to a decanter and poured a good dram of brandy for the both of them. He drank his and then brought the glass over to Miss Jacobson. Here, it will give you back some strength. I can't bear the stuff, she said in no more than a weak whisper. He smiled down at her tenacity. Even in such a weakened state, she still had the wit about her to fight him on every little thing. Have you ever fainted before? he asked, still standing over her with the glass. She shook her head no. Well, then you don't know how much of a toll it will take on your body. I have seen it many times. Take the glass, even just a sip will do you good. She took the glass reluctantly and took a minute sip, squeezing her eyes shut as it went down. Weakly, she raised the glass back to him to take. He pursed his lips, not satisfied with her feeble attempt, but took the glass anyway and set it on a table. Grimshaw hesitated for just a moment before he came to sit on the sofa next to her stretched-out body. He brushed her hair gently and let his fingers move down her cheek. She looked up at him with those big blue eyes that seemed the size of the moon. He had such a deep desire at this moment to hold her to him, to keep her safe, and to comfort away whatever was troubling in those deep blue pools. Would you like to tell me now why you attacked me? He asked with a humorous smile to his lips. He watched the flood of realisation come over her and she stiffened and sat up just a bit. Forgive me, I didn't mean to, Miss Jacobson stammered. Oh, you certainly meant to, Grimshaw said with a gruff laugh, but you did seem pretty surprised at your target. I was frightened is all. I thought someone was following me and and I guess instinct just kicked in. Instincts kicked in, Grimshaw repeated with a sceptical brow. I don't take you for the fighting type, Miss Jacobson. Plus, who could you possibly think would harm you in Brighton Abbey? The second of his questions puzzled him the most. She had the look of a crazed woman driven to a last resort. What were the words she had yelled? You said I will not let you frighten me any more. Who is frightening you? Grimshaw asked, more serious now. He didn't like the feeling of knowing that Hannah Jacobson was tormented by someone. No one, she responded a little too quickly. Grimshaw pursed his lips and pinched his brows together. She was clearly lying to him. Honest, I'm just a silly girl is all. I thought I heard noises. A ghost, 
she said suddenly, as if the idea had just occurred to her. I thought it was a ghost, and I was frightened. And you suppose throwing a book at a spirit would drive it away? Grimshaw said, not believing her for one second. It was silly, I know. I suppose I just panicked. I'm very sorry about that. Hannah, Grimshaw said softly, liking the feel of her name on his lips. Please, if someone is frightening you, I need to know. No one, she said, looking at the floor. Have you not been well? You look like a skeleton compared to the last time I saw you, Grimshaw asked. No, I'm fine. Miss Jacobson swung her legs around and put her feet on the floor. Grimshaw stood and helped her to her feet. She wavered for just a moment and leaned into him, but then caught her own balance again. I assure you, she said with more determination, that I am quite fine now. He didn't like that she was lying to him. There was nothing he could do for it. There was no way that he would press her in such a delicate state. He thought back to why he had left in the first place. Perhaps she had some kind of a lover's quarrel, and that was what had gotten her so upset. He was filled with the pangs of jealousy all over again. He had worked so hard to remove Miss Jacobson from his mind these last months that he was away, and within an instant she had quite literally fallen back into his arms and into his heart. Grimshaw despised himself for relapsing so easily. However, he was still a gentleman, and he would not let Hannah Jacobson out of his sight until he was sure she was well enough on her own. He took her still weak arm and interlaced it into his. I will walk you to your room where you can rest. If you would like, I can have your supper brought up to you tonight. She hesitated for a moment and Grimshaw wondered if she would argue with him on this fact too. She still didn't have a completely clear head, however, so she succumbed to his suggestion thankfully. Together they walked through the halls at a slow pace until he was able to deposit her safely into her room. He immediately sent for Mary to have her attend to any and all of Miss Jacobson's needs for the night. As much as he despised himself for it, he would not shirk his duties to care for the members of his household, even when his heart bled for them and theirs for another. 19. Lord Grimshaw couldn't shake the memory of Miss Jacobson in such a state from his mind. Unable to clear his mind, he set to picking up the work again in the West Wing. While he was away to town, the roof was completed by his hired hands, and the interior had begun to take shape. He didn't like that he had missed so much of it during his time in London, but it was a necessity to get the roof on before winter storms came and destroyed much of the progress they had made. Grimshaw had only meant to walk around the wing and assess the work, but within no time he found himself hard at work. It was a job that took full concentration, and for that he was glad. With his mind on the job before him, there was no time left to let it wander or try to understand the complexities that seemed to be Miss Hannah Jacobson. He was so lost in his work, in fact, that he lost all track of time. It wasn't until Mrs. Brennan stood before him, dinner tray in hand, that he realised how late he had stayed in the area. Have I missed dinner? Grimshaw asked the housekeeper in surprise. You've missed dinner and many more hours past that. He reached into his pocket and looked at the time. He was astounded. It was nearly midnight. I finally gave up waiting for you to finish working out whatever it is troubling you and brought you a tray so that I might retire. Mrs. Brennan, forgive me for keeping you up so late. You go far above and beyond your duties. I can assure you, however, that nothing is troubling me. I simply lost track of time. She set the silver tray down on the dusty floorboard, still untreated, and gave him a sceptical look. I suppose you could continue to bang around in here through the night instead of talking about what's bothering you, she said, crossing her hands and surveying that portion of the wing. It would certainly hasten the process, though I fear it would not give you the relief of conscience that you are searching for. I'm not entirely sure what relief you mean, Grimshaw responded. I would guess it has something to do with Miss Jacobson. I would also wager your feelings for her or why you ran away all these months. I didn't run, he defended. Mrs. Brennan pursed her lips and raised a brow in disbelief. He deflated, knowing she had seen right through him. 
I did, but not for the reason you are insinuating. She frustrates me so. I can't understand why it is so difficult to find a governess for the girls that would just stick to her job. Whatever do you mean? Miss Jacobson has been very skilled and diligent at her work. I am sure that is true, but she also has other motives. Just as Miss Watts did, Grimshaw countered. Just because one had them does not mean all do, Mrs. Brennan stated exasperatedly. I saw her scheming with my own eyes. I am not sure what you think you saw, but I can assure you that Miss Jacobson has no other motives that resemble any of Miss Watts. There is something inside her. Mrs. Brennan trailed off while she thought of the words. Something inside her that I have seen is broken, Mrs. Brennan finally finished. There is no other way to explain the actions I have observed. What do you mean? Grimshaw said, surprised by her words. Well, for a start, there are only so many reasons that a beautiful young girl like that would feel the need to cover every inch of her body in plain and homely clothing. Grimshaw thought over these words, trying to find his housekeeper's conclusion. When he took too long, she spelled it out for him. Obviously someone has hurt her. She covers herself up so to protect herself from it happening again. How do you not see that? When Mrs. Brennan put it that way, things began to click into place for him. Well, at least some. The night she had a nightmare, and the words she screamed when she attacked him earlier today. She was making a stand and refusing to be frightened any more. By what he had no idea. Nor was he sure if the threat was still real around her, or just an echo of her past. She has her ghost, just as you do. You fight to stay away from her but I know together is the only way you will work through them. I have no ghost, Grimshaw said gruffly, and I don't know what you are inferring about working them out together. Oh, Sebastian, you know exactly what I mean, Mrs. Brennan said, with the familiarity of a household member who was more akin to family. She touched his cheek affectionately, and for a second she saw the young rascal of a boy that used to torment these halls. I'll say good night now, Lord Grimshaw, she said with a glisten to her eyes before turning to leave. Grimshaw sat down on the floor and poked at the food she had brought him. Mrs. Brennan had rather made him feel like a silly child explaining things out to him that she saw and he didn't. Of course he knew he had a ghost. The memory of his wife, the pain of the loss still gripped him hard. The guilt of finding another one to put into his heart. She had been wrong to suppose he wanted that to be Miss Jacobson, he was sure of it. Yes, Grimshaw did have feelings for her, but perhaps it was just the need to protect her from whatever fears had made her cover her physical body so. He may have not realised the burden she carried secretly, but on some level he must have recognised it to feel so protective towards her. Protective was not the same as infatuation, however. She was nothing to him but an employee. Even if he did have such feelings, which he certainly did not, he would not subject his girls to that sort of gossip. They had already had enough hardship in life. To enter their young lady years with the talk that their governess had married their father was far too much than they should have to bear. No, he would find a mother for them, not out of a desire to find love, but the necessity to take care of them and see them right in the world. His heart was too full with Anne to ever make room for another. He would not disgrace her memory like that. Though Hannah was mortified by her actions, she was also grateful that the Earl had been at her side. She was more irritated at herself than anything else. In an attempt to be brave and stand up for herself, she had instead wilted into a puddle. Thank heavens it had been Lord Grimshaw and not Mr Poole. She could have only imagined what would have happened if she had fainted in the presence of David Poole. She shuddered at the thought as she lay in her bed. She was so completely drained from it all. She had rather thought she would take a moment to compose herself in her room and then go to supper. She didn't like the idea of Lord Grimshaw thinking of her as weak and faltering for some reason, but she couldn't seem to make her legs move much. A soft knock came at the door and Mary let herself in. Hannah, dear, how are you? Mary cooed coming into the room with a tray of warm broth and tea. 
Lord Grimshaw informed Mrs. Brennan you had a spell. You poor thing. She set the tray down and came to sit by Hannah on the bed. I'm quite all right, Hannah reassured her. Nothing more than a silly girl. I am more embarrassed than anything else. Tell me what happened, Mary encouraged. Hannah hesitated. She had already revealed her burden to Mrs. McCarthy and wasn't sure she could do it again. It was all just ridiculous. I didn't know Lord Grimshaw was home. I was leaving the library and he frightened me and I fainted, Hannah said with a quick retelling. She hoped that he would leave out the fact that she chucked a book at him if he was asked to retell the tale. Are you sure that was all? Mary asked. Hannah smiled weakly and took her hand. She was such a kind friend to her. She nodded and did her best to seem on the mend from the whole experience. Well, if you are sure, then I should be off to my work, Mary said, coming to stand. Yes, please, don't let me keep you. Well, you will send for me if you need anything, right? Yes, I will, I promise. I am just going to stay here in bed and read a bit, she said, reaching for the book on her nightstand. Mary was still reluctant but having tasks to complete before the day was over, she left Hannah in her room alone. She waited till Mary was fully gone before putting the book back in its place. She had already read it twice. That was the reason for going to the library and getting another. She considered going back and looking for her weapon but decided against it. Instead, she snuggled down in her bed and promptly went to sleep. She wasn't sure how long she slept, but when she awoke, the room was cool and dark. She expected it was late into the night. She lifted herself out of bed stiffly, having fallen asleep fully dressed. She moved to remove her gown when she realised it was a sound that had awoken her. Pure fear ran down her spine when she saw the light and heard the footsteps coming towards her room. She jumped out of bed and ran to bolt the door before they reached her. The sound was loud enough in her mind to wake the whole house. Poole stood outside her door, candle in hand, clearly having heard the noise and knowing her to be awake. She took a couple of steps back to put space between herself and the attacker on the other side. She gritted her teeth and clenched her fist. Hannah may have been too frightened to open the door and face her attacker, but she wouldn't let him control her like this any longer. The Earl is home, she hissed to the door. It may have not been very loud, but in the silence of the night she was sure he heard her. I am well aware, Poole's voice said, husky from the other side. So go away, if Lord Grimshaw should find you lurking outside my door. I doubt Lord Grimshaw will be patrolling the halls at night, but if you are so worried, all you have to do is unbolt the door. Never, Hannah hissed back. I assure you I will be quick and gentle he cooed back at her. One time is all I ask, and then I will be done with you. You are a disgusting vile fiend, Hannah retorted, using every word in her vocabulary to describe the man. He chuckled low and deep in his throat. I will have you, Hannah Jacobson. One way or another I will find a way in. It is best that you just let me have what I want. We could both get on with our lives that way. She wanted to respond to say something to defy him, but the weight of his words was heavy in the night air. He would not give up. Nothing was going to stop him. She covered her mouth to hide a sob. Hannah Jacobson may have been lacking in the bravery needed to fight off an assailant without fainting, but she was not so lacking that she would give him the satisfaction of letting him hear her tears. Finally, after a few moments of silence, she heard the whoosh of his candle going out, and in the darkness, she heard his retreating footsteps. On the cold floor, she crumpled into a heap and cried until she fell asleep again. 20. The following morning, Hannah did her best to forget everything and focus on the present. She dressed for church and went to collect the girls. Both were bubbling with excitement and Abigail struggled to keep their bowed hair tight as they bounced about the room. Abigail said that father came home last night, Rebecca said in excitement. Yes. Did you not see him at supper? 
Hannah asked the girls in surprise. No, he didn't take supper last night, Rebecca responded rather regretfully. I can't wait to see him, though, she added. Caroline and I have our paintings all ready. She ran over and showed Hannah the watercolour framed and at the ready. Hannah's heart sank. In all the turmoil yesterday, she had completely forgotten that the girls would want to show them to their father and by so doing give up their secret visits to Concordshire. I was thinking, Hannah said, coming to kneel before the girls, since we're getting so close to Yuletide, wouldn't it be lovely to gift them to your father on Christmas? Rebecca liked this idea, but Caroline seemed to ponder it a bit longer. She was going to be a harder sell. I am sure by then your father will have most of the West Wing done. Then when you give them to him on Christmas, he could put them right on the wall. Wouldn't that be lovely? Hannah encouraged a little more. Oh, Carolina, that will be nice, won't it? Rebecca said to her sister. Caroline looked down at the framed watercolour in her hand. It was a vase with an arrangement of flowers in it. She had worked so hard and it was so beautiful she did want her father to be the absolute most proud of her when she gave it to him. I suppose that would be all right, Caroline finally said after a few moments of pondering. Wonderful, Hannah said, coming to stand filled with the mixed emotion of relief and guilt. She guided the girls downstairs and to their waiting father. Both girls were so happy to see him again after such an extended time that Hannah was sure the portraits were already forgotten. Good morning, Miss Jacobson. I trust you are feeling better. Lord Grimshaw greeted ever so politely. Yes, I am, thank you, Hannah replied. She could feel the stiff awkwardness between them after such an intimate encounter the day before. She couldn't help but remember the feeling of his hand brushing along her cheek, the warmth of his presence as he sat next to her on the couch. Her eyes met his brown ones, and in their depths, she saw he was recalling the same memory. She looked away blushing, and Lord Grimshaw cleared his throat. Shall we go? he said to the three ladies as he motioned with one arm to the exit, and held Rebecca's hand in his other. There was nothing outwardly unusual about the carriage ride, the sermon at church, or the return ride home. By all accounts, from an outsider looking in, it was quite routine. There was something new in the air, however. It began with the shared look before departure and seemed to grow as every second ticked by. By the end of the trip, there was an unspoken longing and desire seeping into every inch of Hannah's being. She could scarcely look at Lord Grimshaw without her face turning crimson from it. The girls were naturally too young to see it and acted as they usually did on a Sunday. They spent the ride in the carriage asking their father one question after another about his time in London. He was all too happy to oblige them with tales of dinners and balls that he attended. Apparently, Hannah learned he made quite a social event of his business trip. She wasn't sure why she felt such pangs of jealousy with every mention of a dance he had, or a fine lady he met in his months away. She had never carried about the society of the Torn before, she was never part of it, and really had little connection to it besides what she saw in the Baron's house. Even then, during the height of the season when the Baroness constantly had visitors and events to attend, Hannah had felt little desire for the season. Hearing the words pour out of Lord Grimshaw's mouth, however, the activities took on a whole other meaning to her. She was sure it was just the way he seemed to weave the words into such enchanting tales for the benefit of his daughters that made it all sound so enticing. If she was truly being honest with herself, she was jealous of this life that Grimshaw spoke of that he had outside of Brighton Abbey. When she questioned herself why she should care, again the memory of his touch on her cheek came flooding back. It was a silly thing that vexed her so. She was sure that Lord Grimshaw could feel the turmoil in the unspoken words as well and was equally disturbed by it. Sebastian Blackburn wasn't sure if it was his housekeeper's words or the fact that he just spent all day in Miss Jacobson's presence pining after her. But either way, he needed to shift his attention. He was growing increasingly aware that the feelings he had for the lady were far from an employer and employee type of relationship. It was also something that couldn't be done for the sake of the girls. By Monday night, 
he had reached one final conclusion. The only way to remove her image from his mind was to replace it. He sat down to his writing desk at that very moment and penned a letter. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Of all the ladies he had met and had matrimonial inquisitions with, there was only one that he knew he would never ever feel romantic feelings for. Lady Tara Marlowe was similar to his late wife, and nothing like her all at the same time. She would be the mother that his daughters needed, their sponsors to the ton when the time came. She would be all too happy to secure the title countess if his guess was right. Every moment with that woman would remind him of his late wife. He was sure it was the penitence he deserved for loving another besides her. Lady Tara would remind him of all he had lost and why it was so precious. She would be the face that told him that no matter what Anne said, it was wrong to let anyone else into one's heart. He wrote so quickly that he left two blots on the paper. It was uncouth, but he cared little. He wanted to get it done as quickly as possible before he changed his mind. With the envelope sealed and set out to be taken in the morning mail, he felt a great relief come over him. Then a thought crossed his mind. He only held it for a moment before walking up the stairs determinedly to his wife's old room. He stood in the doorframe for some minutes. It had been a while since he opened that door. Despite his absence, the household servants had kept it clean and dust-free. He walked slowly around the room with nothing but the light from a full moon to guide him. He could have walked that room in the dark he had been in it so many times. He made his way over to the mirror where he could almost see her sitting and brushing her long black hair. He reached down and touched the silver-polished comb and bore hairbrush that sat on the vanity. It took all he had to keep back the wave of emotion that hit him hard. He missed her so much. Instead of letting it flow freely, however, he stuffed it back down and made his way to his intended target. Opening the top drawer of her dresser, he found the stack of letters. Several of them were addressed to their girls. The day that they would have their coming out. The day that they would be married. The day they would have their first child. The last letter at the bottom, however, he knew had neither Rebecca's or Caroline's name on it. He pulled it forward and looked at it in the darkness. He couldn't see his wife's handwritten inscription on it, but he knew already what it said. To Mrs. Sebastian Blackburn, Countess of Grimshaw. He considered lighting a fire. He would never let this fall into Lady Tara Marlowe's hands, as she didn't deserve such a thing. Instead, he turned it over in his hand and felt the wax seal on the back. He always wondered what Anne could have possibly said to the woman that she thought would be his future wife. The envelope was thick enough that it must have been quite a lot. He hesitated for what seemed like moments, but he later realised was much longer, as he felt his hand over the seal her hand had pressed, the writing her hand had inscribed. He stuffed the letters back into the drawer and sat down on the bed in a crumpled mess. Holding his head between his hands, he forced the tears back. I'm so sorry, he whispered to the spirits of the darkness. Grimshaw wasn't sorry to be inviting Lady Tara to his house for the winter season. He wasn't sorry that he was going to make his intentions clear that he wanted to marry her. He wasn't even sorry that he would share the rest of his life with that woman for the sake of his daughter's well-being. He was sorry for a more sinister act, one he was sure that Anne would never be able to forgive him for. One day he would stand at the golden gates of heaven where his Anne would meet him, and still he would be filled with this guilt. It was the knowledge that he had made room in his heart to love another. He had thawed it out and let someone else in. It didn't matter that Anne had said such was necessary. It still felt like a great betrayal in his eyes. As far as Grimshaw was concerned, he had done worse than when he watched her slowly die in front of him with no help for it. He had actively let this pain happen. He had let himself fall in love, and in so doing he was sure he had broken Anne's heart. Twenty-one. The Earl of Grimshaw took a steadying breath outside the schoolroom door. 
He wasn't sure why he was so nervous to do this, but it would have to be done all the same. He knocked softly before letting himself in. Inside the room, Grimshaw found Hannah seated in the chair by a warm fire to keep off the autumn chill. Sitting on the floor in front of her was Rebecca playing with her dolls. At the other side of the hearth was Caroline seated in a chair working on her sampler. Hannah looked up at Grimshaw and smiled at his entrance. She set the book aside that she was no doubt reading aloud. Grimshaw did his best to stuff down the fluttering that seized his heart when she smiled at him like that. It was those smiles when her dimples showed so deeply that did him in. I wonder, he said, standing a little awkwardly, if I might have a moment to speak with the girls about something. Of course, Lord Grimshaw, Hannah said, coming to her feet and setting the book open on the arm of the chair to keep its place. I will be just in the other room visiting with Abigail, if that's all right, Hannah said, walking over to the door that joined the nursery to the schoolroom. Abigail would pass her time in there occasionally darning as needed, or perhaps knitting. Occasionally she would stay in the schoolroom and listen while Hannah read, but that wasn't the case on that particular day. That would be fine. Thank you, Miss Jacobson, Grimshaw said, doing his best to hide his feelings for her. In reality he looked very stern, but to his inward eye, he feared that it was plain to see his affection for her. Grimshaw waited until Miss Jacobson left the room and shut the door softly behind her. Girls, he said, coming to stand before them. Rebecca kept playing with her dolls, though Caroline was happy to put aside her embroidery and place her attention elsewhere. I have something I need to tell you. Well, I'm not sure how to put this, he stammered and then started to pace in front of them. What's the matter, father? You're acting strange, Caroline observed. I'm just a little nervous, is all. What for, Daddy? Rebecca cooed in her angelic way. I have some news to tell you. I want you to take it well. What is it, then? Caroline asked, old enough to know that she should be nervous at such a declaration. Certainly it couldn't be good news for her father to act in such a way. He was practically struggling to get the words out. While I was in London... I told you I attended many dinners, balls, events like that. Over the course of my stay, I met someone. She is a very amiable woman, as I think you girls will find. What are you saying? Caroline sat up in her chair like a prickly porcupine. He gave a long sigh. Her name is Lady Tara Marlowe. She is the daughter of Lord and Lady Waldron. I have invited them to come stay with us over the holidays. Whatever for? Caroline demanded, though she was sure she knew the answer. I intend to marry her, Grimshaw said, stilling his pace and looking down at his daughters. How could you? How could you do that to mother? Caroline said in a sharp tone. Calm down, Caroline, there is no need to be upset. Grimshaw looked down to little Rebecca, who had stopped her playing. She might not have quite understood it all, but tears were brimming in her big eyes to see her father so nervous and her sister so furious. You need a mother. You both do, he tried to explain to her. She is someone who can show you the ways of the world and help you find your way through society. Miss Jacobson does that well enough, Caroline snapped back. She makes us do all those lady things like samplers and tea time and being proper. Why would we ever need a mother? There are things that only a mother can do that a governess can't. Lady Tara, you will find, is very kind. She will love you as her own children. Granny loves us as her own. Isn't that good enough? Rebecca started in. Instantly, Caroline turned on her sister and hushed her. Granny? Grimshaw asked, looking between the two of them. Caroline was shooting daggers at her sister and Rebecca was looking at the floor, shamed that she had said something she wasn't supposed to. Tell me now. Grimshaw ordered in his demanding voice. She lives in the cottage in the village, Caroline said softly. Mrs. McCarthy. McCarthy, Grimshaw repeated, folding his arms across his chest. How would you have occasion to see Mrs. McCarthy, let alone be on such friendly terms with her as to call her Granny? 
Miss Jacobson has been taking us to her cottage every week. It was supposed to be a secret. She has been taking you two to the village, to McCarthy's house, without my knowledge. And she told you to keep it a secret? Grimshaw was boiling with rage. If he had ever thought he could have loved Miss Jacobson, he had no idea why. She was clearly a deceitful siren that had entrapped his daughters in her snare. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. We wanted to keep it a secret, so it would be a Christmas present, Rebecca tried to explain. What sort of a present? Were you going to surprise me with the gift of months of lies? He bellowed. She has been our art tutor, Rebecca mumbled with a tear falling down her cheek. She lets us practice tea with her too, and she had little kittens I get to play with. Grimshaw softened his expression. He had no reason to be mad at his girls. They had trusted their governess when she had encouraged them to keep the truth of the matter from him. And I suppose while you were taking lessons with Mrs. McCarthy. Miss Jacobson is visiting with her son, he said more to himself as he paced the room again. He rarely comes, Caroline said. Indeed, Grimshaw retorted, only seeing the affirmation of the gentleman's presence during these secret trips. You girls may go to Abigail. You are done with school for the day. I will be having words with Miss Jacobson. Are you cross, Father? Caroline asked. We only meant it to be a nice surprise. We worked so hard on our watercolours we thought you would like it that way. He forced himself to take a long breath. He leaned down to his girl's level and took one in each of his hands. I am not cross with you. Neither of you did anything wrong. Miss Jacobson went against my wishes in taking you. I will need to have words with her over that fact. He stood back up and ushered the girls to go through the door and into the nursery. Rebecca turned around, tears still spilling from her eyes. Father, don't be mad at Miss Jacobson. I love her so, she whimpered. He tightened his fists at his side. How this woman had bewitched his children. He said nothing but did his best to nod his understanding in an encouraging way. Hannah was surprised when the door to the schoolroom opened and both girls came in upset. She ran to their sides and hugged them each to her. Is something the matter? she asked the girls, though neither one could answer at first. I'm sorry, Miss Jacobson, Rebecca finally choked out between spilling tears. I told the secret. Hannah's blood ran cold at the child's words. Miss Jacobson, Lord Grimshaw's voice boomed from the doorway. I would like a word with you in my office right away. He didn't wait for a reply just simply stormed away, slamming the outer schoolroom door behind him. Hannah jumped at the action. It is all right, she cooed to the girls who began to truly sob from the start of the door slamming. He said you weren't meant to take us to the village. Caroline choked between cries. And he is right. Forgive me for including you in something that should not have been done. It was wrong of me. Will father send you away? Rebecca choked. I'm not sure, Hannah said, as the panic started to well deep inside her. But no matter what happens, I promise you the two of you will be just fine. Hannah hugged each girl before coming to stand and passing off the girls to their nurse. She did her best to smooth out her skirts before leaving the sanctuary of the nursery to meet the waiting earl below in his office. She stood outside his door and listened in for any sound that might give her an idea of what to expect. The sound of his thumping boots pacing the floor muted all other noise away. She guessed that wasn't a good sign. Softly, she knocked on the door and the order to enter was given. Hannah did her best to hold her head up high as she came to stand before the Earl. Normally when she entered this room he was behind his desk, but today he was pacing in front of the hearth. She stood before him and he towered over her with his seething anger. Tell me it isn't true. Tell me it is all a cruel joke. Please tell me that, because I could see no other reason why my girls would claim that you have been taking them to see McCarthy. Hannah kept her eyes fixed on the rug at their feet. I cannot say it is a lie because it isn't. We have gone at least once a week these past several months for the girls to receive art instructions from Mrs. McCarthy. What a strange thing to do, 
he huffed through his nostrils, since I hired you to be a whole educator to my daughters. Not to mention the fact that I explicitly told you not to go to the village without my presence. I know you're upset, Hannah started. Upset! Upset! Grimshaw bellowed. He threw his arms into the air. Upset, I'm afraid, Miss Jacobson. Doesn't even begin to describe what I'm feeling. You went behind my back, and you roped my daughters into your husband hunting schemes. My what? Hannah retorted, flabbergasted. You heard me quite clearly. You only went to see that old widow so that you could make a connection with her son, Matthew McCarthy. The girls even told me he would be there. Just a moment, Hannah said, putting hands on her hips. It is true that I took the girls to the village each week for art lessons against your wishes and without your permission. I convinced them not to tell you on the grounds that I knew you would behave in this bearish manner. Never did I have any other intentions than to bring company to a lonely old woman. Yet her son was present, wasn't he? Grimshaw countered. On very few occasions, yes, he was there. He rarely sees Mrs. McCarthy, and even when he did, he didn't stay long. I had no intentions towards him nor him to me. She wasn't completely sure about that last part, but as the man had not said anything outright on the matter, she figured it was a good conclusion to come to. I don't care how you rationalise things in your own mind, Grimshaw retorted. The fact of the matter is you disobeyed me, you encouraged my children to keep secrets from me, and you have shown to have a flawed character full of deception and dishonesty. I have no choice but to terminate your employment. Hannah's jaw fell open and she took several shocked steps back. I can't believe I didn't think, Hannah stammered. No, you didn't think. Grimshaw retorted, still full of rage. I will give you two weeks to secure travel and accommodation wherever it is you plan to go, Grimshaw said, turning his back to her and leaning over the cold hearth. Hannah stood there a few moments longer, still trying to process it all. She couldn't believe what was happening. What was she going to do now? May I at least continue to instruct the girls until I leave? Hannah finally asked. Grimshaw stood up from the hearth and turned to her surprised by her request. Fine, he said after a beat, but I will require that Abigail be present at any time you are in their company. Hannah nodded and a tear escaped down her cheek. She left the room as fast as her skirts would allow and went straight to the safety of her own bedroom with the door properly locked. She couldn't blame the Earl for being mad. She couldn't even fault him for firing her. She had done wrong. She had been deceitful but all Hannah had wanted to do was bring some joy to an old, lonely woman. Why was that so wrong? Now she had two weeks left with the precious girls, and then what? Where would she go? There was no possibility for her to secure another post at this time of year. Fall was already beginning to turn into winter. Even if she had a reference from the Earl, which she was sure she wouldn't, how would she find another position to take her? She couldn't bring herself to return to her family home. Her parents struggled so much as it was. To give them another adult mouth to feed would be cruel. Her gut turned inward on her as she thought this over. What would her family do this winter without her income to supplement theirs? She had nowhere to go, and unlike the last time she fled from a governess job, she had no savings to fall back on. She had given every coin she had between her family and granny. She would scarcely have enough to pay for the fare back to London. What was she to do then? It would be cold with winter coming close behind and nowhere to live. Hannah crumpled onto her bed. Her life had never seemed so destitute until this very moment. She was sure that what would make the cold and the hunger all the worse was the memories of the happiness she had here at Brighton Abbey and how she had ruined it all. 22. It only took five minutes after Hannah Jacobson left his office for the Earl of Grimshaw to completely and utterly regret his actions. He had been angry, and yes, rightly so, but he had lost control. He had lost it because he had been filled with jealousy. The idea that she had any interest in Matthew McCarthy made him sick to his stomach. He wasn't sure if he could even trust the words she told him. 
had she merely been visiting an old lonely woman as she claimed? How could he trust any words that came out of her mouth ever again? Nothing could compare to the utter self-loathing he felt later that night at dinner when he had to inform the girls that Miss Jacobson would be leaving in two weeks' time. Rebecca said nothing, simply burst into tears and cried uncontrollably until Abigail was called to take her back to the nursery. Caroline was worse. She said nothing, just simply sat there. When Rebecca left, she followed behind without so much as a good night. The Earl told himself, however, all would be well with the arrival of Lord and Lady Waldron and their daughter. Lady Tara expressed interest in his girls, after all. She would be a great companion and a distraction to them. Much to the Earl's surprise that distraction came much sooner than he anticipated. Only four days after the letter reached London, he found a response returned to him, and by that evening the Marlowe family themselves had arrived. He suspected that they had literally dropped everything at the invitation and left that instant. Grimshaw found that all a little off-putting, but did his best to think nothing of it. Unfortunately, things only seemed to get worse from there. How lovely that you would bring your girls down before dinner. Will they be reciting their lessons for us before they go to bed? Lady Tara said, seated in the drawing room. Hannah who had done everything in her power to steer clear of the Earl since her termination, stood with both girls dressed for dinner and standing before the new guests. They are to join us for supper, Lord Grimshaw said, a little perplexed by the need for explanation. Of course he knew it wasn't common for children to attend dinner parties, but he assumed since this visit was a clear declaration of his intentions that they would be treated like family. Children at dinner? Lady Waldron gasped, scandalised. I've never heard of such a thing. Yes, Lady Tara said, coming up next to Grimshaw and locking her arm into his. I don't think it is a very good idea, Grimshaw. They couldn't possibly know how to behave properly, and my poor mother has no stomach for impropriety. You will find they are very proper and respectful little girls, Grimshaw countered. Both girls' gazes fell to the carpet, embarrassed. Hannah put a protective arm around each of them to bring them comfort. Lady Tara simply stared up at Lord Grimshaw with her black eyes full of expectancy. I suppose for the time being they can take their meals in the nursery, he said half-heartedly. As it should be, my dear, Lady Tara said, rewarding him with a dazzling smile. Come along, girls, Hannah said softly turning them around to leave the drawing room. Hannah and Grimshaw's eyes only met once. In the pools of her blue eyes, he saw the disappointment that he had not championed for his children's cause. He told himself that it had been unorthodox in the first place. It was also very natural to have changes to routine with the introduction of a new member of the family. He was certain they would understand when they got to know Lady Tara better. She had assured him over the season that she found children to be a joy and had spoken often about how she anticipated meeting his girls some day. It did seem true that her mother had little taste for things out of the ordinary. Grimshaw was sure once he was married and Lord and Lady Waldron were returned back to their own home, things would go back to the way they once were. A week after the Marlowe family arrived at Brighton Abbey and just two days before Hannah was required to leave, Lady Tara took her first interest in Lord Grimshaw's two daughters. It was as much a surprise to the girls as it was to Hannah when Lady Tara walked into the schoolroom unannounced and informed the children that they would be joining her for tea downstairs. Though Hannah had yet to find anything to like in Lady Tara during their sparse interactions over the last week, she was sure that there must have been some good for the Earl to invite her to his county seat. For the benefit of the girls, who too got the feeling of something off-putting, Hannah kept on her brave face and did her best to encourage and excite them for their afternoon with Lady Tara. I would much rather go to Granny's house, Rebecca moaned. I know, dear. Hannah tried to comfort her by patting the girl's silky brown hair. It's been weeks since we've been to see her. What if she is sick or in need of help? Caroline chimed in. She has Mr. McCarthy to look after her. 
Both girls looked up at their governess with big brown disbelieving eyes. I know he is not always the most attentive to her. But I am sure he is there for her when it really counts. Hannah had a hard time believing the words she was saying any more than the girls could. And anyway, Granny is in good health and has good strength. She's got along fine for many years without our visits. I am sure she will get on fine a little while longer till you can go see her again. But when will that be? Father is sending you away and we will have no one left to take us. We will lose you and Granny all at once, Caroline cried. Oh, hush now, Hannah said, folding the child into her arms. You will not lose either of us. You are doing so well at your handwriting now that we may write to each other as often as you like. Do you promise? Caroline asked, looking up at her with a sniff of her nose. Hannah hesitated. She, of course, would love to correspond with the girl forever. She had grown to love both Caroline and Rebecca as if they were her own girls. Two great problems lay in the way of that, however. Firstly, there was still the fact that in two days' time she would leave Brighton Abbey and have nowhere to go. How could she promise to correspond with the girl when she would have no address to write to? Secondly, was the Earl himself. She was sure that he would never let his daughters continue a connection with her after what had transpired between the two of them. I will do all that is in my power to make it so, Hannah finally settled on, before giving the girls a hug and sending them off with Abigail to attend to Lady Tara. She sat down in the chair by the fire. So much stress had weighed her down these past weeks it was hard for her to keep up the facade of smiles for their sake. To make matters worse, now that the whole house knew of her termination, Mr. Poole had become an even bigger harassment in her life. When the Earl returned to Brighton Abbey, he had limited his nightly visits outside her door to just once or twice a week. She had thought that the Earl's presence in the house had deterred him once and for all. With the news of her imminent departure, Mr. Poole had moved beyond brazen action. Every night he stood outside her door, Sometimes he would just pull on the handle, hoping that the motion would set the lock free, she supposed. Other nights he would stand there for hours at a time and speak to her. It was a horrible thing to be woken up to. He would call her name over and over and say horrible foul things he wished to do to her. She was beginning to wonder if her virtue was truly worth the sanity he was slowly wearing down. It was in this chair that Hannah, most accidentally, slipped off to sleep while the girls were off to their tea. It was with a sudden jolt that she awoke. So used to the sound rousing her from sleep being a frightening one, she leapt from her chair, dazed and confused. Much to her surprise, she was not alone in her bed with Poole outside, as she had imagined in her sudden stirring, but instead still in the schoolroom. The sound that roused her was the clicking of the girl's slippers on the hallway floor hurrying towards her. How was it? Hannah asked, smoothing her hair and skirt. She had long since removed the cumbersome cap. There was no point for it now. Dreadful, Caroline said, coming to sit in the opposite chair with a fluff of fabric. Oh, it couldn't have been all that bad. Lady Tara seemed very kind to me. Hannah did her best to say without giving way to her true feelings. We went down to the drawing room, mother's drawing room, Caroline explained. She was sitting in mother's chair. Rebecca told her that was where our mother sat, and she said. Tears began to well in her eyes. She said that it was the right place for her then, because she was to be our mother now. Hannah held the child to her while she cried yet again. The poor dears were having such a hard run at life these days that it made Hannah ache and wish she could take it all away. Perhaps she meant it in a happy way and you only misunderstood. Perhaps she was trying to say that she would be happy to love and look after such beautiful girls. I don't think so, Rebecca cried, clinging to Hannah's skirts with her own tears. She even yelled at me. Whatever for? Hannah asked, not knowing these girls to do anything to cause a harsh reprimand, well except for the Mr Whiskers incident. I brought my doll with me and sat her down to tea with us. She said that it was babyish and that proper little girls left their toys in the nursery, Rebecca half muffled into Hannah's skirts. That was quite the last straw for Hannah, as far as Lady Tara was concerned. 
How that woman could say such cruel things to two little angels who were already in a delicate condition was beyond her understanding. No matter her personal feelings, however, she would not share them with the girls. There was a very good chance that no matter their feelings towards Lady Tara or Lady Tara's feelings towards them, she was going to be the future lady of this house. The sooner they found a way to endure her, the better. Hannah would not fuel their dislike of the lady, no matter how justified it was. I am sure she was only nervous to spend time with the two of you. Give Lady Tara a chance and perhaps you will find that you like her very much. I don't want to give her a chance. I will never like her. I don't want to see her ever again. Caroline burst out before running from the room in a fit of tears to her bed in the nursery. 23. The Earl of Grimshaw was beside himself with grief and confusion. The whole purpose of bringing Lady Tara into his life was for the benefit of his children. Now he was receiving news that after an afternoon together, Caroline was inconsolably upset and Rebecca had been reduced to tears. Did something go wrong? Grimshaw asked Lady Tara. No, my dear, she said in her high voice. He really didn't like it when she used such a term of endearment. We had a lovely afternoon drinking tea. I am not sure at all why they would be upset. They left the drawing room happy enough. Although, she continued as if the idea had just come to her, they did go straight back up to that governess of yours. Grimshaw perked up and bristled all at once at the mention of Miss Jacobson. The only way he had gotten through these last two weeks was to not think about her as much as could be helped. I don't want to presume anything, of course, but you did mention her termination was due to trust issues. Is it really wise to continue to have her teach the girls in such a situation? Who knows what thoughts she could be putting in their head? No, Grimshaw waved his hand in dismissal. Her termination has no bearing on her ability to teach the girls. She cares for them deeply and would never do anything that might upset them. But she can't be happy having lost this position. Perhaps she is influencing them against me as a way to get back at you. Lady Tara droned on as if the idea was positively horrible to her. Grimshaw rose from his seat and paced the room as he thought the matter over. A stray dark lock of hair fell in his face and he pushed it away in irritation. He was sure there was no way that Hannah Jacobson would do such a dirty, underhanded thing to the girls, even if it was to punish him. I will go talk to Caroline, he said finally. I am sure it is all just a big misunderstanding that will be sorted out by dinner. Oh, I am relieved to hear that, Lady Tara said with a whoosh of breath. I would hate to think that your girls did not like me. They do like you, Grimshaw insisted. How could they not? Perhaps if things were made official, they would not be so confused with this visit, Lady Tara said as she picked a thread off of the top of her linen dress. Grimshaw hesitated. He was not used to women being so forward, nor was he ready to make anything official. Let me go talk to Caroline, he reassured the lady, before excusing himself from the drawing room. Grimshaw bounded the stairs two at a time and went straight for the nursery. There he found Caroline lying on her bed, red-eyed and still sniffling. What happened today? Grimshaw asked softly, as he came to sit next to his daughter on her trundle bed. She is horrible, father, Caroline said between sniffs. Is she? Or did someone tell you that she was? He added rather reluctantly. Caroline rolled over in her bed and sat up, looking her father straight in the eyes. Though she had the soft features of her mother, Grimshaw could clearly see his own face in hers. No one needed to tell me. She was mean and cruel, and she made Rebecca cry. I think you should just give her another chance, Grimshaw retorted. He was relieved to hear that Miss Jacobson wasn't turning their minds against his prospective wife. He hadn't put much stock in the idea, but had to ask nonetheless. She doesn't have any children of her own he tried to explain. Nor was she lucky enough to have a sibling like you. She may be new to being around children and not always say the right thing, but I promise you she is trying. I don't think so, Caroline said, laying back down on the bed. She despises us. Not at all, Grimshaw countered. 
She has told me herself how excited she was to meet the two of you. She has high hopes that you all will someday be great friends. I don't want to, Caroline said like a petulant child. Grimshaw rose his voice to the tone that told his children that he meant business. Caroline, there is a very good chance that we will be seeing a lot more of Lady Tara, so I suggest you resign yourself to that fact. She is trying to be your friend. I don't think it is asking too much of you to do the same. Caroline buried her head in her pillow and cried tears of frustration as her father stormed out of the room. He couldn't understand what had gotten into the child for her to be so stubbornly against Lady Tara. Perhaps the lady had said something wrong, some sort of misunderstanding. Children were literal creatures. A simple phrase may have put Caroline off and upset Rebecca. As he strolled down the hall into his own room to change for dinner, he reassured himself for the millionth time that this was the right course to take. Caroline and Rebecca were going to need a motherly figure, someone who could help them navigate society. Lady Tara had been a very involved member of the Ton, and her connections would be to his girl's benefit when they were older. Perhaps Caroline was just upset now because she worried that he was replacing the mother she lost. If he could only find a way to explain to his daughter that he would never allow another woman into his heart as Anne had been to him. Even when one had somehow found a way in, he had fought it off. After all, that was why Lady Tara was here in the first place. With the lady at his side, Anne's place would be secured and he could forget all about Hannah Jacobson. Hannah had chosen to take all her meals either with the girls in the schoolroom or in her own room. It was not hard to do so with the arrival of Lord Grimshaw's guests. With the girls banished from his dining table, there was no point to her presence. She was just coming up the stairs with a tray in hand from the kitchen below when a loud, raucous noise caught her attention. Setting down her tray on a hall table, she walked towards the front of the house where the frantic cries came from. Lord Grimshaw, Mrs Brennan said, bursting into the drawing room. Grimshaw, who had been standing by the piano to listen to Lady Tara play before dinner, looked to his housekeeper in shock. Forgive the intrusion, but you must see this right away, Mrs Brennan said, completely frazzled and waving a parchment in her hand. All right, he said trying to infuse some calm into the woman. Let's take it out here, he motioned for her to step outside the drawing room. Lady Waldron was already fanning herself from the shock of the rude entry, and Lord Waldron had the smelling salts at the ready, should any other improper occurrence send his wife into fits. In the hall he was greeted by Abigail, who was beside herself. What is ever the matter? Abigail tried to speak, but nothing but choked sobs escaped her lips. It's Caroline, Mrs Brennan said. She is missing. Hannah entered the foyer just as these words were spoken. Her heart instantly jumped into her throat and she rushed forward, forgetting all the enmity between her and the Earl. Caroline is what? Hannah asked in a panicked tone. Give me that letter, Grimshaw demanded, his own fear showing on his face. Dear father, I am sorry to inform you that I have run away. Most sincerely yours, that Lady Caroline Blackburn. The Earl read the short note out loud before looking to Hannah in worry. I would not doubt that she put the idea in Lady Caroline's head, Lady Tara's voice called from behind the Earl. All parties turned to see that she had followed Grimshaw out of the drawing room and was accusing Hannah of Caroline's disappearance. I would never condone a child to leave her home, especially in the dark and cold. Oh, Lord Grimshaw, Hannah said, as the worries came flooding over her. What if she got lost on her way? On her way? On her way to where? See, Lady Tara said smugly, she knows where the child is because she was the one to give her the idea. I know where she is because I know where she would go being this upset. Where? Lord Grimshaw urged, reaching forward to gently grasp Hannah's elbow. He looked deep into her eyes with the plea of a worried father. She shared his concern and dismissed all anger from Lady Tara's accusations. To Granny's, of course, Hannah said softly. I will go and fetch her, she added more determinedly. No, I will go, Grimshaw said now that he had a destination in mind. Mrs Brennan, 
go and tell the stable boy to ready my horse. Forgive me, Lord Grimshaw, but it would be better if I go, Hannah said softly. She will be upset. I will stay the night with her at Granny's and talk things over with her. Eight years old is the start of a very emotional age in her life. I think this matter should be handled delicately. And I cannot do that, he said a little offended. You can be a little, Hannah hesitated. Heavy-handed and overbearing at times, she said in all honesty. I think it would be best if I talk to her and we return together in the morning. Grimshaw thought this over. He was reminded of their argument earlier. He had gone to soothe Caroline and had only made her more upset. Hannah was right that he probably wasn't the best candidate for a sensitive approach. Fine, but I will take you there myself and see that Caroline is at Mrs. McCarthy's and safe. Then I will return in the morning to collect you both, Grimshaw said with finality. Go and get your things and we can leave. There is nothing I need that is so important not to leave right now, Hannah said. Her greatest fear was that Carolyn might get lost in the dark walking on the road. What if she went the wrong way and got hurt? The sooner she was at Mrs. McCarthy's cottage and saw Carolyn safe by the old woman's hearth, the better. He nodded in silent understanding of her urgency, for he felt it too and was, in fact, grateful for her sense of propriety in the matter. Grimshaw, Lady Tara called as the other two started to make their way out of the house. What about dinner? What am I to tell mother and father? Lady Tara, this is an emergency. My daughter could be lost or hurt or worse. I am sure you can find a way to give them my condolences on missing the night's meal, Grimshaw said, before turning without another thought for the woman. When the two got outside, there were already two steeds saddled and ready for them. Both mounted silently, and Hannah took the lead to show him the way to Mrs. McCarthy's house. They took the road painfully slow despite being on horseback, only so that if Caroline was still out there, they could find her. The night air was far beyond chilled, and Hannah fretted over knowing that Caroline could be wandering alone outside. Even if she made it to Granny's house, would she have prepared properly against the cold? What if she became sick from the cold winter night air? Finally, they reached Granny's house with no answer to the call of Caroline's name on the road. Hannah gave a sigh of relief when she saw through the cottage window Granny and Caroline cosy in front of the hearth with a little kitty in her hand. She is inside, Hannah called back to Grimshaw, who was just behind her. I can see her. Hannah dismounted her horse and tied it to a stake outside the house. Granny, with her hawk eyes, noticed her coming and was at the door before Hannah was even done securing the reins. I will come for you both in the morning, Grimshaw reiterated as he hesitated to leave. Hannah simply waved him off, for she had little care but to go in the house and see that Caroline was safe. She rushed through Granny's open door and into the small front room. She fell on to Caroline, hugging and kissing her. Grimshaw hesitated before leaving. He wanted to make sure that no harm had befallen his child. He watched through the window as Hannah inspected the girl over before hugging and kissing her head again. He breathed a sigh of relief. Surely she was safe and well. His last image was of the two girls in a tight embrace, the poor kitten desperate to escape the trap between them, with tears streaming down both sets of cheeks. 24. After Hannah was reassured that Caroline was in fact whole and without injury, they didn't speak on the matter again for the rest of the night. Instead, they stayed by the warmth of the fire while Caroline played with the kitten and Granny told tales from when she was a little girl. Hannah knew that it was just what Caroline had needed. Though the child probably didn't know it herself, she wasn't running away but in fact running too. She was running to the safety and comfort of a place and a woman who loved her wholly and unconditionally. That was what Caroline needed that night, so that was what Hannah made sure she received. Both Hannah and Caroline slept on makeshift beds by the hearth, and it was the first sound sleep that Hannah had had as long as she could remember. She woke to the feel of the chill from the cold hearth and rose to get wood to get it going again. I think I might be out. Granny whispered, so as not to wake up Caroline, who was still fast asleep. 
There is some by the shed. I'll go pop out and get it. Don't trouble yourself, Hannah said, standing and stretching the sleep out of her joints. I would be happy to do it. I'll get a nice big pile going for you here by the fireplace, so you won't have to go out into the cold much more. Thank you, dear, Granny said with a smile. My husband was always good about keeping wood in the house. With him gone, it's hard for me to keep up with it all, she added with a wistful sigh. I'm sure Matty will be by some day soon and will see to me. Hannah smiled a reassuring comfort to the lady, though as she walked out in the crisp morning air, she was less sure that Matthew McCarthy had any care for the well-being of his mother. As Hannah stepped out the back door of the cottage, she heard the distinct crunch of ice. Looking down, she saw that a soft dusting of ice had frozen to the ground. The whole world around her was an icicle wonderland, and she guessed that meant snow wasn't far off either. She was thankful that this cold had waited just one more night. Who knew how things would have fared for Caroline if she had marched the roads in the dark with this temperature in the air? She listened to the soft crunch of her feet and the sound of the birds waking as she made her trips to and fro between the pile of wood and the hearth in the house. An hour later, Caroline was awake and eating breakfast by its warm glow, and Hannah no longer felt the cold outside from her strenuous effort. Hannah knew that Lord Grimshaw would be arriving at any moment, and she would need to help Caroline come to terms with the new life before her. Caroline, you know what you did last night was wrong? Hannah asked as they sat at the table. I don't want to go back, Caroline said sulkily. I want to stay here with Granny. I could take care of the kittens and help her around the cottage, Caroline suggested. That's such a lovely idea, Granny chimed in, but your father would miss you sorely. You must go back home to him, my child. But she is just awful, Caroline pleaded now with Hannah. I tried to tell father and he wouldn't listen to me. I know that she doesn't seem the greatest match for your family now, Hannah said, putting an arm around Caroline and rubbing her back gently. In all honesty, I can't say that you will ever feel differently about her, but she must make Lord Grimshaw happy or he would not have brought her to Brighton Abbey. Caroline grumbled at this, and he wouldn't pick a lady that he didn't think would also make you and Rebecca happy too. He loves you both so much, you are his whole world. Your father would never dream of doing anything that isn't right for you. I know you don't like her either, Caroline retorted as a last-ditch effort. It doesn't matter if I do or don't, does it? She is your father's choice. Let's be happy for him, huh? Though the words came out of Hannah's mouth, she couldn't feel it in her heart. She wasn't sure she could ever feel happy for Lord Grimshaw's marriage to Lady Tara. The fact that she had to say such things to Caroline tore at her heartstrings. Today was most likely going to be her final day with Caroline and Rebecca Blackburn, so she wouldn't taint that moment with her personal thoughts on the lady. She would want them to remember her as one who tried to help and lift them up, even if the prospect was looking bleak. The sounds of a carriage caught all their attentions, and silently they made ready for their departure. By the time the Grimshaw carriage had pulled up to the cottage, Cloaks were on and hugs and goodbyes were expressed to Granny. Johnson hopped down from the driver's seat, took the horse that Hannah had rode on the night before and tied it to the back of the carriage to follow behind. Grimshaw stepped out of the carriage looking like he had had little sleep and no time to shave. Hannah guessed it was the look of a father up all night worried over his daughter's happiness. Caroline didn't say a word to him but merely got into the carriage. He looked to Hannah questioningly. Just give her a little time, Hannah said to calm his fears. Hannah climbed into the carriage behind Caroline and Grimshaw followed too. Caroline stuck to Hannah's side, leaning on her for support as they took the ride back to Brighton Abbey in silence. Perhaps it was because Caroline too remembered this was to be Hannah's last day at the estate. Or perhaps it was because she knew in Hannah's shadow her father would not press her. But either way she would not leave the side of her governess upon their return. Finally, rather reluctantly, Caroline was ushered to Abigail and Hannah was left on her own. 
The Earl, also with a heavy weight on his mind, went straight from the carriage to the closed doors of his office. It left Hannah a bit in limbo in the middle of the foyer. No doubt she was to go to her room and prepare to leave that very day. The problem was, she still had nowhere to go, nor any means to get there. Hannah thought back to the sound of the crunching ice under her feet that morning. What was she to do now with winter coming in earnest, and no prospects of shelter over her head? As much as she regretted the thought as it came to her, she knew there would be only one course of action. It was something she would have rather never had to do, but nothing could be done for it. She would have to stand before the Earl and beg him to let her stay on in any capacity possible, at least until the coldest parts of winter passed. 25. Hannah knew where she would find the Earl. After breakfast, he often retired to his office to see to any work he might have. After seeing to any paperwork, he would spend his afternoon with his guests instead of working in the West Wing, as he had been doing in the past. Hannah needed to speak with him alone. She was sure if she waited too long, he would be with his guests and she would be forced to grovel in front of all of them. Standing outside the office door, Hannah leaned her ear against the wood to hear for any sound. She could hear the subtle sound of a quill scratching on paper. Taking a step back from the door, she smoothed out her skirts and took a long, deep breath. Raising one hand that only slightly quivered, she knocked softly on the door. She opened it when bade to enter and was surprised to see Lord Grimshaw wasn't alone in the room. Seated across from him, looking far too small in the massive chair, was Caroline. I don't want to interrupt anything, Hannah said quickly. I just wondered if I might have a word with you at some point today. Now is fine, Grimshaw said, leaning back in his chair. Caroline, you may go join your sister in the nursery now. I hope you will consider what we have talked about today, Grimshaw added when the repentant little girl stood up. Hannah gave her pupil a weak smile and hoped that he hadn't been too hard on her for her escapade the night before. Please take a seat, Grimshaw said as the door slowly closed, leaving them in privacy. I think I would do better to stand, Hannah said with only a slight quiver to her voice. He studied her with his dark eyes, trying to seek out the reason for her nervous behaviour. Hannah sucked in one long breath and then let all her words rush out on the exhale. I know that my termination of employment is effective today. Unfortunately, I have been unable to secure any sort of accommodation elsewhere. I understand that you may already have a replacement governess, and that I no longer am acceptable to work in that capacity for you. I wonder if you might allow me some lodging, until I am able to secure otherwise. I'm sure by the spring at the very latest. I would be happy to work any way you deem appropriate for payment. The Earl's dark eyebrows had raised at the beginning of her speech in surprise, but by the end of it, a soft smirk brushed against his square jaw. Miss Jacobson, please take a seat, he motioned with his hand. Hannah hesitated for only a second. Was he smiling because he was going to enjoy denying her the request? She didn't expect a serious man like Lord Grimshaw would be so happy to carry the burden of her in his household longer. Nonetheless, she walked forward and took the chair that Caroline had left vacant. Caroline and I had a very long talk since returning home from Concordshire, Grimshaw said, lacing his fingers in front of him. It seems I owe a great debt to you. Caroline was reluctant to listen to my urgings, but you, Miss Jacobson, seem to have the magic touch to get through to her. I'm not at all sure what you said to her, but Caroline has decided to give Lady Tara a chance, and I thank you for that, he finished softly. I'm glad I could help. I know big changes can't be easy on one so young. Yes, I dare say it's hard on all of us, Grimshaw said with a distant look to his eyes. But in light of the recent event, I believe I acted too hasty before, you clearly care for my girls and keep their best interests at the heart of your intentions. What are you saying? Hannah asked, so as to make sure there was no miscommunication. I am saying I rather hoped that you would stay on as governess. And, he added hesitantly, that you would forgive me for losing my temper as I did. 
Hannah put her hands to her mouth in surprise and did her best to hold back the tears. Only moments ago, she was looking at a life with no chance of employment and no way to take care of herself. Now she again had a roof over her head, and what's more, was given a second chance to end this job on good terms. You don't know how much that would mean to me, she said softly so as to control her emotion. I can't wait to tell the girls. Oh, this is so wonderful. Thank you so much, Hannah continued. Please, it is I who should thank you. This morning with Caroline I saw how much she has grown and blossomed under your care. You do me a great service by staying. Grimshaw smiled, satisfied that at least he didn't have to worry about finding another governess. Although, he added with a warning tone, I must ask you keep to my requests. If you go into the village to see your Mrs. McCarthy, I would like to also be present. I can make myself available to fit around the schedule you have already made with the widow. Thank you, Lord Grimshaw. That is most kind of you. I know the girls, Caroline especially, will be relieved to know they can visit with her again. Yes, she must have truly taken to the widow to run to her last night. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Yes, I believe they are cut from the same cloth, Hannah mused. They have a lot in common and Granny makes a good womanly influence for her. Grimshaw's mind went to darker thoughts at the mention of a role model. Lady Tara was supposed to be that womanly influence on his girls. In fact, it was the sole purpose that he had brought her to Brighton Abbey for. He had no enjoyment in the thought of marrying the lady. He did it only for his girls. Now, he was torn by the fact that they, themselves, fought against the idea of a motherly figure to take care of them. Caroline had expounded in detail the afternoon tea she had with Lady Tara that led to her leaving Brighton Abbey. He would have liked to tell himself that perhaps there was a misunderstanding somewhere in the interactions his daughter had with the lady, but he couldn't seem to find a logical explanation for one. Lady Tara had spoken repeatedly about her love of children back in London. She had also seemed heartily interested when he spoke of his daughters. He couldn't see that to be the case by the way Caroline explained her actions yesterday afternoon. Is something the matter, Lord Grimshaw? Hannah asked, noticing the dimness to his eyes. He shook his head as if to physically remove the melancholy. It's all just a bit more difficult than I expected, he finally said softly. I am sure the girls will warm up to her, Hannah said, though it was an uncomfortable feeling to encourage Lord Grimshaw in a relationship with Lady Tara. He reached into his pocket and pulled out the envelope that he had taken to keeping with him now at all times. I am concerned that they won't, he said, staring down at his late wife's handwriting. Even so, it is your choice. Caroline and I spoke over the matter. She agreed it is more important that you have your happiness. Grimshaw looked at her, surprised by her words. I'm not happy with her. In fact, I can't stand her, he said blatantly. What? Hannah said, shocked by his words. She spoke of loving children so much, wanting to have some of her own to take care of, all throughout our time in London. I thought she would be a good match for the girls. I understand where your desire comes from to see them taken care of well, but would it not be better to find a woman you have affection for? Grimshaw stared at her long and hard. He was sure that the pools of her blue eyes could tell what was being said in his mind. It was her that he cared for deeply. I could never, he said softly, replacing the envelope. I couldn't bear to do that to Anne. Your late wife? Hannah asked softly. All Grimshaw did was nod, looking down into his hands. I am sure she would be happy for you if you did find someone you could love. Perhaps, she said as much herself, he said with a wistful smile that faded quickly. I could never do that, though. It would be like a betrayal. Hannah didn't know what to say. She could certainly appreciate the complexity of the situation and could plainly see the turmoil that it caused him. I thought if I found someone who would love my children as their own, 
I would do right by Anne's request to remarry. I figured that was what she meant by it anyway. It would be all the better to be a woman that I could never have romantic feelings for. That way I could always be true to her. But do you honestly think Lady Grimshaw would be happy knowing you went through your life miserable for her sake? Hannah paused before continuing in a gentle tone. Caroline only shared a few memories she had of her mother with me. But from what I have learned of Lady Grimshaw, she was a kind woman. She would want you to be happy too. Grimshaw was surprised that Caroline had spoken to Miss Jacobson about her mother. He was more surprised she had any memories to speak of. She was so little when her mother had died and Grimshaw rarely ever talked about her due to the emotions it would bring up. He thought Miss Jacobson's words over. He knew she was right. Anne was too kind a person to ever ask anyone to suffer on her account. I suppose it doesn't matter now. Nothing can be done about it. What do you mean? Hannah asked, trying her best to hide the feeling of her stomach dropping to the floor. Had the Earl already made arrangements for marriage to Lady Tara? She hoped for Caroline and Rebecca's sake. That wasn't the case. My intentions were clear enough when I asked the Marlows to come for the holidays. It will be expected now. But not said, Hannah asked again with relief. He leaned back in his chair and studied her. Hannah was sure her face was giving way to her inner emotions. No, he said softly, boring into her eyes with his own. Not said yet, but expected nonetheless. I won't presume to give you advice on a matter I could not understand fully myself. As a woman who loves Caroline and Rebecca, however, I might give a suggestion on how Lady Grimshaw might feel about a connection to Lady Tara for their sake. And what would that be, Miss Jacobson? Don't. They are wise enough to realise you are suffering on their behalf. Even if Lady Tara does warm up to the girls, and perhaps she will, I worry that it will still cause a great rift between you and them. You have such a wonderful relationship with your children. Far better than most. They need the love of their father far more than the affection of a woman. Grimshaw thanked her for her words. It certainly gave him quite a bit to think on. She left him in his office to his own musing for the rest of the morning, while Hannah went to tell the girls the news that she would stay. Though Grimshaw tried to resign himself to suffering a marriage for his children's benefit, he knew that Miss Jacobson was right. Anne would not be pleased, and if Lady Tara never warmed to the girls, they would certainly resent him for her presence. There was one thing, however, that stayed ever present in his mind as Grimshaw thought the matter over. Hannah Jacobson loved the girls. She loved them as if they were her own. Clearly the feeling was mutual as well as Caroline opened up to her in ways that she never did even for him. He let himself muse over Miss Jacobson all the afternoon whilst Lady Tara played the piano and Lord Waldron talked to him of politics. His feelings for her were no secret in his mind. He thought he saw hints that she too had some feelings for him. He couldn't be sure, though, she could possibly just have a great love for his daughters. There was also the interloping with David Poole to consider. Grimshaw was sure he would get no peace until he knew the matter for sure. 26. Lord Grimshaw knew what he had to do to put his mind at ease. He was never one for playing games. He would go to Hannah Jacobson and ask her straight out if she had feelings for him. It was unorthodox, to be sure, but he had to know, and this was the surest way to find out. Unfortunately, he still had guests to entertain, and that took him well into the night. Frustrated by the incessant chatter of Lady Waldron and Lady Tara, he was put in a sour mood indeed. Though it didn't seem proper to go to Miss Jacobson's room so late at night, he knew he could not find peace until he found out the truth of the matter for himself. It was close to midnight when his guests finally retired and Grimshaw made his way to the far side of the East Wing, where Miss Jacobson resided. He was sure she would be fast asleep in bed, but he wouldn't be able to sleep himself that night unless he at least tried. With nothing but a candle to light his way, he walked the darkness, determined to resolve the matter by dawn. He stood in front of her door and listened in. Of course, there was silence on the other side. 
He was almost positive now that she was fast asleep, and this was a fool's errand he was on. Nonetheless, he softly knocked on the door. If she was awake, it was loud enough to hear, but certainly not loud enough to wake her, in the event she had already gone to bed. Surprisingly, he heard the ruffling of fabrics moving inside, and a steady voice bade him enter. He took a long, steady breath for the sake of his nerves and opened the door. Hannah Jacobson had no doubt that Mr David Poole would attempt to enter her room again this night. No doubt the news that she would be staying on as governess would reach the downstairs. She had never expected when she came to grovel at Lord Grimshaw's mercy that he would even allow her to stay, let alone reinstate her. Hannah was sure that she was on some euphoric high from the news when she determined her plan for the night. It was going to be now or never. She would not live one more night in Brighton Abbey, fearing what creatures might stalk her in the night. For this reason, when she heard the heavy footsteps headed her way, she was not only awake, but ready. Surprisingly, Mr Poole knocked softly on the door. Hannah had anticipated him attempting to get in without so much as an invitation. She shuffled herself around the bed with a candlestick in her hand. Raising it in the air to be ready when the door opened, she bade the vile fiend enter. Grimshaw, for the second time, found himself being physically attacked by the tenacious Miss Jacobson. Luckily, as her weapon swung to hit him, he dropped his candlestick, extinguishing the light and gripping what he guessed was a fire poker of some sort. You rake! You monster! Hannah yelled. She hadn't anticipated Poole catching her blow. She desperately tried to yank the candlestick out of his grasp. What is wrong with you, woman? Grimshaw's voice shot back. Hannah immediately dropped the candlestick into his hand. Lord Grimshaw? Yes, he said, exasperated and glad she had released her grip on the object. He bent down to pick up his candle, now extinguished. Why would you tell me to come in only to attack me? Grimshaw asked in confusion, holding the object close to his face. And with a candelabra, I see. A step up from the book, I might add, he added with humour. I'm so sorry. I thought you were someone else. Yes, you keep saying that. Hannah turned and found the matches on her hearth. Lighting one, she lit the candle there and brought it to Grimshaw to light his as well. He was looking down at her, partly gauging if she was to faint again like last time. Luckily, she still had her same complexion, and instead of fear, she seemed alight with purpose. Perhaps you would like to tell me who you were expecting instead? Hannah pursed her lips close together. She had no desire to tell the Earl that David Poole was harassing her. He may have been kind enough to give her job back, but he clearly still didn't completely trust her. Otherwise, why else would he ask to accompany them to Mrs McCarthy's house? If she told him she was expecting Mr Poole to enter her room in the middle of the night, he would jump to his own conclusion before she would even be able to explain the reason. Grimshaw set his candle down on the nightstand and crossed his arms, looking down on her severely. Miss Jacobson, I must insist you tell me. There is something going on here and I demand to know it. Even if I did, you wouldn't believe me anyway. I shall save my breath, thank you. Please tell me what brings you to my room at this late hour and quickly. I will happily do so after you inform me who you are expecting instead of myself, Grimshaw retorted, willing to match her stubborn nature. Suddenly Hannah stilled at the sound of more approaching steps. Her eyes fell on the candlestick still in Grimshaw's hands. Recognising her thoughts, he held it farther back from her and gave her a questioning look. She instantly ran to shut the door and lock it as quietly as possible, and then blew out the candles so that they were standing again in the dark. Please, sir, Hannah whispered pleadingly. The candlestick. I believe all in company will be much safer if I hold this, he returned in his own whisper, sensing that the guest was not welcome by her actions. Grimshaw was puzzled by the whole event but he had little time to register it as the light of a candle shone beneath the door and someone attempted to open the door without even a knock. He watched as Miss Jacobson tensed for just a moment as the handle was jiggled. She took a step towards him and he couldn't help but enjoy the fact that she was leaning towards him for protection. 
What was it that she needed protection from? He was about to open the door and see for himself since she had no desire to tell him the name of this night intruder. Suddenly, he heard the clanking of keys and one being slid into the lock. Oh dear, she said under her breath. He got a key. Grimshaw turned around, keeping Miss Jacobson at his back for protection. Though he was sure he couldn't possibly need it, he lifted the candelabra into the air as several keys were tried in the lock. Finally, the clicking sound of gears turning echoed in the room, and Grimshaw stiffened, ready to meet the assailant. The door swung open and much to his surprise he found before him the shocked face of David Poole. David only hesitated a moment before turning to run. In two long steps, Grimshaw was out the door and facing the retreating figure of Poole. David Poole, I saw your face, man. Return right now or I shall have you arrested. His voice boomed down the hall and surely woke the whole house, but he didn't care. What he cared about at that moment was to know why Poole was at Hannah Jacobson's door and with a key to boot. Had he been right in his first assumption that they were interlopers? Even worse, was it a far more intimate relationship than he imagined Miss Jacobson would ever have outside of wedlock? Poole halted at the Earl's words. There would be no chance for him to run now that he was recognised. It wasn't hard to do so with his fire-red hair glowing against the candlelight even as he retreated. Lord Grimshaw, I had no idea you would. I am afraid we both have been entrapped in a very devious plot. Hannah now also exited her room and stood close by Grimshaw. Entrapped? What do you mean? Obviously Miss Jacobson asked us both to be here tonight. Normally I don't condone such immodest behaviour, Poole said using his quick wit to his advantage. I am afraid Miss Jacobson was most insistent I come to her room tonight. I was not asked to Miss Jacobson's chambers, nor would I expect her to do the same to any man. Grimshaw looked down at the woman to his side. Of course not, she said, surprised that he would even consider asking. I am afraid she is lying, Poole said with an unfortunate look to his words. She was most bewitching. I am ashamed to say she convinced me to visit her this night. I would not lie to you, sir, Poole continued. I have been a loyal member of your staff these last five years. I have never given you a reason to mistrust me. Hannah was faltering as she stood. This was why she had not spoken a word to Lord Grimshaw about Poole. She was sure he would believe the man over herself. Hannah, Grimshaw said, turning towards the lady. Tell me the truth of it, and I will believe you. Hannah searched his eyes for his sincerity, and in the dark recesses she found it. She could lose nothing by at least trying. Mr. Poole has continued to harass me since my arrival despite my attempt to stop him. I have been forced to lock myself in my room at night for safety, and cannot be alone in the house without fearing his attacks. She lies, sir, Poole said with a scoff. I highly doubt that, as I myself have been witness to her attempt to fend off an attacker, Grimshaw retorted. I have proof, sir, Poole said, reaching into his pocket. Here, a lock of hair that Miss Jacobson gave me as a symbol of her affection. He held up the golden lock in the glow of the firelight tied with a piece of twine. Grimshaw turned to Miss Jacobson for a response. Her face went white as a ghost, and for just a second he faltered in his belief of her words. He took it from me, she said weakly. I was in the garden. Mr. Poole pulled me into a corner. He held a knife to my throat so I wouldn't scream and took the lock. He could see her clenching her fist to stop from shaking, from just the simple memory of the event. He realised he knew the time well. Grimshaw had watched her with the girls in the garden. After the children left, he thought he saw her walk into a darkened corner and then Poole walk out. Now that the prejudice produced by the previous governess's actions was removed from his eyes, he realised she didn't slip into the alcove, but was pulled. It was such a little variance, but he knew it clearly as he replayed the memory in his head. His stomach hit the floor, and rage filled Grimshaw all at once. He struggled to know what emotion to stuff down and which one to allow free reign. Hannah Jacobson had lived in fear under his very own roof these past months, 
she had been tortured, tormented and threatened. Worse, she never found it safe to ask for his help. Would he have believed her had she come to him? In all honesty, he couldn't say he would have. It made him all the sicker with himself. Grimshaw narrowed his gaze on David Poole and clenched his own fists. Poole swallowed hard and took a little step back. You will leave my house this instant. I don't even want to see you stop to collect your things. I will have them sent, Grimshaw said in a deep, hard voice. If I ever see you so much as set foot on my property again, I will have you arrested. Do I make myself clear? But, Poole stammered. Yes, sir. He finally sighed with resignation. He turned to leave. Another thing, Lord Grimshaw bellowed, taking full use of his authority. He held out a hand in front of Poole. I believe you have something that belongs to Miss Jacobson. Poole walked forward tentatively, not sure if it was a trick. Setting the lock of hair into the Earl's hand, he stepped back again. The keys too, Grimshaw bellowed. He took the ring of keys from his pocket. No doubt someone who actually was trusted enough to have these would be searching for them. He would have to take them to Mrs. Brennan in the morning. Now go, Grimshaw growled. Poole couldn't meet the Earl's gaze. He simply turned and walked away. It took all Grimshaw's civility to let the fiend go and not beat him to a pulp. 27. Lord Grimshaw could scarcely look at the woman at his side. He was far too ashamed with himself. How he had allowed his governess to be harassed all without his knowledge in the safety of his own home was unforgivable. Thank you, Hannah said, putting a hand on his arm. I wasn't sure you were going to believe me. He pocketed the pilfered items and turned to the lady. He gently put one hand on either of her arms and pulled her closer to him. She followed his motion until there was just a breath between them. She arched her head up to look into the Earl's face. She could see it racked with torment and she wondered if he was again debating her worth in the house. I wish you would have told me sooner, Grimshaw finally said with a soft husk to his voice. To think how you must have lived these months, it pained him to say. He reached a hand up and let the back of his fingers brush along her jawbone. Hannah leaned into his touch unconsciously. She couldn't keep up with her own changing emotions this night. But to go from terrified over Poole's actions to complete comforting bliss at Lord Grimshaw's touch was the biggest leap for her. It hasn't all been bad, she said softly as she relished his touch. But it could have been far better. Grimshaw responded with a furrow of his dark brows. He tilted her head up ever so slightly with the tips of his fingers. She looked deeply into his dark eyes. He dipped his own head down just slightly. He wanted to kiss her, to feel her soft velvet lips against his. She was ready and waiting for it as well. Instantly his mind went to Anne and the letter. Grimshaw knew in his heart that Hannah was the one. She was the lady who would love his children as her own, who would love him as her own. He had already opened his heart to her and let her in. Try as he might to shut her out, she had come in all the same. Grimshaw still had that hesitation, however, that thought of his wife and his loyalty to her. Could he ever let himself love again and not betray his wife? The words Hannah had spoken to him had made sense at the time. Now that he was in the moment and full of passion for this woman, he wasn't so sure his late wife would condone such actions. He let his hand drop and took a step back from Miss Jacobson. She looked confused and hurt for just a second. He supposed she had fully intended that kiss too. It pained him to see her hurt and denied. It hurt more to put that distance between them when his body and mind were screaming otherwise. You came to tell me something. Hannah finally said to break the tension between them. Yes, I did, Grimshaw said solemnly. He thought it over. He had come to tell her about his feelings. Now he wasn't sure he could do that. The momentum was gone out of him. But I think there has been enough revelation for one night. I will leave it for another time, Grimshaw said. Hannah opened her mouth to protest, to encourage him to speak his mind, 
She could see there was no point to it, however. Thank you, though, he said with a soft smile. For what? Our talk today. It gave me a great deal to think over. He lifted her hand to his lips, too tempted not to do so. Grimshaw kissed it softly, and Hannah took an unconscious step forward, bringing them closer together. Good night, Miss Jacobson, he said softly. She kept her eyes on his lips as they brushed the soft skin of her hand. I hope you sleep soundly. You are safe now, he added. I will verify he has removed himself from the property right now, he reassured her. You have nothing to fear at Brighton Abbey any longer. Thank you, Hannah managed to squeeze out in a whisper. Good night. He reluctantly released her hand, and she made to re-enter her room. She paused at the door for just a moment and looked back at him. Grimshaw watched her walk away from him. It was torture to see her go without making his feelings known to her. He was rewarded, however, when she paused and glanced back at him. She smiled softly, letting those sweet dimples shine before slowly closing the door to her image. Lord Grisham settled to travelling the length of the hall to his own room. Nothing seemed to have gone the way he hoped that night, but he still couldn't be too disappointed with it. Grisham, what was that racket? A genteel female voice called. Grisham stopped in his tracks to find that just as he was passing Lady Tara's room, she poked her head out. I thought I heard shouting. She stepped out into the hall in her dressing gown. Nothing to trouble yourself over, Lady Tara. Let's just say I had a disgruntled employee, but it's all been taken care of now. Lady Tara looked down the hall towards the direction of the house he had come from. She mused she knew the only employee who would reside that way. I see, she said in a satisfied, knowing way. Grimshaw considered correcting her, but he thought better of it. He had little care for what Lady Tara thought. In the morning, he would make it clear to her that he had no intention of marrying her. Grimshaw seriously doubted she would stay long after that. He was sure of his feelings for Hannah Jacobson, but knew she would need some time to recover from her negative experience with Mr. Poole. There was also still that pesky feeling of guilt over his late wife. Miss Jacobson had made a lot of sense to him. He couldn't deny his feelings for her any longer either but he was sure he would need to find a way to come to terms with his feelings towards his late wife before he could actually see a future with anyone else. In a very strange and backward way, David Poole's interruption that night had been providential. His feelings for Miss Jacobson were there and were sure to stay. Even the distraction of other prospects in London didn't seem to shake her loose from him. However, until he was ready to let his Anne go, he would never be ready to accept another woman in. Hannah Jacobson settled back into her room. She couldn't shake the feeling of Sebastian Blackburn's kiss on her hand. She had found him so serious and sombre when she first moved to Brighton Abbey. Now she was starting to truly see him in a new light. She considered when she had seen him working on his beloved West Wing over the spring and summer. He had been breathtakingly handsome. Hannah saw now that he was more than just a handsome, sombre and brooding man. He had a bounding love for his daughters. So much so that he would do just about anything to keep them from getting hurt again, no matter what that entailed. Hannah smiled at the thought. He was so overly protective of them now. How would he behave when they became of age to attend seasons in town? She snuggled down into her cover to keep off the chill. She hadn't lit a fire that night in her room and the cold was finding its way through the stone walls of the house. Hannah had to keep reminding herself that winters had the potential of being much more severe here than in London. She couldn't even imagine what that would be like. Luckily, she wouldn't have to. Unlike her childhood in the preparatory school, she would be allotted warm fires and heated water to wash in. This night, she was much too exhausted to get up and start the fire. She pulled her covers closer to her. It was much cooler than she was used to lately but nothing she hadn't experienced before. She would rather stay in the warmth of her bed than get out. 
As she lay there, she replayed Grimshaw's actions that night. She was so sure that he would not believe her words. Now looking back, she saw how ridiculous that was. She was pretty sure her months of torment could have been resolved if she had just gotten up the courage to speak with the Earl. He may have seemed controlling, but he was not without common sense. If she had appealed to him at the start, she could have saved herself a lot of pain and suffering. She would have liked to be free of Poole sooner, but she had to admit that with that suffering had also come some growth. After Baron Edgley's attack, she had felt completely hopeless and afraid. Some days she could scarcely leave her room for fear. Poole had tried to exercise that power over her again, and for a while he had succeeded. But Hannah realised her time at Brighton Abbey had seen growth in her. She was not the scared miss who hid behind caps and rough fabrics anymore. She no longer felt at fault for the cruel actions of others, and would not hide away to shield herself from them. Thanks to Granny's encouraging words, she had found her own strength and courage to stand up for herself, first to her attacker, and also to Lord Grimshaw, despite the fears that he might not believe her. She rolled over in her bed to settle herself in for a peaceful night of sleep, something she hadn't had in quite some time. Her eyes caught the light through the window. It was much brighter than it should be for the night. Blinking against it, she knew the curiosity was too much to resist. Rising from her bed and wrapping a blanket around her to stave off the cold, she walked over to the window and pushed back the curtain. The light of the moon and stars seemed to reflect in a kaleidoscope of colour. Falling quietly to the ground was a steady flow of flakes. Hannah stood by her window watching her breath fog the pane as she studied the glittering shimmer reflecting off of each beautiful flake. She was sure there was no better sign for a peaceful night of sleep than the quiet coating of snow. 28. Hannah woke with a start to the sound of Mary knocking on her door. Hannah, are you up? She called after she knocked for the third time. I'm sorry, Hannah called sleepily. Yes, come in. Mary opened the door and poked her head in. My goodness, are you still asleep? Oh, why is it so cold in here? Was the tinderbox not filled for you? It was, Hannah said, getting out of bed and stretching. I was just too tired to light it last night. Mary set down the basin of steaming water that seemed to steam all the more from the chill in the room. She walked over to the fireplace and started it herself. You don't have to do that, Mary, Hannah said, still working to remove the sleep from her eyes. She could not remember a time she had slept so soundly. She should have been upset that she slept in. In fact, if Hannah had her wits about her, she would be frantically getting ready so as not to be late getting the girls. But as of yet, she was not fully awake and found she was still in a blissful, sleepy mood. You'll catch your death if I don't warm this room up, Mary said as she lit the match. I don't know how you slept at all in this chill, let alone slept in. I suppose it felt kind of homey to me. Homey? Mary asked, confused by her words. Yes, the only home I truly remember was Hendrick's. There was rarely ever a fire in the dorms, and even the ones in the classrooms and dining halls were so small we often joked that if you sat more than two people away from it, your porridge would freeze. That sounds awful, Mary said, coming to stand and wiping any soot from her hands onto her apron. Perhaps, but when it's really all you know, Hannah said, shrugging the memory off. I'm not saying I lived like the Queen myself growing up, Mary responded. It was me and my six siblings. We slept on a pelt bed next to the fire. I suppose I should feel blessed we were always warmed through the cold months. Yes, I'm beginning to see how much your cold months here in Concordshire differ from London, Hannah agreed. Oh, Hannah started waking up to the memories of last night. It was snowing. She hopped barefooted over to the window with the excitement of a child. Yes, still is too, Mary replied, not looking herself. I suspect we will be in for quite a storm. It usually comes like this in big flurries, then it will warm up and melt it off a bit, only to do it all over again. Hannah stared out the window in amazement. 
If she thought the beauty of the frost at Mrs McCarthy's was mesmerising, it had little in comparison to the sight before her eyes now. The whole world was blanketed in the white crystals she had watched flutter to the ground the night before. Still the snow was falling, adding to the blanket. Now, instead of glistening in the light, they seemed to fall like white down feathers underneath a grey fluffy blanket of clouds. Oh, I wonder if I can take the girls out to play in it this afternoon, Hannah said half to herself. Oh, I won't expect it to stop for some time. Really? Oh yes, it should go on like this for a day or two, till we get a few feet on the ground. How marvellous, Hannah said excitedly. Not really. This is the wet kind. It's heavy and soaks your clothes through. It's no good for frolicking in. A little later in the year, perhaps after the Yule tide, we'll get a good dry dusting and you can take the girls in that. I had no idea there were different kinds of snow, Hannah said with an appreciation for Mary's wisdom. Don't you get snow down in London? Yes, but it was all covered in soot by the time I saw it, and I was never allowed to play in it as a child. Never allowed? That's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. Why I think my brother and I made our first toboggan when I was only seven. What's a toboggan? Hannah asked in anticipation. My word, Mary said, and I younger than you. Not by much, though. I'm just twenty. Still, I promise you this, by twenty and one, you will know what a toboggan is, Mary said with a giggle. I'll have my brother Jimmy bring one up to us when the snow is good and dry for it. Oh, the girls will love that, she exclaimed while clapping her hands together. Mary came over to the window and looked out it for a moment. She had seen snow plenty enough, but Hannah's excitement was beginning to catch. Hannah put an arm around the girl and hugged her close. I'm so glad to have you as my friend, Hannah said. It was the first time she had ever told a person that. She had the distinct memory of one other friend, a girl at school. Ruby and Hannah had slowly kindled a friendship when the teachers weren't looking, as any form of talking was considered idle. How she wished she had told Ruby how much she cherished their little friendship before she left her behind at Hendricks. She wasn't going to make that mistake again. She would make sure she told each and every person who came into her life how much they meant to her. Mary leaned her head on Hannah's shoulder and they watched the snow in silence for a few more seconds. I best be getting to my work and you too, she added. Hannah gave a sigh and agreed. Though how I will focus, let alone get the girls to do the same with such a winter wonderland outside or windows is beyond me, Hannah said with a smile. Mary paused just at the door and turned back. I'm so glad that you'll be staying on. Me too. Hannah concurred with a smile. She waited for the door to close firmly before she turned away from the window and began to dress for the day. She couldn't help but keep that smile on her lips. She was happy that she was staying on. More than that, she had no fears or reservations about it now. Lord Grimshaw woke to the glistening scene outside his window. He slumped into a very sour mood just from the sight of it. He had hoped to tell Lady Tara he had no intentions to marry her and send her quickly on her way back to town. With the snow coming down as it was, there would be no point to such words. Lord and Lady Waldron, as well as their daughter, would be confined to the house until the wet snow melted. He was familiar enough with the area to know that trying to drive a carriage in such weather was not worth the effort. Every few feet the wheels would simply sink into the wet snow mixed with the mud below. It would make for a very long, slow and arduous journey that none in their right mind would attempt if it could be helped. Now Grimshaw would be forced to continue his role as host to guests he had no desire to know any more personally than he already didn't. Grimshaw tried to convince himself that the extra time would be welcome. He still needed to work out his own heart the Marlowe family would be a well enough distraction. Good morning, he said as brightly as he could produce to the three guests in the morning room. Oh, Grimshaw, good morning to you, Lord Waldron huffed from behind the paper. Grimshaw did appreciate that the man was of few words early in the morning. 
He detested, however, that Lord Waldron always seemed to grab the paper and spend the whole morning with it. I trust you slept well, Lady Tara said, perfectly dressed in a soft blue gown with white lace trimming. Yes, of course, Grimshaw said with a tense smile. Without the pretense of withstanding the woman for the sake of his children, he was finding it hard to pretend. Well, except for the interruption early on, Lady Tara said with a gleam to her eye that spoke of secret interludes. Naturally, Lady Waldron caught on this at once. What is this? What interruption? I do hope you have more propriety than to leave your room at night, the woman crooned to her daughter. I didn't leave my room, mother. Poked my head out was all, she added in Grimshaw's direction with a flirtatious hint. Lady Waldron looked to Grimshaw and was rather preparing herself to be scandalised. Please ease your nerves, Lady Waldron. I had an issue with a member of the staff, but it was resolved. In the middle of the night? What issue could you possibly have in the middle of the night? Betsy told me this morning you had to have a servant forcibly removed. Lady Tara cooed on. No, not quite that severe, but I did have to make arrangements for their dismissal despite the late hour. Grimshaw tried to put as delicately as he could. He didn't really enjoy talking over household matters with those outside the household, nor did he think it was proper to gossip over dishonourably discharged staff, no matter how much of a rake he was. How unfortunate, Lady Waldron said, as to settle the matter, and Grimshaw was glad of it. Do you suppose it will snow all day? Lady Tara asked after a few sips of her hot chocolate. I expect it to, and for several more after. Really, how awful. I hate to be cooped up so, she said with a pout. Grimshaw considered reminding her that she had yet to take a single turn around the garden since her arrival at Brighton Abbey. Why snow would keep her in when the lack of it did the job just fine? He had no idea. Well, if this will brighten your mood, I just received a letter from Jaden with the Morning Post, he said after opening the letter and scanning over it. Oh, lovely. What does he say? Lady Tara asked, happy to have Grimshaw divert her to a happier subject. He says he plans to come for the Yuletide. I do invite him every year, but his schedule doesn't always allow the visit, Grimshaw said to the ladies by way of explanation. I expect he will come within the week. Hopefully the chap doesn't leave until this blizzard passes. Oh, won't that be wonderful, Lady Tara said in her sing-song voice. All of us together again. What fun we will have, and over such a festive time we'll make it all the merrier. Yes, was all Grimshaw could manage to say in agreement. In all honesty, he rather hoped that Lady Tara and her parents would be out of Brighton Abbey and his life by the time Christmas was upon them. 29. Hannah watched the snow fall for three more days. The excitement of it slowly melted away and was replaced with something else. Worry. She worried greatly for Joanna McCarthy all alone in her small cottage. With every feather of snow that floated to the ground, Hannah wondered if that was just another flake to block Granny in her house. Hannah knew well that the old widow only had so much wood kept in the house and the rest behind the shed. With the chill that came with the storm, she would be going through it fast just to keep a reasonable temperature in the house. With the snow piling up to almost mid-calf now, could Granny even push open her door? This snow was far wetter than she had known it to be in London. Hannah learned quickly the truth of all of Mary's warnings on the second day of the blizzard. Both girls begged constantly to go out and play. Finally, when the afternoon of the second day got a very small reprieve, Hannah allowed the two to bundle up, double their stockings, and go outside. It was thick and wet and melted easily, clinging to the hems of all their dresses. They had only lasted ten minutes before the biting wind began to pick up again, and Hannah insisted they return inside. For the remainder of that afternoon they sat by the schoolroom fire, with stockings hung to dry, while they sipped hot chocolate and read stories. Her worry for Granny by the third afternoon was more than she could bear. 
She waited till after the girls' school tasks were completed for the day before going down to the large drawing room where she knew she would find Grimshaw and his guests. Beg your pardon, Lord Grimshaw, she said with a curtsy. You're still here, Lady Tara blurted out rudely. All eyes swiveled to her. Lady Tara went promptly red in the cheeks and fanned herself against the outburst. Forgive me. I was under the impression that a new governess was going to be seeing to Lord Grimshaw's children's education. I have decided that it is in the best interest of Caroline and Rebecca for Miss Jacobson to stay, Grimshaw said with finality. Perhaps Lady Tara thought she would still have a future say in the running of the household, though Grimshaw had done nothing but give her the cold shoulder since the blizzard began. She simply narrowed her brown eyes on Hannah, sure that once she was the lady of the house, Miss Jacobson would be no more. Is there something you need, Miss Jacobson? Grimshaw said, giving his full attention back to Hannah. Yes, she said with a little huff of breath. It's Granny, Mrs McCarthy, that is, Hannah corrected for all present. I'm worried about her. What do you mean, worried about her? Grimshaw asked, pinching his dark brows together. Well, she lives all alone. With this storm, I'm afraid she might be snowed in. She only had enough wood in her house for a few days at a time. I'm worried she might freeze, Hannah finished, laying her worries bare. Is she not the lady that you said Caroline ran off to? I dare say she doesn't sound like a good influence on the child to condone such action. She is a wonderful widowed woman, Hannah said back a little too sharply. Lady Tara's eyes grew big in disgust, and Hannah quickly looked to the ground. She had to remind herself that she and the Earl had discussed this future union with this woman, or at least the possibility of that. She had no notion if it still was on the cards. If that was the case, Hannah would have to learn to watch her tongue around the lady. Though Hannah feared such a thing wouldn't necessarily be an easy task. She was used to standing silently among those who felt they had a higher superiority over her. I appreciate that you are worried, but I am sure Mrs McCarthy is just fine. Matthew lives only down the road a bit over the village shop. He is quite capable of seeing to his own mother's needs, Grimshaw tried to reassure her. I know he is capable, but I fear he isn't willing. Why is this a concern she is bringing to us? Lady Tara chimed in again in an attempt to keep her foot in the conversation. I am asking Lord Grimshaw because I would require the use of a carriage to go visit Mrs McCarthy. Even my most skilled driver would tell you that is unwise, Grimshaw said, choosing to ignore Lady Tara. The snow is too deep. You would sink right in and get stuck yourself. I don't see how you freezing halfway to Concordshire will help the widow. Then a horse, Hannah said, raising her chin in defiance. He smiled at her. He couldn't help but admire her stubborn tenacity. I'm sorry, Miss Jacobson. I cannot permit you to go. It is still snowing hard outside. I will see if one of the stablemen can ride out when they are free to check on her. But when will that be? She could be freezing to death. Hannah took a step forward, shrouded with worry. If you don't allow me the horse, I will find another way, Hannah added with determination. Grimshaw struggled to hide his smile. He couldn't believe that he had fallen in love with a woman so unlike his Anne. Anne had always been quiet, obedient, and open to any of his suggestions or advice. Hannah, on the other hand, was willing to fight him on anything and everything. Sometimes he thought she just did it out of sport. That was very rude, Lady Tara countered. Hannah took a step back, realising she had taken things a little too far. Fine. Forgive my impertinence, Lord Grimshaw, she said before curtsying and leaving. Hannah, he called out to her, not caring that Lady Waldron gasped at his familiar tone. Hannah turned around. I give you leave to go, but fear I cannot spare the horse, he said in a teasing manner. You know very well I would need at least a horse to get to her, Hannah countered, hands on her hips. I know. Grimshaw said with a wide smile that reached the pools in his chocolate eyes. Hannah turned and left the room. The wretched brute. She had only gone and asked him to be courteous to his silly rules. Now he had denied her the chance. 
well not denied her per se, but removed her ability to do so. His comment that he gave her leave but not a horse was just to poke fun at her. Curling a smile on her own lips like the one Grimshaw wore, she was determined to prove him wrong. Grimshaw chuckled to himself over the lady while he rang his bell. Calling in the butler, he advised the man to send Johnson as soon as he was able to check on the widow. I don't know why you would even do such a thing. The mouth on that girl, Lady Tara complained. He ignored her words and much of all the other things she said for the next half hour. Instead, he mused over Hannah Jacobson and that little chin she liked to jut out when she was determined to have her way. Lord Grimshaw, Mrs Brennan said, coming into the room in a fluster. A word in private, if you please. Of course, Grimshaw said, coming to a stand and walking the woman out into the hall. In the thirty seconds it took them to reach the seclusion, his mind had already raced to at least a half a dozen reasons why the woman looked so perturbed. When he turned from shutting the drawing room doors, he never expected the woman to whack him with a handkerchief she had been holding in her hand. You wretched man! Ouch! He flicked back, though it didn't hurt. What did I do to deserve being constantly attacked? Well, I don't know about any other time, but you do deserve it now. Whatever for. For sending off Miss Jacobson to Concordshire in a blizzard with nothing but her shawl to warm her and her feet to take her. I did no such thing, Grimshaw countered. I tried to stop her. Mrs. Brennan whimpered into her handkerchief. She said you gave her leave to go but wouldn't provide transportation, that she had to walk. I mean, I did say that, but... Mrs. Brennan whacked him again and sobbed, You wretched man, she will freeze to death. If it was any other member of the staff, Grimshaw might have gotten mad at her actions. Seeing how Mrs. Brennan had been a second mother, and really more of a disciplinarian than his own mother, he simply did his best to dart away from her blows. I did say those things, but I was just teasing her. She knew that. I never thought she would. Well, she did. When, Grimshaw said, stiffening into all seriousness. If Hannah was out in a blizzard, who knew what could happen to her? It would be easy enough to simply lose one's way. There was no road to guide her path, and the cold and falling snow was sure to disorient her. Lost in the woods at this time of day was never a good choice. Dusk was close at hand, and there were sure to be hungry wolves on the prowl after such a long storm like this one. Tell Johnson to ready my horse this instant, Grimshaw ordered. Good man, Mrs Brennan said, now patting him on the shoulder with her handkerchief arm, though he still flinched for a moment. I knew you would do the right thing and go after her. Mrs Brennan gave him a peck on the cheek and bustled off to see that things were made ready for the Earl. Where are you going? Lady Tara said, peeking out into the hall. Grimshaw would have liked to tell her that nothing was more irritating to him than a woman so nosy as to eavesdrop on a conversation she was purposefully excluded from. He didn't have the time for that, though. Every second wasted could be another, that Hannah was chased by wolves or froze to death lost in the woods. I need to go see to something. I will be back late tonight. Is it that governess? She does seem to cause quite a bit of trouble, Lady Tara remarked, clearly irritated by the fact that Grimshaw was leaving her side for another woman. Grimshaw clenched his fist and did his best to steady his breath. It would be uncalled for to yell at the horrible woman, especially since they were still trapped at Brighton Abbey. He turned and smiled as softly as he could to the woman, though she took a step back so Grimshaw guessed he hadn't done a very good job of it. I will do my best to be back as soon as I can, he said as softly as he could manage, and turned to leave before the horrid woman could find a response. 30. Luckily in the time it took him to run to his room, dress in his warmest winter clothes and make his way to the stables, Johnson had the sense to saddle his fastest steed. The black stallion was neighing at the chance to leave the confines of the stall after days trapped inside. Grimshaw mounted in one swift motion and gave the animal its head. He had to admit to himself it did feel good to break from the confines they both had been trapped in these last three days. The snow was falling fairly heavy now, 
and between the blurring vision, the dark clouds, and the loss of the little light there was from the setting sun. Grimshaw only hoped that someone else had happened upon Hannah and helped her along her way. It was a short ride into Concordshire, five miles at the most, and any other day he wouldn't have cared that Hannah had gone on foot. As the steed beneath him started to slow after the first mile fighting against the thick snow, his worry increased. He didn't think he would make it this far without coming upon her. What had started at a breakneck speed had now dwindled down to a struggling trot for the black stallion. Come on, boy, we can make it, Grimshaw said encouragingly to the horse. Grimshaw strained his eyes as far as he could see. It wasn't much in the darkening whiteout. The steam that wafted from every breath he or the horse took only seemed to obscure his sight more. Finally, he leaned forward, sure he had caught sight of billowing fabric. Hannah, he called out against the wind. He was sure that the fabric shifted again between the flurry of snow. Calling to the stallion, he urged him forward as fast as the horse would go. It was only a few short minutes between spotting Hannah and finally coming up to her, but to Grimshaw it seemed an eternity. She had her head bent against the blowing snow with a shawl wrapped tight around her head and body. Are you mad, woman? Grimshaw rebuked her, bringing the horse next to Hannah. She looked up in surprise. Perhaps she had merely thought him another traveller in this awful weather. Lord Grimshaw, she said with surprise, and then jutted out her chin defiantly, though he was sure he could see a quivering to her lips. I told you, I must see Joanna is safe and taken care of. And you freezing halfway to her cottage will help the woman how? You are walking in snow halfway up your skirt. Did you actually think you could make it the whole way like this? Yes, she retorted stubbornly. Grimshaw reached down a hand to her and she looked at it puzzled. I will not go with you, sir. I am determined. You cannot sway me. Woman, you either give me your hand and seat yourself astride this horse or I will be forced to pick you up and put you on the beast myself, Grimshaw said with a stern tone. She hesitated only a moment before reaching out and handing him a gloved hand. He scoffed at it. It was the thin cotton white gloves she would wear to a Sunday service. No doubt the only ones she had. He was sure the tips of her fingers must be blue. Holding her firmly, she placed one foot in the stirrup and he helped her to sit on the steed in front of him. He reached forward and put the reins between his teeth while he removed his own gloves. Put these on before you lose a finger, he said. But your hands will freeze, Hannah countered. He wrapped one arm tight around her waist and gripped the reins with the other. He was satisfied to feel that at least her centre was relatively warm. It is a short trip to Widow McCarthy's from here. I am sure my hands will be fine till then, he said against her ear. He felt her lean back more into his arms and he relished the feel of her against his chest. It didn't escape his notice that she was, in fact, shivering and soaked from her skirts down. You're going to take me the rest of the way? she asked with a little chatter to it. Of course I am. I promised you I would have the widow checked on. Why could you not just wait? What if she is freezing to death in there? I had no idea when you would get around to it. You were very occupied with your guests, she countered as the horse started its trot. I am a man of my word, he said gravely. I know you are, she reassured him. I just didn't know how long it would take. My conscience couldn't wait another moment. Clearly, Grimshaw said with a scoff, I believe you are by far the most stubborn woman I have ever met. I am sure you mean that as an insult, but I thank you for it. I am fairly certain it was my stubborn nature that saw me through Hendrick's preparatory. I actually meant it as a compliment, Grimshaw replied against her ear. They made the rest of the journey in relative silence. Hannah was relieved to have his warmth at her back. In all honesty, she had been cursing herself for being such a fool to think she could walk to the cottage. She saw no hope for moving forward or turning back when the black heaving steed came to her side. She would have to remember to find a way to truly thank Lord Grimshaw for coming to her aid. Right now, however, she was quite content 
relishing in the feel of his chest against her back and his strong hand spread against her waist. He kept a sure grip on her. She would never admit to Lord Grimshaw that she was an inexperienced rider, having never had the chance to do much in her life. Add the fact that she could no longer feel her fingers or toes and was sharing the horse with another rider, and the whole matter became that much more dubious. Luckily, Lord Grimshaw seemed to know the stallion well. He manoeuvred and spoke to the animal, and surprisingly to Hannah, the horse would obey his spoken orders. Hannah could scarcely keep herself from shivering right off her seat when the cottage finally came into view. She had a moment of relief at seeing the safety of shelter, but it was quickly overshadowed. In the time it took them to finish the journey, the sun had properly set, and other than the little light reflecting off the snow, there was none to be seen. A single candle alone shone in one window, but no glow of a fire or smoke protruding from the chimney. The snow had settled down to a light falling, and the wind had finally died down, giving Hannah a better view than when she had tried to walk herself. Grimshaw, look, she had no fire. I do hope Granny is all right, Hannah worried, and willed the horse to progress through the drifts faster. She barely waited till she got to the gate before slipping off the animal. Grimshaw luckily was aware enough of her desires to use his hand to steady her on the way down. Hannah took a sharp breath in as she sunk back into the snow. It hadn't seemed that long ago, but her body had already forgotten the feeling of dragging through it. She made the final steps up through Granny's small garden and to the front door. She knocked on the door, praying that Granny wasn't there. Perhaps Mr McCarthy had been considerate of his mother and come and taken her back to his home to wait out the snow. The sound of Granny's voice inside told her otherwise. Oh, my dear, I'm afraid I can't open the door, she called. Don't worry, Granny, we'll get you out, she called back. With her hands, she began to dig at the drift that had piled up against the cottage door. Grisham had only taken the time to tie up the horse before he too came to join her work. With his large bare hands scooping away at the snow, the job was done in no time and the door was pulled open by the Earl. Oh, my dear, Granny said again, all in a fuss. You shouldn't have come. Look at you frozen to the bone. Come in, come in. I have no fire to warm you by, but we will find a way. Do you have wood outside? Lord Grimshaw asked. Granny looked up as if she had noticed the Earl's presence for the first time. Why, yes, my lord. It's out back against the shed where the two goats are waiting out the storm. There's a door to the back of the cottage, too, but I'm afraid it's stuck. I'll see to the wood and the door. Grimshaw said and nodded to Hannah. You go inside now and at least remove what you can of your wet things. Wait, Hannah called as he turned to leave. Take these back then, she said, removing his large fur-lined gloves from her hands. He took them thankfully and put them on before retrieving the horse again and making his way to the back of the cottage. Hannah came into the darkened house and her heart sank as low as her icy feet. Though they had shelter from the wind, it was still ice cold in the cottage. Hannah watched her breath puff out in little clouds as Granny moved her into the main room to remove shoes and stockings. It didn't take the Earl long to unstick the other door and begin his journey in and out of the house with the wood. Hannah made quick work of starting a fire with the fuel he provided. For the first little bit all worked quietly, not saying a word to the other. The tasks took too much effort to add conversation to it, but once the fire was going strong, more wood than could be burned in a week was stacked by the hearth and all parties were inside with wet outer clothing removed to dry. Hannah found her tongue again. How long have you been like this? she asked Granny. Oh, just yesterday and today, the old woman waved off. Why didn't Matthew come and help you? Grimshaw asked abruptly. Oh, my Matty. Granny waved off in her usual way. He is a busy boy. I was sure he would be by soon. You would have frozen before he came, Hannah told her. I'm tough, I can assure you that, she said with her round face smiling. Oh, the kettle is ready, she added, getting up from her seat. Just as she reached it over the fire, it started to sound its whistle. Grimshaw looked to Hannah, surprised that Granny would know before it sounded. 
Hannah just smiled at him. She was sure that soon he would get to know Granny as she did, including all her little idiosyncrasies like that. Now warm yourself inside and out, Granny said, pouring them each a cup of tea. Hannah took it gratefully and gulped it, not caring that it burned on its way down. Grimshaw watched her over his own teacup with a wary eye. Granny went to fussing around more to produce some kind of meal for them to eat, despite Hannah's insistence that she needn't bother. When Hannah set her cup down, Grimshaw did the same and reached forward to take Hannah's hands in his. She was surprised by how warm they were. Hers were still ice cold. He turned them over in the glow of the firelight and inspected each and every finger. What are you doing? Hannah asked barely above a whisper. I am inspecting you for frostbite, Grimshaw said with a smile on his lips. Lucky for you, I don't see any blue fingers. Leaning forward, he pulled the hand he held up to his lips and kissed the tips of her fingers gently. She was mesmerised by the action. Shall I check your toes now? Grimshaw said with his smiling lips, still brushing her fingertips. She flushed and pulled away. You most certainly may not. She pretended offence, but knew she couldn't hide the blush his teasing had produced. I suppose we will have to stay the night, Grimshaw said with a rush of air as he looked about the small accommodations. We will, Hannah said, surprised. Well, I have no desire to ride back home in the dark with wolves around, he added for good measure. Wolves? Hannah asked, as if the thought had never occurred to her. He nodded. Oh, don't mind the wolves, Granny said, coming into the room with a plate full of cold meat pies. They don't bother you as long as you don't bother them. Granny was always the optimist, Hannah decided. You are welcome to stay the night, however. The clothes will need the time to dry anyway. I wouldn't be sending your lordship back out in wet things. I'm grateful for your hospitality, Grimshaw said sincerely, as he took up a slice of pie. There is only one room upstairs, though. Hannah and I can take the pallet here just like when sweet Lady Caroline came to visit me, Granny said, and Hannah nodded her agreement. Nonsense. I will not deprive a widow of her bed. You and Hannah can have the room, he said, looking up to the stairs that led to a single loft room. I am quite able to sleep on a pallet for one night. I dare say I will have the better of the deal anyway with the fire right at my side to keep me warm. 31. Sebastian did sleep soundly next to the fire. He may have been the Earl of Grimshaw, but he was not averse to hard work or less than pristine conditions. Twice he got up during the night to add to the fire. He wanted to make sure the heat was able to carry through the whole house. Grimshaw was woken by a sight he had not seen for some time, the sun shining through the window. At last it seemed the blizzard had passed. He was relieved to know that they wouldn't be making the journey home in the storm. With the breaking of the clouds he hoped the snow would start to quickly melt as well, making the journey all the better. Shortly after he woke he heard the rustling of the ladies upstairs as well as in the kitchen. Joanna McCarthy must have been an early riser, as she seemed to have gotten to the kitchen before he even stirred. Hannah came down the stairs shortly after Grimshaw woke and seemed a little timid at the closeness of a small cottage with Grimshaw's presence. She barely spoke a good morning before heading to the kitchen to see if Mrs McCarthy could use an extra hand. Grimshaw saw to the ashes in the hearth and put away the pallet. With nothing else to do, he made his way to the kitchen. You can't stay here all alone, Granny. He stopped at the threshold to hear the conversation between Hannah and the widow. I don't mind it, dear, Granny said as she stirred a pot of porridge. Won't you at least go to Mr McCarthy's? I'm sure he would be happy for your presence over the Yuletide. Oh, Matty will be far too busy for me. After a storm, the shop is twice as crowded. I would just be in the way. I am fine here in my little cottage. What if there is another blizzard? Mrs McCarthy was silent for a few moments. To be sure, if Grimshaw and Hannah hadn't come to her aid, she would be in a sorry situation. Perhaps I could ask Lord Grimshaw if you could stay with us, just until the worst of the winter weather is over, Hannah asked when there was no answer. 
Oh, I would not dream of putting that burden on Lord Grimshaw, Mrs. McCarty replied. They worked in silence again for a few moments. Grimshaw guessed Hannah, ever the stubborn creature, was working her mind in a plan to see the widow safe through the cold season. Oh, the widow said suddenly, I almost forgot. She set aside her spoon stirring the breakfast and hurried to a cupboard. She pulled out three brown paper packages. I got something little for Lady Caroline and Lady Rebecca for the season. I do hope they will like it. I didn't think I would be seeing you till after our Lord's birth, but Providence brought you just in time to give them their gifts for the day. And this one is for you, Mrs McCarthy said, handing over the three boxes and pointing to the one on top. How on earth did you manage this? Hannah said with surprise. Oh, I used the money you gave me. Granny, that was for you. You were meant to pay for the school supplies with it, as well as payment for your tutoring, Hannah scolded. Oh, pish posh. I had plenty of the supplies already on hand. Then you should have kept it for yourself. I don't need anything. Oh, it will bring me joy to know those little girls have some small gifts from me. You are far too kind, Granny, Hannah said, giving the woman a loving embrace. Grimshaw cleared his throat to announce his presence. Oh, good. Your lordship is awake. Just in time for some breakfast, Mrs McCarthy said, spooning the porridge into some bowls. Be a dear and grab the kettle. It's going. A half a second after her words were spoken, the kettle began to sound its noise. The earl laughed to himself at the old woman's keen senses as he walked over and poured the tea into the ceramic teapot. Hannah took the tray of bowls, and the earl insisted on carrying the tea set. Together the three marched in a procession into the front room. They ate their breakfast happily chatting. Mrs McCarthy was always good at keeping happy conversations going. Once the meal was over, there was nothing left for Hannah or the earl to do before they should head back to Brighton Abbey. Hannah stalled nonetheless, hoping to find a way to convince Granny to join them. Before we continue into the story, make us a favour. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. I wonder, Mrs McCarthy, Grimshaw said after the dishes were cleared and washed by the trio. My girls have spoken so highly of you. They love you as if you were their own grandmother. They unfortunately have no grandparents of their own. I would be most grateful if you would come with us over the holiday and be a grandmother to Caroline and Rebecca. I wouldn't want to be a burden to you, Lord Grimshaw, Granny said, though her resolve had crumbled with such a distinguished guest requesting. It wouldn't be a burden at all. I can assure you of that. In fact, I don't think the Eulity Day would be right without you there, Grimshaw said, flashing her a handsome smile. Hannah had to hold in a giggle as she saw Granny blush against the Earl's charm. Well... If you think the girls might enjoy my presence, I couldn't say no to such a request. Wonderful, Grimshaw said, clapping his hands together. I will go prepare the horse for you to ride. Ah, I'll hear nothing about it, he added before Granny could protest. And see to the goat's needs before we are on our way. I'll make sure to have a man come and see to them while you are staying with us, he added more to himself as an afterthought. I suppose I should go get some belongings then. Granny said, a little unsure of herself. She rather felt as if she was being treated as a fine lady. A half hour later, the trio left the small cottage snugly locked up. Granny had been deftly placed on the horse by Grimshaw's strong hands, and he and Hannah walked on either side of the beast. With the sun shining bright, the snow had already started its slow melt. It was still very wet to walk through, though, and Grimshaw was sure that by day's end it would be very soggy terrain indeed. It was a far cry from the whipping snow the night before, however. They made good time, reaching Brighton Abbey by early afternoon. Both girls rushed into the hall at their arrival. Their excitement overflowed when they saw the added member of the party. Granny, for her part, was awestruck by the magnificent beauty of the vast manor. Grimshaw hadn't really considered the ramifications of his actions with respect to the guests he already housed. With the commotion of his children at their arrival, however, they were soon also greeted by Lord and Lady Waldron and Lady Tara. 
May I introduce Mrs. Joanna McCarthy? Grimshaw said to his three guests. She has been gracious enough to accept my offer to stay over the holidays. All three gave her a very sceptical look. Clearly they didn't see the widow as a worthy companion for their afternoons in the drawing room. Grimshaw was sure if he had been a good host, he would have considered their feelings on the matter before inviting the widow to stay. But to be honest, he didn't care. With the sun shining and the roads soon to be cleared, he hoped he wouldn't have to be their host much longer. Before much could be done on the matter to ease the comfort of the Marlows, Granny was tugged away by Lady Caroline and Lady Rebecca for their own personal tour of the manor. Naturally, the highlights included the nursery, schoolroom, west wing and kitchen, where sweet treats might be snuck. I was very concerned when you didn't return last night, Lady Tara said in a scolding tone. Her dark eyes darted between Lord Grimshaw and Hannah. She was far beyond concerned when it came to the idea of Grimshaw spending an evening in the beautiful governess's presence. If you would excuse me, I will go change into some dry clothes, Hannah said, curtsying and leaving the two alone to discuss Lady Tara's feelings on the matter. Miss Jacobson, Grimshaw stopped her, if you would please meet me in my office once you are warmed and dried, I have some business that needs your attendance. Yes, of course. Hannah said, unsure what business could include her. She turned and went to freshen up and change out her soaking skirts for a fresh new dress. Grimshaw turned to Lady Tara. I am concerned that this governess is having a bad influence on the children, Lady Tara said with seriousness. I'm afraid I don't share your concerns, Grimshaw said plainly. Perhaps because you are too blinded by her beauty to realise it, she said, putting her hands on her hips. Grimshaw gave a loud and long laugh at her declaration. He was not laughing at the idea that Hannah was beautiful, for she certainly was that. He had chosen her as governess because he wanted a plain and homely-looking lady. Though she had attempted to dress the part, she was nothing of the sort, and he knew it all too well. I assure you, Lady Tara, I have come to know her good nature and dedication to her duties long before I even got a peek at her beauty. Lady Tara opened her mouth to speak, but Grimshaw cut in before she was even given the chance. Forgive me, but I too am rather soaked through. I must change out of these sodden things and attend to business in my office. Yes, of course, Lady Tara said with a smile. She didn't like being told off, but she would not show such feelings to him. I would hate if you took ill. Freshly dressed, Hannah made her way from her room to Lord Grimshaw's office. She wondered what business he had that could possibly need her assistance. Hannah entered the office and stood before the Earl, who was also washed and dressed in a fresh suit. Even his short black hair was slicked back, and she could smell the strong scent of pine and soap floating through the room. Is there something you needed from me, Lord Grimshaw? Hannah asked, wringing her hands with worry. He smiled softly at her. Getting up, he walked to a large bookshelf behind him and retrieved a small mahogany chest. Hannah watched as he removed a key from his desk and unlocked the chest. As he opened it, she wasn't able to see over the lid. I confess I overheard you talking with Mrs. McCarthy this morning. I understand you were giving her funds for her art classes. Yes, sir, Hannah said, still not sure what to make of the Earl's questions. Where did you procure the money to pay her? he asked, pulling out a large stack of notes and counting them. I didn't steal it if that is what you are inferring, Hannah said with a mix of shock and hurt. Grimshaw's gaze switched from the notes to her. For the second time that day he laughed heartily. I am not accusing you of stealing the money, my dear Hannah. I swear you look for a chance to be cross with me. I do not, Hannah said crossly. He raised a dark brow at her and she blushed realising that she had fallen right into his trap. I don't mean to, Hannah said finally. Grimshaw looked at her with a twinkle in his dark eyes. How he was learning he loved everything about this woman. His mind drifted to the letter in his pocket and the woman who wrote it. Hannah was so different from his Anne. 
he still couldn't fathom how he could have so much love and admiration for the woman before him, and still have room enough to keep his hand still in his heart. So, would you like to tell me how you procured the funds then? Grimshaw asked again. I took it from my own wages, Hannah said with her chin upturned. As I suspected. How much? he asked, setting to the business of his notes again. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Just what I could spare my family. Your family? Yes, I send most of my wages to my family back in London. My mother just recently had another child, and any amount helps them a great deal. And you keep none for yourself? Grimshaw said with surprise. I have few needs. I am well taken care of here at Brighton Abbey, Hannah replied. Well, I can't have you paying for the girl's education out of your own wages. From now on I will make sure Mrs McCarthy receives proper wages for her time tutoring, and this is to reimburse you for her past wages. Grimshaw handed forward a large stack of notes. Hannah took a step back and held her hands back. I couldn't possibly take that. It is far too much to start. You are a very stubborn woman, do you know that, Miss Jacobson? Grimshaw said, rather anticipating this not to be an easy task. I don't think I am that stubborn, she countered. Case in point, Grimshaw said with a smile. Now take this before I put it in your hand myself. Hannah still hesitated but finally came forward and took the money. But it is too much, sir, Hannah repeated. Then send what you don't want to your family. Perhaps it will give them an extra large goose for their Christmas meal. Extra large? You mean goose at all? Grimshaw was surprised by her words. He had an idea that she came from a poorer situation than his own, but he had no idea that her family suffered so. They will be most grateful for this, Hannah said, her eyes brimming with tears. Grimshaw came around his desk and came to stand before her. It amazed him that what seemed such a little amount to him would make such a difference to her. Grimshaw looked down at the sniffling Miss Jacobson. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out a handkerchief for her. Hannah dabbed at her eyes gratefully before handing the cloth back over. Grimshaw let his fingers graze against her own. He relished the feeling that it sent throughout his body. Grimshaw was sure she felt it too, for her eyes raised up to meet his. He took a step closer, closing the gap between them. He would have liked to kiss her at that moment. However, he knew the time was not yet right. He still had slight hesitation in his heart in regard to his late wife. Until he resolved his own turmoil, he wouldn't be ready to take the next step. 32. The following days were some of the most enjoyable for Hannah. She split her time preparing for Christmas, which was only two days away, as well as entertaining the girls and Granny. Granny had all sorts of ideas to brighten the manor before Christmas came. First, she showed the girls how to make snowflakes out of parchment. They tied them together and decorated the halls with the garlands. Next, Granny told them stories of Father Christmas, and they all wrote letters to be tossed into the fire. The ashes soared up the chimney to magically arrive at St. Nicholas himself. They also spent countless hours in the kitchen watching the cook make her Christmas pies and puddings. Rebecca could hardly contain her excitement as the day drew closer. Grimshaw, unfortunately, wasn't having as good a time with his guests. Lord and Lady Waldron were a sombre crowd. It didn't help that he had no desire to be in Lady Tara's presence any longer. He wasn't sure he would have the heart to tell her to her face that he had no intention of marrying her. It was hard enough for him to work out his own emotions within him. He wasn't sure if he was willing to produce such disastrous ones in another. Instead, he spent the majority of his time in the West Wing. With the roof finished in his absence, it was just the interior that needed finishing. He hoped that while he finished his promise to Anne, he would also be able to find a way to work out the inner turmoil raging inside him and come to terms with his emotions and his guilt. Grimshaw also hoped that his distance from the others while he buried himself in his work would encourage Lady Tara to lose interest. Maybe in that way, she would leave on her own without him having to hurt his honour. 
Little did he know, however, that without Grimshaw to entertain her, Lady Tara took to spending time with the girls. She suspected that he was losing interest because of the children's aversions to her. She had little care for small people, but she also had no desire to leave Brighton Abbey without the title Countess. She began to accompany the children, their governess, and Granny on their various adventures and crafts. Luckily, it wasn't every day, for Lady Tara could only stand so much time with those people. On the occasions she did, however, they were very sombre events. It would take all of Hannah's will to keep the girls in a pleasant mood with Lady Tara's constant corrections of their behaviour. It was clear to Hannah that Lady Tara detested anything that so much as resembled child's play. Hannah often wondered what Lady Tara could have possibly been like as a child herself. She had no aptitude for how to speak to children. She would often be harsh and speak very literally. She would never take care to consider the girls' delicate feelings as she corrected any imperfections. Luckily, the monotony of her presence was finally interrupted the day before Christmas, when another surprise visitor arrived at Brighton Abbey. Uncle Jaden, Rebecca and Caroline greeted their travel-worn uncle as he entered the house. They both wrapped their arms around his legs, not caring for his tired demeanour. Jaden Marsh, for his part, forgot his weary muscles and picked each girl up, spinning them around. I can't believe how big you both have gotten since I've seen you last. Hannah couldn't help but feel the contagious joy as all parties were reacquainted or introduced for the first time that night in the drawing room after Mr Marsh had refreshed himself. Even Grimshaw, who had seemed so elusive these last few days, was present as all parties gathered in the drawing room before dinner. Hannah sat back at the side of the room and watched with enjoyment as the girls pestered their uncle and he thoroughly enjoyed their questions. Though Grimshaw was present, Hannah noticed he was still not quite all there. His mind seemed to be caught in a different world of its own. She was sure the holidays were the hardest for him. She couldn't imagine what it felt like to have lost a loved one. Surely the coming of these festive times would only remind him of her absence. Hannah's heart ached for the Earl. She had grown to care for him and the children so much over the past few months. She wished she could find a way to take the hurt from him. She had one idea in particular that she had been working on the last few weeks. She hoped it would help him to work through his inner turmoil that he had mentioned in the past. She knew that in helping him, she would be only securing his marriage to Lady Tara. She was by no means looking forward to that constant presence in Brighton Abbey. Despite what he said about having no interest in the lady, he must have found some. Else why were she and her family still at Brighton Abbey? Nonetheless, if that was what Lord Grimshaw saw in his future, she would not say otherwise. She had grown to care for him just as much as his girls. She would be willing to do anything to secure his happiness, even if that meant slight unpleasantness for her. They were having an enjoyable evening, despite the shadow that hung over the room. The drawing room was full of words not spoken, some anticipating promises, and others avoiding giving bad news. Dinner was fine enough with the added company. The girls and Hannah had regained their position at the dinner table, despite Lady Waldron's objections, with the addition of Granny. Now, with Jaden added to the party, all forgot about prejudice to listen to his tales. I still can't believe you managed to travel in that storm, Grimshaw said with a chuckle around the warmth of a fire after the meal. Well, the blizzard wasn't in London when I left. I suppose it must have travelled south, for the carriage ran right into it. There was no stopping, however, and we just carried on. Twice I had to exit and help push the wheel out of a rut. The girls were enthralled with his tales and all the more grateful that they had the addition of their uncle in time for the holiday. After finishing his tales of the travelling, the girls went off to their own entertainments. Hannah let them be about their own work, having been engaged in a card game with Granny. It wasn't till the loud, shrill scream of Lady Tara startled all present that Hannah looked up from her game. What? Whatever is the matter? Grimshaw said, rushing over from his small party of Jaden and Lord Waldron, who had all been in deep conversation over the past election. A mouse! A horrible mouse! It was right here on my seat. 
Lady Tara said with a high-pitched screech. Hannah heard the girls giggle in the corner and knew at once what had happened. She hurried over to Lady Tara's seat and only searching a moment she procured Mr Whiskers from behind a cushion. Holding him by the tail, she lifted him up. She may have known the trickster was benign, that didn't mean she had to like him, however. Lady Caroline, please come and take Mr Whiskers away, Hannah said holding the rodent at arm's length from her own body. Lady Tara glared at the girls as they came giggling forward to accept the pet. You! You put that horrible creature on my seat. How downright rotten of you, she said, wagging a finger at Lady Caroline. Lord Waldron was preoccupied fanning his wife who had fainted at the sight of the creature, and Grimshaw was still attempting to step around Lord and Lady Waldron to get to the scene of the action. They only meant it to be a joke, Hannah defended her wards. I am not saying it was right, but such language seems a bit harsh. Both girls were hiding behind Hannah's skirts at the ladies' outburst. They did the very same to me. I am sure it gave you a great shock, but once you gain your senses again you will see it is harmless. Harmless? Harmless? I suppose you encouraged them to do so? Of course not, Hannah retorted, jutting her chin out. What is this about, Grimshaw said, stepping between the two ladies. Those horrid little beasts put a rat on my cushion. I about fainted from the fright of it. Grimshaw, you must do something. Grimshaw looked down severely at his girls. He did find it to be a distasteful action, but didn't see the need to call them horrid or beasts. Is this true, girls? Yes, father. Lady Caroline said. You will go straight to bed this instant. You will be lucky if Father Christmas comes at all after such behaviour. Hannah would have liked to say he was sure to come and reward them for showing Lady Tara's true nature before their father, but she held her tongue. Instead, she shooed the two girls with Granny and Mr Whiskers in hand to see them properly put to bed. Lady Waldron finally came to and her husband gingerly helped her also to bed to rest for the night after the fright. Jaden, who had been a bit slow on the uptake, now was caught up and was having a good laugh over the matter. It is not funny, Mr Marsh. What if the thing bit me? How could they do such a thing? I assure you it is a negative influence that encouraged them to do so. Lady Tara began to rant. I assure you the pet is well trained, Grimshaw said, doing his best to hide his irritability at the lady. He would no sooner bite a cat, and as for the bad influence, I suppose that would be me. After all, they did the same to Hannah when she first came, so they couldn't have gotten the idea from her as you are inferring. Something must be done about them, Grimshaw. They are out of control. I suggest sending them to a strict boarding school. It is the only way they will learn to behave. Now hold on a minute, Jaden interrupted before Grimshaw could give his say. It may have been an ill-advised act, but they are not badly behaved by any means. What other children would sit so quietly and behave so politely all evening long? I dare say my own sister and I would have caused far more trouble before this time in the evening. Lady Tara blew out her cheeks in a rage that both men were taking sides against her. She looked to Grimshaw for a last-ditch chance of support. Finding none in his stern face, she turned and stormed from the room. 33. With Lady Tara out of the room, Grimshaw let out a long sigh. Jaden did the same and slumped down onto a couch. That one is more of a handful than I first thought. It was wrong of the girls to do such a thing, Grimshaw replied, taking his own seat on an adjacent chair. But pretty funny if you ask me, Jaden said with humorous glee in his eyes. Grimshaw gave out a little chuckle of his own. What am I going to do with those girls? I'm sure it's my fault. I let them run wild before Hannah got here. She seemed to be straightening them out fine. Yes, despite me, Grimshaw agreed. So, Hannah, is it? Jaden asked, arching one of his dark blonde brows. She is a pretty thing to look at. No wonder you have no taste for Lady Tara any longer. I didn't think I was being quite that obvious about it, Grimshaw countered. 
Are you joking? At least once every half hour I would catch you looking her way with that boyish grin. I certainly don't have a boyish grin, Grimshaw said in a husky tone, so that alone tells me you are simply trying to tease me. Tell me I am wrong. Tell me you don't have eyes for the governess. It's complicated, Grimshaw responded softly. Complicated how? She clearly has feelings for you too. She loves the girls as well. What complication is there? Her social status for one. My girls love her company now, but she will be less accepted into society due to her breeding. You know that. What if that reflects badly on the girls when they come of age? Lady Tara, on the other hand, Grimshaw managed to say. Yes, I suppose the lady would have more influence in certain circles. But would you really be willing to subject your daughters to her for the benefit of circles? No, Grimshaw said, already knowing he had determined that fact. I did allow the lady to assume certain things, however. I am on a bound to her now, no matter how much I wish I wasn't. No words have been spoken, Jaden said with a wave of his hand. There is no honour that binds you to her. I am sure she may be hurt by the dismissal. Judging by the way she acted tonight, I hope I am not present to see that scene, he added with a chuckle, but she would have no reason to tarnish your name over it. Perhaps. Grimshaw considered. But I guess there is something else keeping you at bay from the beautiful governess. Grimshaw looked to his brother-in-law. I would think it would be quite clear, Anne. Do you think she wouldn't approve? Jaden asked. I mean of the fact that she is the governess. I don't know, Grimshaw said, considering that for the first time. She was a kind and humble woman. I don't think she put too much stock in classes. Then what worries you, my friend? She would be a good mother to your children. I would guess that was all that Anne would wish for. It is not that I think Anne wouldn't approve, per se. It's more that I'm racked with guilt. I fear that I have fallen in love with Hannah. Who wouldn't? I might have myself just a little bit after one day, Jaden jested. I mean it. I have grown to care for her, to feel for her, to want to love and protect her. And you think Anne would despise you caring for your new wife? Yes. No, I don't know. I just worry that somehow in doing so I am disappointing Anne. As you said, Anne was kind, Jaden said after a few moments. He smiled whimsically at a memory that flashed before his eyes. I remember when we were children. There was a kitchen boy who came to stay at our country house. He was a sickly-looking thing, and the cook was prone to boxing his ears those first few months. It wasn't the boy's fault. He knew little of his duties, and the cook never took time to teach him properly. Annie took it upon herself to give him the kindness he deserved. She would save cakes and muffins from teas and bring them to him. She even made him a little wooden top to play with. I dare say it was his first and only toy. She didn't see the boy as below her status. She didn't see the clumsy, slow learner that the cook saw either. She saw another person. All she cared about was that he was happy in his life at our house. The point is, she would want you to be happy. They both sat for a time lost in their own thoughts about the late Countess of Grimshaw. I think about her so much around this time, Grimshaw said softly. Perhaps it is because I have less to keep me busy when the weather is cold and I'm trapped inside. Perhaps it is because I have so many happy memories with her that include the holiday, Grimshaw added, shaking his head. I miss her. I don't think there will ever come a time that I don't. I didn't think that I could hold on to my love and affection for her and let another one in as well. I was sure there was only room for one. Yes, but you have let the governess in, and it doesn't mean you love my sister any less. Jaden said with wisdom beyond his years. Yes, Grimshaw agreed. Then don't hesitate. Anne wouldn't want you to. Christmas morning saw the whole family and household dressed in their Sunday best for the service in Concordshire. It took both of Grimshaw's carriages to get them through the now-melted snow to the chapel. Jaden rode with the governess, girls and granny in one carriage, while Grimshaw sat with Lady Tara and her parents in the other. 
His ride was a grim one full of sombre faces. He hadn't much expected differently after the incident the night before. He couldn't help but be a little jealous hearing the laughter and even caroling coming from the gig behind him. The sermon by Dr. O'Driscoll was just as sombre as usual. Even the day of the Lord's birth could be turned into a dull event under his ministrations. Though the Reverend's words were severe and chastening, the excitement of the season could still be felt throughout the congregation. From now until Twelfth Night, there would be much gaiety and merriment all throughout the county. It didn't escape Grimshaw's notice either that along with the usual happy chatter of a congregation in the middle of a festive season, there was also the added whispers about Grimshaw's party. Certainly things had already been suggested with Lady Tara's family's presence. That had received its own due course of gossip. Now all eyes were turned to the fact that Grimshaw now included Mrs Joanna McCarthy in his household seat. Grimshaw was sure that Matthew McCarthy would receive flack for not seeing to his own mother. It would not go unsaid that she had to stay at the Lord's house for her comfort when her son was unwilling to give it. Grimshaw cared little for the light it would shed on the businessman. In Sebastian's mind, he deserved all the harsh looks and negative comments he would receive. They returned back to Brighton Abbey half a happy party and half a rather despondent one. It was on the carriage ride home that Lady Tara gave the announcement that Grimshaw had been hoping for. We had planned to stay the holiday through, but my mother is eager to return to London while the roads are still traversable, Lady Tara said coolly. I agree that might be a wise decision, Grimshaw responded. With the announcement made, the Marlow family would only stay a day or two longer, just enough time to make their preparations for departure. Grimshaw couldn't have considered the morning trip to be more pleasant afterward. He seemed to have a weight finally lifted off his shoulders, knowing that Lady Tara would be leaving, and without him having to inform Lady Tara that he no longer intended to make her his bride. He was sure a young, beautiful woman such as herself would easily find another to distract her. He would have liked to think, now that he was at the end of the whole event, that it was not Lady Tara per se who had a terrible character. Perhaps it was just that she didn't fit well with his family and in his life. Certainly there was still hope for her to find the place she would fit well. The Christmas feast was more pleasant than Grimshaw had expected it to be that morning. With the understanding between himself and Lady Tara that there would be no union, everyone seemed to be more relaxed. Even Lady Waldron seemed to be in higher spirits with the release of pressure to see her daughter matched in present company. As they all sat around the fire that evening, Lord Waldron shared a tradition that he had as a boy and implemented it with the present party. All listened with nothing but the crackling sound of the fire behind them, as his smooth voice read the story of Christ's birth from Grimshaw's family Bible. Though he was in mixed company, as Grimshaw looked about the room while Lord Waldron read, he couldn't help but feel the spirit of Christmas flowing through his whole household. He noticed that little Rebecca had dozed to sleep in Jaden's arms. No doubt it was the third helping of Christmas pudding that had lulled her into an early sleep. I hope to give them their gifts tonight, but with Lady Rebecca fast asleep it will have to wait, Granny said when Lord Waldron finished his reading. Wait? Oh, I hope not very long, Lady Caroline said, disappointed that she was deprived of a gift through her sister's fault. I was going to keep them till Twelfth Night, a nice gift of the Magi, but if you don't think you can bear to wait tomorrow then, Granny said with a smile. With those words, Granny walked with Lady Caroline as Jaden carried his sleeping niece off to bed. Lady Tara and her party also bid their happy wishes and good evenings before returning to their own rooms for an early slumber. They had plans to leave early on the morrow. Miss Jacobson, I wonder if you might stay and talk with me a while, Grimshaw said when they found themselves alone, and Hannah made to also excuse herself. She hesitated for a moment. It wasn't that she feared Grimshaw. She may have feared him at first like she did the Baron. Now she knew him well enough. Sebastian Blackburn was a good man, and though he might have had a fierce look to his nature, he was not so. Yes, Lord Grimshaw, she said, coming to sit back down nearer to the fire. 
It was the only light left in the room, and so they sat adjacent to each other in front of it to get a better view of the other. I wanted to thank you, Grimshaw started. Thank me. Yes, for your stubborn nature. That seems a silly thing to thank someone for, Hannah said, though her cheeks dimpled with a blushing smile. I would have agreed with you not too long ago. But now I see the worth of this rather unique quality you possess. You see, without it, Mrs. McCarthy wouldn't have been here at Brighton Abbey. She is a wonder, isn't she? Hannah agreed. A treasure. I'm only sorry it took me this long to see that she was not properly looked after by her own family. I never would have expected my daughters to find a lady to adopt, but they seem to have done so. In the process, I have adopted her too, I suppose. I am most happy to hear that, Hannah replied. I hope that she finds Brighton Abbey a second home for her now, Grimshaw said, leaning forward in his seat. He didn't mean just Mrs. McCarthy with his words. Hannah sensed the double meaning in Lord Grimshaw's words. I do believe she does see it that way, sir, Hannah said in response to both meanings of the conversation. 34. The following day the whole family came out to bid Lady Tara and her party a safe and happy journey to their home. Grimshaw could not have wished for a better day on such an occasion. The sun was bright and high in the sky, warming the earth around them. He even heard the distinct sound of several winter birds singing their happy song in celebration of the departure. Jaden would stay on through the rest of the festivities and possibly into spring. All in the household were happy to have his welcome company. What brought Grimshaw surprising joy was how well Jaden seemed to get along with Miss Jacobson. He never realised how important it was to him that his late wife's brother was accepting of his new choice. Now that he saw the two of them interacting so happily together, he found it a great relief of a burden he didn't even know he was carrying. The girls were successful in convincing Granny to let them have their gifts the day after Christmas, and so they all sat around the warm hearth while the girls opened their parcels. For Lady Caroline she gave a small easel fashioned from wood. It was clearly done by Granny's skilled hand as each leg had intricate ivy carved into it. For Lady Rebecca, a small china tea set for her doll. It was made from clay and painted with perfect little flower designs. It was amazing to see the level of skill the aged woman had. If that was not enough, she also insisted that Hannah open her gift. It was followed by a refusal and then much encouragement from the whole party until Hannah was completely embarrassed. Rather reluctant to accept a gift, let alone open it in front of a whole crowd of people, Hannah did so anyway. Instantly her eyes sprung with tears as she pulled the item out of the box. It was a small stationary lap box. It came with several fine quills, bottles of ink, and best of all, delicately decorated stationary letters. Oh, Granny, this is too fine. It must have cost you a fortune. You always spoke of writing letters back to your own mother. I thought it would be nice if you had a fine station to do it with but it is too much. How did you ever get such fine things? Hannah said, inspecting one of the metal-tipped quills. You forget my Matty owns the village shop. I had him order it as a surprise for you. He knew you would love it just as I did. Hannah rather suspected he had done it during a time when he had hoped to win over her favour. She was sure that was no longer the case after she had given him such a cold shoulder. You must promise to thank him for me, Hannah said, taking Granny into a great big hug. It is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Oh, Matty will be happy to hear you like it, dear, Granny said with her own joy glistening behind her small dark eyes. It was during this joyous occasion that they were interrupted by an announcement. Apparently, Matthew McCarthy's ears must have been burning at their discussion because he was found outside of Brighton Abbey's door. The gentleman entered the room with determination once permitted and strode right up to his mother as if she had caused him great offence. Mother, we are leaving right now. Get your things and let's be off, he said rather curtly without even a word to any other member in the room. Who is this rake? Jaden said quite loudly. I am Mr. Matthew McCarthy. 
I am here to collect my mother and her things. I believe the lady is quite happy here at Brighton Abbey. We are all enjoying her company over the festive season, Grimshaw said, coming to a stand. There is no cause for you to come here so coarsely, sir. Forgive me, Lord Grimshaw, but there is. Word has flown all over Concordshire that I have not been a good steward of my mother, and I am here to rectify that. Perhaps that would have served its purpose when she was trapped inside a cold cottage during a blizzard. But your assistance is not required at the moment. Oh yes, Matty. I am enjoying myself greatly here with his lordship. I do wish to stay. And what of your animals? What of the things needing tending to at the cottage? You will just let it all go to rot whilst you sit here pretending to be a fine lady, Matthew spat back. I have a man seeing to the needs of her property, Grimshaw said with a narrowing of his eyes. Joanna McCarthy is here as my guest and she will stay as such until she desires otherwise. Clearly she doesn't at this time. The eyes seemed to swivel in the room from one man to the other as the verbal battle continued. Matthew McCarthy would not leave until his wounded pride was rectified, and Grimshaw was not about to let this woman fall into hands that would treat her any less than she deserved. Matthew McCarthy looked down at his mother in frustration and saw Hannah at her side. His eyes fell on the stationery set on her lap, and his rage turned onto her. This is all you're doing, you know, he said. My mother was perfectly content until you started coming around. I went through all that trouble to get you that thing, he motioned to the stationery box, and to thank me you have soiled my good name. Grimshaw stepped between Matthew and the ladies, blocking their view of him. Grimshaw didn't do it for Hannah's benefit, but rather to protect Mr. McCarthy from Hannah's sharp tongue. She was already puffing her cheeks out and ready to give the wretched man a piece of her mind. She may have been a fearful flower when she first came to Brighton Abbey, but she was not such now, and Grimshaw knew that well. Let us take our conversation to my office, Grimshaw said with a stern disposition. Matthew considered the idea, but Grimshaw gave him no time to respond either positively or negatively to his offer. Instead, he grabbed the gent by the arm and steered him in the proper direction. I will not be bullied by you in my own house, Grimshaw said in the confines of his office. I have no care that she is your mother. I have taken her on as my own responsibility, and I will see her treated right. You have done a piss-poor job of it yourself. I first heard such from the mouth of Miss Jacobson, and then confirmed the truth of it with my own eyes. If you think for one second that I will let you remove that lady back to her solitude with no care, you have another think coming. Grimshaw bore down on him with all the fierce anger built up inside him. Rarely did he use his title to his advantage over others, but he had no problem doing so now. Do you dare have the impertinence to tell me that I am wrong in my assumption that Mrs. McCarthy will find far superior comfort and affection here in my own home? It was a question that Grimshaw knew all too well the man would have no choice but to answer in the negative. To do otherwise would be to insult the Earl. Matthew McCarthy swallowed hard. He hadn't expected the Earl to fight so boldly on behalf of his mother. He was torn between what he knew he ought to say and the ramifications of leaving Brighton Abbey without his mother in tow. I will be the shame of the village, McCarthy finally said, though in a very much more deferential tone. I care little for your reputation. You should have considered Mrs. McCarthy's well-being. For God's sake, that is your mother, man, Grimshaw spat. Your failing reputation is your own doing. I will not remove the consequence that, in all honesty, I believe you truly deserve. McCarthy shuffled his feet in the room. He had been defeated and was sure to be leaving the estate empty-handed for it. Now, if you will excuse me, Grimshaw said, straightening himself to his full height with satisfaction that he had won the contest. I have guests that I should see to. I bid you a good day, sir. Without so much as a look behind or pause for words from the gent, Grimshaw removed himself from the room and returned to the happy party in the drawing room. 
After assuring Mrs. McCarthy that Grimshaw had shown Matthew the error of his ways and that she was more than welcome to stay but also had Mr. McCarthy's full blessing to do so, the matter was altogether forgotten and the festive season continued on as if the ripple had never occurred. 35. Granny stayed with the family until the day after New Year, at which point she assured both Hannah and the girls that she was ready to return to her own cottage. I must be there for the twelfth night. I put up a few mistletoe sprigs and ivy before you came to see me. If I don't burn them on the epiphany, I will have bad luck all year long, I'm sure of it. That is just a silly superstition. I am sure there is no truth to it. You must stay, Hannah urged the old woman. Superstition or not, I couldn't bear to not do so. I would fear any bad that might befall me for the next year would be caused by my delay. Hannah could see that she would not sway the widow from her determination. So it was with a basket of pies and puddings for her own celebration on the night five days hence that Mrs. McCarthy returned home in the comfort and style of Grimshaw's finest carriage. Lady Caroline gave a little sniffle as she stood watching through the window as Granny left. Don't be sad, Lady Caroline, Hannah said, putting a loving arm around the girl. We will see her again in a few days' time. Your father has agreed to take us twice a week to spend afternoon tea with Granny. I dare say we will see so much of her that you will wish we stopped going. I will never wish that, Caroline said with the innocence of a child. I know, dear. I was only teasing you, Hannah said with a smile and soft squeeze. The next few days was a lull between the feast of New Year and celebration of the Epiphany. The girls settled back into the daily routine of their education and training as ladies. Grimshaw got to work with great vigour as the completion of the West Wing neared. He found great excitement in its eventual completion. Somewhere in his heart, he had worked out that with the West Wing done, Anne would be at peace in heaven and he would be ready to make the next move in his life. With that notion ever present in his mind, he found himself forgetting to not be so open about his feelings towards Miss Jacobson. He was satisfied to see that she didn't mind his attention as he feared she might. In fact, in many ways, she welcomed and even reciprocated his flirtation. I wonder, Miss Jacobson, if you might help me with something, Grimshaw said one night as the family sat around the fire. Both girls were quietly playing with Rebecca's tea set. Caroline, who normally felt she was too old for pretend and dolls, had allowed herself this one night for the sake of making Rebecca happy in her play. Jaden was deep in concentration over some news he had received that morning from his father. Hannah likewise was busy at work, writing a letter to her mother on her new stationery. At the Earl's request, however, she set her writing aside and willingly accepted to aid Lord Grimshaw despite not knowing the request. He asked her to follow him to the card table that was at the back of the drawing room. There afforded them more privacy, though it probably wasn't needed. I was hoping to do something nice for the girls, to give them as a magi gift. Normally I would give them a new dress or some other type of frill, but I thought there might be something better. I wondered if you could help me. I'm not sure I can, but I will be happy to try, Hannah replied. Surely you must know as a woman what they would like. When you were a little girl, what things did you like to get? I am afraid my childhood would not be an accurate comparison to the young ladies, Hannah said in honesty. Perhaps you think they have too much, then? Grimshaw seemed to ponder, sitting back in his chair. No, it is not that. I just experienced a different childhood, is all. But you are not averse to little notions and tokens of affection when given at appropriate times now, are you? I don't think I would have been then either. I was just not able to receive them. But no, to answer your question, I don't think there is anything wrong with giving them small gifts. They both certainly deserve it. Hannah looked lovingly towards the girls playing quietly. Grimshaw studied her. Do you care for them? he asked with a sudden turn in the conversation. Of course I do, Hannah retorted, surprised that he should even ask. Of course he knew that would be her answer, but still he had the desire to hear it out loud. Would you love them as if they were your own daughters? 
I already do, Hannah said, still unsure of where he was going with his talk. A quick but fleeting smile brushed across his lips. He rubbed his chin. At this time at night, it was already beginning to darken with stubble. I fear that Lady Tara might have ruined them to the idea of a mother. I don't think so, Hannah replied, still unsure where the conversation was leading. She couldn't help but be relieved when she saw Lady Tara leave Brighton Abbey. She would have liked to say it was solely for the children's sake. If she was to be truly honest with herself, though, that wasn't entirely accurate. She found that she had fallen in love with the Earl just as much as she had with his daughters. It was a stark contrast to the attitude she had first come to the county house with. Of course, with such a bad experience like the one she had with Baron Edgeley, it was no wonder that she was averse to liking the Earl, let alone fall for him. It was hard for her to do otherwise, however. What she had first seen as a gruff exterior, she learned was nothing more than a father who loved his daughters deeply. He was a good man who worked hard with his own hands. He was willing to admit his own faults, but also wouldn't back down when Hannah was in the wrong. She found that trait surprisingly admirable. She couldn't help but let her heart sink a little at the Earl's question. Was he already on the hunt for a new wife? Hannah had hoped that with the disaster with Lady Tara, he would take time before going about his search again. She, of course, never expected him to set his eyes on her. Instead, she rather hoped that she would be able to simply enjoy the time she had now and worry about what the future held when it came. It seemed that the future was now becoming the present by his muddled conversation. Perhaps he was looking to her for advice again. Hannah wasn't altogether sure she could give such words of comfort to him. Before she had been only half aware of her feelings. Now she was sure her heart had been wholly given over to the Earl. Have you another lady in mind already? Hannah asked, swallowing hard. I mean to take as a wife and mother to the girls. Hannah did her best to hide her fears in her question. She needed to know the answer and wished to never hear it all at the same time. I do, Grimshaw said simply. She has been a choice of mine for some time, but I hesitated. What for? Hannah asked, sure her heart was beating loud enough for even the Earl to hear. Well, he said with a sigh. I worried that Anne would hate me for it. I know, he said, stopping her before she spoke. I have come to see you are right on that matter. It is wrong of me to feel guilty. But I did all the same. I don't know that I can explain why. I suppose I thought if I let myself love another it would remove Anne from my heart. I've learned now that there is room enough. My greatest fear is that the lady in question might not take kindly to such a situation. What do you mean? I mean, I would ask her to love me and my children as her own, and I think she does on both accounts. At least, she has confirmed so for my children's sake, Grimshaw said with a twinkle to his dark eyes. Hannah's heart raced at his words. She wasn't sure but thought he might actually be talking about her. She couldn't find it possible for Grimshaw to have fallen for her as she had for him. She had vexed him at every turn it had seemed, not to mention the fact that she had also attempted to physically assault him twice. What man would want a woman like her, even without considering the fact that she came from less than ideal breeding? But I would wonder if she would be happy knowing that I still held my late wife dear. I wonder if she would come to resent that over time. Resent that you love your first wife? How could you not, though? She gave you the gift of two beautiful girls. I myself never met the woman and only heard stories of her, but I have come to have great admiration for the lady. You have? Grimshaw said, surprised. Of course. Any woman who would find a place in her heart for you, Lord Grimshaw, Hannah said, her cheeks blushing with the frank conversation, would have no choice but to have affection for Lady Grimshaw as well, she has influences in every corner of Brighton Abbey. Even just the simple act of finishing the West Wing in her name shows how she has influenced this place for the good. Grimshaw looked at the woman before him with awe. She was certainly wise beyond her years when she had the hankering to be. And she wouldn't resent that presence, you don't think? Grimshaw asked as he reached a hand forward and took Hannah's. 
Her eyes drifted down to where they touched across the table. She could feel his warmth flowing through her veins. I know I never would, Hannah answered barely above a whisper. Grimshaw rewarded her response with a wide, joyous smile. Pulling her hand to his lips, he kissed it ever so gently. It was just the first step, but it was a definite step in Grimshaw's mind to courting Miss Hannah Jacobson. 36. It was fortuitous that on the day of the coming of the Magi, Grimshaw put the final touches to the West Wing. It was a great weight of relief off his shoulders to see all the rooms properly put together, including the great hall that occupied most of the first floor of the wing. He imagined great balls that could be held in the newly remoulded walls of the house. It gave him that connection to his past, as well as the renewed hope for a bright new future. The festivities for the night and subsequent feast outshone any they had enjoyed thus far. The cook even created moulded cakes covered in colourful icing and pastille figures. In the spirit of Granny, all festive decorations were removed from their places of honour and set before the drawing room hearth to be burned by midnight. Hannah was happy to watch the girls open their gifts she had made them of decorated masks and party hats to wear all night long. For the Earl's part, he had a very special gift planned for his darling daughters. That would have to come later in the night. Instead of their gift to stave off their excitement, he waited till after the feasting to unveil the West Wing and its beautiful large dance hall. The girls danced and twirled in pure, unadulterated excitement around the room that had once held sapling trees and decaying leaves. In turn, the two ladies both gifted their father the paintings that they had worked so hard on with Mrs. McCarthy's aid. He helped them walk the halls and rooms now furnished in the new wing until each child picked the best place to hang their painting. I have a gift for you also, Hannah said after the paintings were hung and the girls were running up and down in and out of all the new rooms. I hope you will like it, she added, handing over her own paper-wrapped painting. I am nowhere near the artist that Mrs McCarthy is. Plus, I only had the portrait that Mrs Brennan showed me and the girls' descriptions to go off of. Hannah continued by way of explanation nervously. It's Anne, Grimshaw said with the breath catching in his throat. In his hand, he held a wonderful likeness of his late wife mirrored from her portrait in her bedroom. Of course, Hannah had taken some liberties with it. He noticed right off the bat that instead of the dark gown of the painting in the room, she wore a light lavender. He remembered it well as Anne wore it often. He guessed it was the one that Caroline would remember best and describe to Hannah. Lady Caroline said it was a fairly good likeness, Hannah said hesitantly when he said no more. I thought it would be nice to put in the front entrance to the wing. After all, she was the inspiration to finish it, was she not? It is perfect, Grimshaw said with some husk to his voice. Oh, I'm so happy you like it, Hannah said with a huff of breath. You are a remarkable woman, Hannah Jacobson, Grimshaw replied, taking his eyes from the painting and studying the lady who stood before him. Oh, I don't think it is quite that good, Hannah said, feeling shy. I'm glad you like it nonetheless. Grimshaw wanted to tell her she was remarkable for far more than just her exceptional artistic skills. He wanted to tell her she was an exceptional creature for finding a way to love his children despite their jaded beginnings. She was even more so for accepting him, despite his hardened exterior. He was sure that any other woman put in her situation would have left the moment he laid down his demands. How ridiculous he saw they were now. He had tried to control her for the sake of protecting his girls. If Grimshaw had only known then that it was Hannah Jacobson who would help his girls to heal from their wounds. They needed no protection from the love of their dear governess. I have a gift for you as well. Well, a gift of sorts. I mean to say, I believe it is a gift in a way, Grimshaw said nervously. Hannah couldn't help but laugh at his awkward speech. It was a side of Grimshaw that was rarely seen by any. Anyway, he said, giving a chuckle at his own ridiculousness, I want to give it to you later tonight, if that is all right. Of course, Hannah said, her curiosity piqued but always loving a good surprise. 
Come, girls, Grimshaw called after hanging his last picture in its proper place. I believe it is time for bed. Bed? But, Father, I want to stay and burn the holly with you. I'm afraid not tonight, my dear, Grimshaw said to the pleadings of Lady Caroline. We are much too excited to sleep, Lady Rebecca added, bounding up to her father. I expect all that cake has something to do with that, Hannah said with a giggle. At least let us stay up until Uncle Jaden comes back home. Jaden Marsh had opted out of the somewhat subdued frivolities of Brighton Abbey for a masquerade ball in Concordshire. I expect Uncle Jaden will not return home until much later than when we set the decorations ablaze. You will have to wait till morning to hear all his tales of the ball. Both girls groaned, but reluctantly did as their father instructed. They had had more excitement in that one night than they could remember. Even though it seemed impossible for them at that moment to rest their heads on their soft down pillows, Hannah was sure that when the time came, they would quickly fall asleep. But then you will be left to burn the decorations all by yourself, father, Rebecca said, as the four of them made their way through the house and to the nursery. What if you forget a piece and a goblin springs to life? I won't be all alone. I will have Miss Jacobson to help me. I am told she has a very keen eye for mistakes. I doubt she will let even a leaf escape the flames. She does have a very keen eye, Caroline agreed. Even when I think she can't tell I missed a stitch on my sampler, she always spots it. And your sampler is looking a masterpiece now, isn't it, my dear? Hannah said with a smile. Caroline had to agree. Though she detested the work, it was satisfying to see it all done without her eye automatically travelling to the spots she knew she messed up on. You will stay up with me, won't you? Grimshaw asked after both girls were properly tucked into bed. If that is what you wish, I would be happy to, Hannah replied. It would give me the chance to give you the gift I spoke of. Grimshaw held out his arm for Hannah to take. Together they walked to the drawing room. They would sit together by the fire and wait for the stroke of midnight. I have never done this before, Hannah exclaimed as the hour drew near. Truly, Grimshaw asked in surprise. They had spent the better part of the remainder of the evening in happy conversation alone in the drawing room. Grimshaw asked one question after another about her family, siblings and holiday traditions. In return, he also told some of his own from his childhood that he had most enjoyed. Well, perhaps I did when I lived with my mother and father. I don't remember doing so. I don't even really recall us having any sort of decorations in our house. What about at your girls' school? Surely they would have the decorations all around for the holidays. No, not Hendrix, Hannah said with finality. They believed that to be an idle waste of time. Not to mention, I am sure it would be considered pagan superstition to burn the trimmings on Twelfth Night. Well, I hope you have no aversions to doing it tonight, Grimshaw said, not wanting to dwell on a past he couldn't change no matter how much he wished to. I'm actually looking forward to it, for Granny's sake, of course. Well, and for the girls. Rebecca was very concerned about goblins appearing. Grimshaw smiled at the thought of his little girl's worries. Best we start now. It's getting close to time. It all has to be done before midnight or the goblins start to sprout. Grimshaw rose from his seat and helped Hannah to do the same. They started out slowly throwing in one bunch of branches at a time and watching them burn. Soon the whole room filled with the fragrant scent of the outdoors, mixed with dried citrus and pungent spices. It makes it all seem so fresh and new, Grimshaw said after a particularly large bunch went into the fire. It reminds me of a new beginning, he tried again to explain. Yes, Hannah agreed, watching the flames. It's something I never thought I could have in my own life, Grimshaw ventured, hoping he had finally picked the right time. Hannah turned and looked up at the dark brooding man before her. Even when I had settled to, for the girls, that is, I still never saw a future for me, at least not a happy one he desperately attempted to stammer out. I'm not explaining this as I hoped, he said with a huff of frustration. 
Explaining what, sir? Hannah asked. He took a step forward and took her hands in his. She didn't shy away, and that gave him the courage to continue. Hannah, you are my hope for a future, he said softly. The gift I hope to give you, if you will accept it, that is. He took a deep breath. It's me, all of me. I wish to give you every part of me, even the broken pieces. You have opened your heart to my children. I hope that you could find a small part to allow me as well. In return, I give you all I have and all I am to be yours. He had closed his eyes during his little speech, just desperate to get it all out. Now he opened them and looked down on the glowing face of the woman he had poured out his soul to. Tears were pooling against the reflection of her blue eyes. He let one hand go so that he could caress her cheek. He let his fingers trail along her jaw. Forgive me. I didn't mean to upset you. You don't have to say anything if you don't wish to. I do, Hannah whispered, but I fear I cannot produce the words. A single tear slipped down her cheek and he brushed it away with his thumb. Is it because you cannot bear the thought? Grimshaw asked, still unsure of her tears. Hannah held his hand tight against her cheek as she shook her head in the negative. How she burned to tell him all that she too felt for him. How she had wished such a night like tonight would come to pass. She laughed a little to herself. Perhaps Granny was right in this silly tradition bringing good in the year to come. Unable to say the words, she saw Grimshaw's dark brow furrow in confusion at her actions. She must have seemed quite the silly miss at that moment. She didn't have the words to express her feelings, but she had long since developed the courage to act on her desires. She took a step forward to him instead, and reaching up on her tiptoes to meet his height. Hannah kissed him softly on the lips. Grimshaw took a step back in surprise. Hannah guessed it was probably the first time that a woman had ever been brazen enough to kiss him. It only took him half a second to regain his senses. Closing the gap between them again, Grimshaw wrapped Hannah securely in his arms till she was as close to him as possible. He lowered his head to her and properly kissed her good and hard as he had dreamed of doing for so long now. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Grimshaw reluctantly released his lips from hers, though he kept his hold tight to steady her. She looked up at him with a wistful smile playing on her lips. What is it? he asked. I suppose this means we will need to renegotiate the rules. You think so? Grimshaw countered with a gleam to his dark eyes. Yes, I definitely remember one in particular that stated I was not allowed to consort with any members of the opposite sex. Ah, he said with his own wicked smile now matching hers. I believe that was unless you obtained my prior approval. He bowed his head low again so that his lips brushed against hers. I am happy to say he continued against her lips in a deep whisper, that I heartily approve of this particular fraternization. I'm happy to hear it, Hannah giggled against his lips. She scarcely had time to do so, however, before his mouth came down on hers again. Grimshaw was sure that by the coming of the sun, Hannah Jacobson would have no doubt in her mind that he belonged wholly to her. Epilogue it was a far grander occasion than Hannah had ever imagined for her wedding day. In all honesty, she had never really anticipated this day at all. Even when she held her affection for Lord Grimshaw close to her heart, she never would have believed that she would be preparing to exchange nuptials with the man. You look perfect, Mary said from behind her as she placed the last white rose into Hannah's perfectly arranged hair. You make the prettiest bride I have ever seen she added with a glistening tear. I hope Lord Grimshaw will agree, Hannah said nervously. She came to stand and took a few steps back to see as much of herself as she could in the round mirror. She was wearing a fine cream-coloured dress that Grimshaw had insisted be made for her. Around her collar and pinned in her hair 
were the most delicate dried white and pink roses Hannah had ever seen. They gave off the most wonderful perfume as well. She took a steadying breath and took comfort from the scent. Hannah couldn't believe how nervous she was. She rather thought she was being silly. There was no reason to be nervous. Grimshaw would be happy to see her walk down the chapel aisle even if she was wearing her demure muslin gown and the oversized cap and spectacles. A knock came at her door, and Hannah could tell from the giggling behind it that it was her future stepdaughter's before she even opened it. Oh, you both look so beautiful, Hannah said with admiration and praise. Each girl had also been outfitted with a new gown for the occasion. Both were of fine pink silk, though Rebecca's was trimmed in fine cream lace and Caroline had a darker pink ribbon to embellish her own. Both girls had their dark brown locks curled and decorated with their own sets of dried pink roses. Abigail said we should come get you. The carriage is ready, mother, Rebecca said with an innocent tone and an outstretched hand. Hannah took her hand but instead leaned down so that she was eye to eye with the girls. With tears glistening against her lashes, she looked into the faces of her children. I want you both to know I love you very much, Hannah said softly, against the emotion rising in her. We know, Caroline said with a smile. We must hurry, though. Father wouldn't want us to be late. No, I dare say he wouldn't like that, Hannah said, remembering his demanding nature when they first met. She took one girl in each hand and together they made their way to the waiting carriage. The three of them rode together into Concordshire, where Grimshaw was already waiting at the church. Hannah was taken aback by the townsfolk all dressed in their Sunday best waving flowers as they entered the town square. The carriage pulled up to the front of the chapel, and the three girls exited. Together they entered the sanctuary to find the inside just as filled as the crowds without. Seated in places of honour on one side of the chapel were Hannah's mother and father with all her siblings. At first Hannah had been a little hesitant when Lord Grimshaw had suggested he invite them all to Brighton Abbey for the ceremony. She wasn't sure he wouldn't change his mind once he truly saw her humble beginnings. Sebastian Blackburn was not the sort of man to look down his nose at a person merely because of their lot in life. Instead, he looked to the character inside. In the case of Hannah's family, he saw nothing wanting and welcomed them into his family with open arms. Across from Hannah's family, also seated at the front of the chapel, was Jaden Marsh, returned momentarily to Concordshire for the nuptials, before returning back to his London home and the start of the season. Next to him in a seat of honour was Granny. She dabbed at her eyes as the girls walked forward with Hannah just behind them. The girls made their way up the pews of distinguished guests. Some Hannah recognised and some she didn't, but all were happy to share in their moment. As they reached the end, both girls hugged their father before taking their place by Granny. For all the world turning around them, Sebastian Blackburn had eyes for only one. He watched with silent awe as the vivacious Hannah Jacobson walked down the stone walkway dressed in her beautiful cream gown. He saw in her the light of a new beginning, the hope of a future full of happiness. Most importantly, he saw a love that he could hold on to till they were parted from this earth. Though the service was a proper one administered by Dr. O'Driscoll, Grimshaw paid little attention to it. He had only one moment focused in the back of his mind, with great anticipation. It was with the final words of man and wife, and permission to kiss his bride, that Grimshaw broke out in a smile of unquenchable joy. Hannah tilted her head up, sharing the same happiness that her new husband had. Raising her slippered feet onto her tiptoes, she felt the warmth of Sebastian's hands encircle her waist. He hesitated for just a moment while their noses gently grazed one another's. Softly against her lips, he whispered, I love you, before he took her mouth with his. Perhaps for propriety's sake, or at the least in respect to the huff from Dr. O'Driscoll, Sebastian should have given his wife a chaste and quick kiss. He had no such intentions. He had waited far too long to make Hannah all his. He was going to savour every moment of their first kiss as man and wife. Hannah, for her part, 
was more than happy to obediently follow this particular request. Click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. We included a bonus scene of this book. Link in the description or the first comment. What did you like the most? Comment below or mention if you are interested in being part of our VIP readers. Watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.